development, which is real critical. And uh, I think we're making progress. So hopefully after today, we'll even accelerate more. So thank you. I'll turn it back to you. Great. Okay. Thank you. Want to go? Uh, good morning, and it's my pleasure to welcome everybody here on behalf of the Delta Regional Authority and our chairman, Chris Massingale. Thank you for coming today. Also, I'd like to thank Dr. Karen Boyer for being our host and appreciate your hospitality. This college has is, is shown quite a, got quite a reputation for job training and workforce development, so we're glad to be uh, participating in this today. I'd also like to uh, say that we got a good panel panelists today and I'm really happy to have those folks here. Uh, folks travel from the Health Resource Services Administration and HHC Office of National Coordinator for Health Technology. So big, lots of big Washington words, but we're glad to have them here today. Um, you know, the Delta Regional Authority, uh, our, some of our main focus is on, uh, of course, economic development and uh, in jobs, creating jobs. That's what our president and our country have asked us to do is create jobs, and this is a, this is a good opportunity. Another thing that the Delta Regional Authority uh, prom promotes is, is a healthy workforce. And today is kind of a combination of both of those things. Uh, it's an opportunity to, to improve our health care in the, in the region, and it's also an opportunity to create some new jobs in, in the region. So this is, this is a perfect storm, you might say. I. Uh, my background it was in the banking business, and uh, uh, the last few years before I got out of the banking business, they came up with this great idea of converting all of our, our files, our notes, and our paper all to imaging, all to put on uh, to where we could retrieve these uh, documents. And of course, like, an old, like most old bankers, I fought that idea, but uh, as it developed, I kind of realized the opportunities, the challenges and the opportunities that it presented, and that's the same sort of thing that we're going to see in this healthcare initiative. So anyway, I'm very, very happy to be a part of that. Um, again, uh, this is going to create some neat new jobs for the area, and uh, the, the sky's the limit on what, what we can do. And, and, and uh, you know, uh, health care can, uh, can be provided in the rural areas now, not just in the major metropolitan areas. So, so this is, this is going to give us an opportunity to kind of provide a better health care for our, for our region, and that's so important. Uh, Let's see here. I think that pretty much covers what I needed to, to say, and I'm going to turn it back over to Aaron Fishback with HRSA. Good morning. Uh, my name is Aaron Fishback, and I'm with the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. And obviously, we like to give long names to things in the federal government. So if you hear me say ORHP, that's my office. Um, and the Health Resources and Services Administration is lovingly called HRSA. Um, so to keep things moving a little bit in the government, that's what we do is we shorten <laughs> to acronyms. <laughs> so, um, so I thought we'd start today by giving out just a brief background, not taking too much time, but the, about the White House Rural Council, which is sort of the reason we're here. The White House Rural Council was established by the president last summer as a way to focus a lot of regular government initiatives on rural America, because a lot of times big agencies and big programs don't necessarily take a look and, and fit perfectly rural. So it, it's a combination of the US, all the federal agencies. It's led by the US Department of Agriculture, secretary uh, there, and uh, all the secretaries have a seat and a number of the other agencies. Uh, Delta Regional Authority is participating. And so we've, we've focused on a variety of rural issues and one is healthcare. And so my boss at the Office of Rural Health Policy is the is the regular representative for the Department of Health and Human Services. And so we focus, one of our activities is on health IT because as Matt will talk in a little while, the Office of the National Coordinator put a lot of resources into community colleges and others to, to make sure that rural areas in the rest of America has the opportunity to put health IT into our healthcare facilities to hopefully make our healthcare more efficient and uh, safer and more affordable. So some of the some of the focuses that that we've had are bringing these basic policy these basic programs to rural America, making sure that our sister agencies understand how it would be implemented in rural areas and how how it can work in rural areas. And so, in addition to the basic health IT programs that they operate, 
We've also been working with USDA, the Department of Agriculture, on funding for purchasing HIP systems and broadband implementation. We've worked with the Federal Communications Commission to make sure that their rural programs are being modified to make it easier for rural to apply and to receive funds to implement HIP and broadband. So um, you get the basic background, and uh, I think I'll just stop there. Great. Well, thanks, Aaron. Um, again, my name is Matt Kendall. I am the director of the Office of Provider Adoption Support, which we lovingly refer to as OPAS, uh, in the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. And I got to create the name of my department, so when I go with the federal acronym, I wanted to have something with energy. Um, and I think we need a little energy with these days because uh, what my team is responsible for is helping every provider in the country uh, to implement electronic health records and use those systems to really improve the, the care that they're delivering to providers. And I think uh, we are living in an amazingly exciting time. Um, there is a huge revolution that's going on in health information technology. Uh, we're going from adoption of EHR systems, which was, you know, uh, for the first tw the last 20 years, we got up to about 5 10%, and now we're closing in on 50%. And that change has happened in just the last couple of years. Um, so it's amazingly exciting uh, to be able to do this, but it's also exciting because uh, we're seeing the potential of these systems really uh, beginning to blossom and bloom into sort of real benefits that are actually accruing to people across the country. Um, and to make this transformation happen, we recognize that it is critically important to make sure that our health workforce has the skills and knowledge necessary to really not only implement these systems, but to, but to implement them well. And to think about ways in which we can take this information and really use it the way that providers have wanted to all along, which is, it's not about entering data for entering data's sake, but it's really about getting the benefits out of those systems. And the reality is, this is a very, very difficult transformation. Um, other industries have gone through it, you know, very successfully. But healthcare is different because healthcare, the outcome really is about health of individuals, and that's a much more complicated, much more precious commodity, and it's something that people take very, very seriously. Um, and we at ONC have really thought really hard about how we can help prepare the country for this. Um, and it's, it's very fortunate that we have such strong partners, and I really want to thank the, the DRA for helping hold this event today. Um, it is wonderful for us to be able to get out there, talk to different people, uh, people in the field about what's happening because frankly, you're the people we're trying to serve, um, and it's through partnerships like that that we can really keep, keep connected. Um, and also having colleagues like HRSA that are able to help really help us focus in on specific niches. So you know, rural providers is something that's very important for us. We recognize that there are a lot of challenges that rural providers face that, that are unique, you know, distance, um, uh, infrastructure needs, uh, access to capital. HRSA has been a strong partner in working with us and other agencies like the department of agriculture and thinking about ways in which we can address those issues. But one thing that we keep coming back to over and over again is we need to get the skills to get into rural hands. Um, and I think that we at ONC have been incredibly fortunate to have um, been able to get through the, the uh, uh, ARA program dollars allocated to really helping to build the health IT uh, workforce. Um, and we'll go into a little later a little about detail about the specific programs that we're working with. Um, but I, I think today is a great example because we've been able to bring together folks from a variety of our different programs. And we, we would have uh, the panel today is, is, is very exciting to me because it really illustrates not only the individuals who we're trying to work with, but the people who are thinking about how to develop systems and scale those systems up. So it's whether it's our amazing community colleges that have been doing a great job in developing workforce programs in a very, very short amount of time. Uh, and I just want to underscore the, that you know it is thrilling to have such great partners because we did not give anybody very much time in implementing these programs. We basically awarded the grants and said everyone's got to get out of the gate immediately. Um, and what has been really exciting is that our community colleges rose to the challenge. They've been very exciting. Programs like Dire Serve, you guys were able to get people in there, get people trained. Clearly you've had a commitment to this for a long time and I think it's, it's wonderful to be here. Um, but it's also wonderful to be in a state like Tennessee where there's so much inno innovation going on in workforce development. Um, so for me, it is, it's really very important that we are here today because I think this is an illustration of where programs can really come together and look about the whole needs of a sector and collaborate. Um, and in collaboration coordination, I mean, it's in my, the office's name. It's not an easy task ever. Uh, but I think what really happens when you have uh, committed people working on these issues, 
we can get amazing things done. Uh, and I think that Tennessee is a state where we really are uh, moving ahead on this work. I think this is really a great program. We're very happy to showcase it. And today you're gonna see a variety of different people and perspectives that are really gonna hone in the message. Because we, we you know, there are people out there who, who really wanna do this. There are examples here in this community, other communities across the country. And our goal at ONC is to think about ways in which we can work with our colleagues to get the word out, to strengthen that message, to think about ways in which we can engage folks. Um, because there is an amazing transformation that's happening in healthcare. And healthcare is something that touches everybody in this country. These are opportunities for real jobs that are not going anywhere. We have lots of need in this field. Um, so I am really thrilled to be here today and to be able to talk to everybody about this coming experience. So um, I wanna also thank our panel uh, the op for the opening comments. Um, and just as sort of a word of introduction about how the day is gonna go on today, um, we're gonna be moving from this opening session to a uh, panel where we're gonna be talking to real life uh, students, uh, tr uh, faculty, and, and people out in the field about what's happening in this field. Because you know it's great that we are here talking about it, but it's the real people in the field who are getting these jobs, who are implementing, who are doing the hard work. That's the message we wanna hear from. And those perspectives are invaluable. Then we're going to uh, talk a little bit about sort of what's happening in terms of health IT training. And we've got some of our amazing uh, community college consortium leads who are here today. We're gonna be talking about different programs that are happening both in, you know, all, all over the country. Uh, we'll then break for lunch and then we're gonna come back and talk a little bit about um, something called meaningful use. Um, and if you don't know about meaningful use for now, you will by the end of the day because it's a really important uh, initiative. And it really is about how, not only about implementing technology, but about it making it safe. It's about getting the value out of these systems. And it is uh, a very challenging process, but luckily we've got a, a group of experts in here who will come in and present it. Um, Aaron and I then will have a quick conversation about some of the, the other federal initiatives that we have that we'd love to think about working to support folks. Um, then we're gonna have a presentation by the Tennessee uh, Health eHealth Initiative, which is uh, talk a little bit about the exciting things that are happening in the state. Um, and then we're gonna close it off with a, a little conversation, because I think the uh, what really is exciting for me is that there are folks in this room who have knowledge and interest, and I wanna hear from people about what you're doing, how you're engaging on these issues, and how we can move together um, as we move forward. So I think we have a jam-packed day, and again, I wanna thank the DRA and all the, the wonderful folks, uh, April, Millicent, where, wherever you guys are, you guys have done an amazing job of pulling this together in a very short amount of time. But I think we have a phenomenal day ahead of us. Um, so with that, I think we're going to transition to the next panel. Fantastic, come, come grab seats here. And I think this is gonna be basically a fairly informal panel discussion. Um, and as I just mentioned, what we're trying to do here today is talk about you know, health IT and you know, how the workforce rolls roll out. So I was hoping if you guys could just quickly introduce yourselves, uh, give a little bit of background and a little bit about how you guys are working with health IT and then we'll just go into a discussion from there. I'm Steve Robbie. I'm the director of our Care Track program at Ohio State State. Um, I'm also an instructor in the program. I graduated from Ohio State State, so it has a very special place in my heart. And uh, one thing that I have noticed most of the students that we get, the majority are not uh, fresh out of high school, they are the more mature 45 to 50 age students. Starting to come back to college at the age of 50, I can sympathize with them. Uh, it's not that they are not capable of learning, they're sometimes afraid to learn. So you really have to grab their hands and walk with them sometimes, which is fine. As long as they get the, the program, the information and the knowledge, that's what we're all about. My name is Lance Luttrell. I'm with Christ Community Health Services in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, an acute FQHC that has uh, seven different, six locations and one mobile clinic in Memphis. And uh, my role is uh, operations analyst. And so I do a lot of the database management in our EMR system. Um, I'm involved with the, we kind of, uh, the roles in our organization are very much split between sort of the more traditional IT roles that manage the hardware and the systems part of that, and then my role, which is much more managing the health part of the, the HIP. Um, yeah, we are, of our seven locations, six of them are live on our EMR now, and we're gonna transition the last one 
in uh, in mid September to being live on the EMR. <coughs> so that's just kind of who I am and where we are. It's been great. Uh, my name is Mike Burr, and I'm uh, also a former student from um, Dyer's Workspace. Um, I'm a beneficiary of the WIA. That's how I um, got to this point. I chose um, um, health information. <laughs> I'm currently employed with uh, Jackson Madison County General Hospital in Jackson, Tennessee, and um, we have about a 650-bed facility, and we have five affiliate hospitals within a 50-mile radius, and we just uh, completed our go-live um, one year ago at the um, Jackson location with physician uh, online documentation. And that was the last phase. And we're now uh, to be completed by Febru February um, in the process of bringing on the five affiliates. My focus um, has <coughs> been <coughs> less with the IT part and more with the uh, actual, I consider it the end user mm -hmm. of the electronic record current focus is training uh, physicians on electronic documentation in the near future. Great. Well, well, like I think that's a great point that you're raising, that there's a diverse set of jobs that are out there in the health, health IT field. Um, Steve, can you talk a little bit about this, the types of jobs you're preparing your students for and the types of jobs you're hearing about in the community that you're trying to prepare your students to fill? Uh, at Dyersburg State, we offer three of the six roles in the curriculum, which are the clinicians, uh, consultants, the workflow redesign specialist, and also the trainer. Uh, the majority of the students that I have are already employed in the healthcare, the old type healthcare, the paper healthcare, and they've been told we're getting an electronic health record and they're just jumping in to try to learn anything that they can in order to, for job security and not to be totally lost once the electronic health record comes. Um, we also have several unemployed students that have been in other fields that are no longer healthy in the United States and it's they want to go into something that they feel like is going to be there. Like myself, I wanted a job that I can go to work and work until I either retire or die, whichever comes first, <laughs> <laughs> because I don't like change. Um, as Mike said, most of the students that we have that are in health care, they're in the facility or in the physician's office they don't know that much about the IT side. Um, so most of our studies are on the IT side. You know, they pretty much know the health information side, the terminology, that type of thing, but they're scared to death of a computer maybe. So they wind up taking most of the IT classes. And the IT people are just as frightened of the health side as the health people are of the IT side. So it's trying to bring the two together. I worked at a hospital. I was friends with the IT guy. I went, I said, I need to, to do this. And he started all the you know, language. I said, I don't care what you do, just make it good. <laughs> uh, and the same way is he didn't really care what I was telling him. He just said, what is it you want to do? So, but IT and medical both are going to have to learn. They're going to have to work together and they're very mission driven. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that you guys have, you know, you're looking at your staff, you're very committed to the cause. How has health IT changed the way your organization is delivering care? And getting back to Steve's point, how are you bringing together the health healthcare folks and the IT folks to sort of work together for a common goal? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think that in kind of this uh, 
you know, I do a lot of the training of providers too on how to do the documentation. And one of the things that we talk about in our kind of software is that we're in this sort of transitionary stage, right? Like you're going from paper to electronic record. And so you kind of have a software right here in the meantime, it gives you a picture of like an electronic reality of a paper record, right? So like you have all these analogies, like here's where the, you take the chart and split it open. This screen's supposed to be, you see the left-hand side of the chart and the right, et cetera, you know? And so I think that there are jobs that kind of mirror that, have an analogy with that kind of software role, right? So that there are actually jobs that do what we're talking about where it's like you have IT people who have no idea what they're talking about as far as health goes. You have health people who've never touched a computer. And so you have a, a job and a role that comes in as kind of a, a mediator or, or somebody that kind of bridges the gap. And so I think that that's, I mean, I think it's one thing. I think that there is learning on both sides, but I think there's kind of this new role that comes in where you have somebody who can kind of represent the one crowd to the other. Um, now, as far as in our context, like driving it, I mean, you, you always have to, uh, and I'm, I'm big on this, is that if you start with the what, people will always ask you why. Right? Why, well, why do we have to do this? And then, it, then you're forced to say something like, well, the federal government told us so, and, uh, <laughs> you know, you stop there. You it know, works so is, well, doesn't That's it? right, no. Uh, and so you, you really do have to start from the why. And that, I don't think that that just applies at our FQHC. I think that that, you know, we are faith-based, and so that, that provides a great place for us to start at the why. But I don't think that's just limited to us. I think that applies to any sort of organization trying to make any sort of significant change or move into this world is that you start with, we believe that making data available on a, on a sort of community-wide basis will improve the outcomes that we have for our patients. And if you can sell that to your providers, you can go really far with the hows and the whats, right? If you say, this is going to make our tracking of referrals in front of our face, right? I mean, something that was it best done by a practice of leaving paper charts on a desk until somebody got so frustrated with the clutter that they finally dealt with it? Now you have something like, we are getting our referrals done within 48 hours, you know? Something like that is an example that you can really drive it really far with saying, okay, this is what we have to do to get there. This is what we have to do to get there. And if you hold that vision out in front of us, I think we can, I think that's what we're yeah. driving towards, so. I really like that idea of the why as sort of a bridge between these different folks. Yeah. Like, if, in your work, if we're working with the providers, do you think that resonates? How, how do you engage the providers to sort of get them to understand what you're doing and, and focus on really doing it for the right reasons, not because someone told you? Well, you're right on point. It's, it's all about why. And, um, and we have had the most success by showing how this is going to actually improve our outcomes. amazing that in, in our scenario we had a few that were actually we got on board early on for the system that they rely on okay and then they kind of branch out and um, and when the when the system came up live in August it was not mandatory it was um, Mandatory but optional. <laughs> there were certain <laughs> there were Sounds certain like units <laughs> within there were certain units within the facility that went live 100 percent. Okay, and they were live approximately a month before it began to bleed into other areas. Now, how did that happen overnight? All of the paper forms were still available. Okay, um, we had gone through a tremendous time frame of training before it ever went on live. Uh, there was like a four hour tutorial that each physician was asked to uh, complete and they were paid for them. Um, keep. <laughs> Physicians are all about money. Um, and so, you know, the next thing is, is that um, there's a, a two hour one on one where you actually go through the steps. A lot of physicians are in my age range. And as Steve mentioned earlier about the students, you know, it's not that they can't learn, they're intimidated by the electronic world. 
whereas the younger students, we have a residency program and we, we take on eight to 12 new residents every year for a three year program. And they're on it. I mean, you know, they just hit the floor running because they went, they've grown up with it. Uh, that's what their school was all about. But the interesting thing that I noted um, as we took it through the entire hospital and still made paper forms available and paper documentation available, we made it more difficult to get. So if you wanted to use the paper form, you had to request it. And then a nurse had to go find it and then get it back to you, okay? And I actually had physicians that would come to me and they would say, um, you know, um, Mike, can I, can you, you know, Wendy has some time to work with me. Uh, all of my peers are going electronic and I'm just gonna have to go electronic. I had hoped I could retire before this, but I can't, <laughs> so. <laughs> so there's a lot of peer pressure there as well. Um, but it's, um, you know, if you have a lot of understanding with them and then um, it's very rewarding when they come back a little later and they start seeing the benefits of um, how this is helping them get more information quicker. Um, you know, if, a, if I'm a patient in the hospital and um, Dr. Steve wants to uh, see my previous encounters, he would have to call my office in the paper world and then I would have to try to locate those and it might be tomorrow. And now he can just simply go online and pull up every encounter I've had and look at all the information that's in there electronically in just a matter of minutes. quickly gone to the use of tablets and, um, and our IT department has been wonderful in setting up <coughs> setting up the availability for them to access the system uh, through the use of their own tablets uh, from their home. Uh, it, it's amazing what our IT department has done. Uh, it is also amazing that the IT department has finally just discovered that this is an electronic record and initially it was their electronic record but they found out that from the clinical point of view there was a whole lot of information they didn't know about and so initially there were things that had to be redone because they hadn't been considered when building the the system so in, I encourage anyone involved in this to highly recommend to your IT departments that it's very important that this is a teamwork, a teamwork situation. And just an example of jobs that have, have uh, come up, we have now um, uh, nurses who were actually uh, direct patient care who are now clinical informatics oh, wow. nurses, okay, and now they work less with one-on-one -on -one patient care, but they work with the physicians and they work with IT and they're kind of the, the mediators. And they were instrumental in building a lot of our system. So um, it's, a, it's an exciting time. And I'll have to say that if, um, if I had to go to work in a, in a clinic or a hospital now that was paper, <laughs> I'd probably have to go to the house. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, it sounds like it is an exciting time, but there are a lot of hard skills that people need to know, especially if they're making this transition. So can you talk a little bit about the, the work that you guys do here at Dyersburg to, to train students so they can have the skills that Mike's describing and be so involved in this new system? Um, really, the, when the student even thinks about enrolling, the first thing they say is, well, what do you suggest I take? I don't suggest because they need to look over, they need to know what role they want to play in the transformation. Um, that thought was good. I was just letting it go. Um, one thing following up with what Mike said is I worked in health information and you know there we tend to think okay this is our information no one else's. The IT people don't really want to tell you what they know because that's their information. So 
as I said before, the medical people and the IT people are going to have to work together. The medical people, I have a lot that take the trainer role because they enjoy going either from facility to facility or, or within the facility from department to department, training others how hands-on how to navigate through the electronic health records. Uh, as Mike mentioned on some of the nurses, I have nurses in the course that say, I'm burnt out on patient care. I want to get into, I want to stay in health care, but I want to learn the IT part side of it. I want to, to be the go-between between that nurse or that doctor on the floor and the IT person. Um, one of the biggest questions I had from students is the privacy and security. I don't, I don't trust the electronic health record. Why should we have to go to it. Um, but those are the same people that will put their credit card on the internet every day of the week shopping. Uh, they'll do their banking online. Uh, so, you know, you have to, to, to assure them if the government is saying you have to do it, the government is going to make sure that it is protected. In terms of privacy and security, do you guys offer courses in privacy and security? In the here? regular associate. In the regular associate. So, so what are the types of things that you're training people on that might help them get over this misconception or realize that you know if you do it right, it's it's more safe and secure, but you have to do it wrong. Do it right. And as I mentioned before, more of my students are more mature and they really don't understand the computer. Mm -hmm. So once you get them working in the computer and you know it's not like okay I can go to your computer and unpull up anything that that you put in there, you know they, they don't really know the privacy of the computer and how you how you have the logins and the passwords the and role based access exactly. and things along those lines an audit trail for instance sure. that allows you to see everywhere you've gone. I mean, who goes into a paper environment and can see who ever opened up those charts? Exactly. You know, it's impossible in that world. But in the electronic world, there are certain safeguards that are in place. Certainly. Um, also, when you're talking about the trainer role, that sounds like a, a great role for people. Are those people going back into healthcare institutions generally to sort of train on their input systems as they're rolling out? They are doing that, um, and I'm only speaking from my students. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some students that are wanting to go to work for the vendors. Okay. That, Absolutely. You know, we're hoping that I can travel from home, I can work from home, I can answer questions. Most of my students are already working there, and they want to go back in. And you know, I, the biggest thing I've told them is not just the health information department that's affected. It's going to be anybody that has patient care, the laboratory, the X-rays, the nurses, the physicians. Anybody that has patient care is going to have to know the electronic health records so yes they they want to go in not necessarily from one facility to another but and then they said well what what happens when we get everybody trained well everybody is not going to work there forever <laughs> you're going to have new people coming in even though they may have worked in the electronic health record it may not be your particular vendor or, or your system and there are also upgrades systems are continuing to sure. evolve i don't think any system stays static forever, so there's always going to be an opportunity to learn these upgrades, and once you start, I find providers generally say, there's a lot more we want to do, right. so we would need more training on the staff. Let, Lynch, is that, is that your experience, that as you guys have been rolling out the system, there's more and more? I know, for instance, fairly qualified health centers tend to be very focused on, uh, you know, working on chronic diseases and things along those lines. Sure. Has, has the system helped you guys with, uh, with some of your larger uh, objectives, and how has it evolved to really meet the needs that you guys are trying to focus on? Uh, I think that in, in a couple ways. Um, I think, first of all, there's a little bit of standardization that can happen um, through the use of an electronic medical record that uh, is resisted at first because people don't like to be put in boxes, and especially these people who feel like their practice is an art form and not just a science, you know. Um, but uh, you, you can approach it from the standpoint of, like, at least providing the minimal sort of core components of a visit. So one example for us are... Um, Title X family planning visits that we do that have just a ton of requirements that need to be covered from each visit over the course of a year. You need to cover these three educational components and all that. What we can do with the electronic medical record is we can standardize those so that you can kind of 
have your cookie cutter node and then customize it past mm -hmm. that. And so that's, that's one way that it's really helpful. Um, more to the training side of it though, it, like you were kind of talking about, is that there is sort of the, uh, I mean, the, the pace of things is just increased, right? So like in the same way that uh, you know, paper doesn't really change, I mean, the process might change a little bit and so we're all gonna kind of get together on how the workflow changes. But I mean, every upgrade that comes out, there's sort of little things that you have to address you know, on the, on the provider side of things. And so I think, like, like you guys were saying, it's just that there is this sort of continual aspect of the training to key that continues to happen there, where it's not as, you know, just sort of, all right, you have your initial orientation and you're done and until you uh, either retire or go on somewhere else, uh, you know, you're gonna be relatively okay. In this environment, it's much more, I would say even quarterly or at least annually that you're addressing new things that come out. And, and I think what's interesting is you have the data, there's something for the first time you realize what you haven't realized before. Sure. Do you have examples of where you guys have found something that you said, hey, this is something we wanna work on and then have worked using the system to, to have a, a positive outcome? Absolutely, so there's two specifically that we're focused on right now, like you mentioned with chronic disease management, is our, our diabetes and our hyperten hypertensive patients. And being able to, uh, we, we just have some really neat partnerships in Memphis, uh, being a federally qualified health center, we're working with uh, there's actually another organization in Memphis called the Memphis Teacher Residency, and they're coming in and kind of trying to do research on the, the individual neighborhoods that they're coming in to work with. So they're going to be placed at these different neighborhood schools, and they want to know things about what percentage of our patient, uh, you know, what percentage of the people in this neighborhood are hypertensive or diabetic, and just trying to get an idea yeah. of that sort of uh, census tract level information that usually is only available every 10 years or so, that now we're able to provide at a, you know, a, more to year to year basis. So, I mean, it, just from an information standpoint to know who you're dealing with is one way we're using it. The other is very much, uh, as an FQHC, we have a health plan that we have that we're kind of these benchmark health measures that we hold to and try to improve. And so one that we have, we are just, I mean, every other month we alternate between sending out by provider, how are your diabetic patients doing? What's their HGA1C? You know, is it is it below that 9% level? Is it below the 7% level? And kind of looking at how you meeting that target. And then every other month looking at the hypertensive patients and what percentage of your patients are doing. And kind of, you know, uh, doctors are these competitive people, right? That's how they got into med school and they love a little bit of competition driving. And it, it can be grinding, it can be tough, but you know, putting your name up to Dr. A against Dr. B and here are your percentages can be a really powerful driver to uh, ensure uh, improvement yeah, in those areas. Excellent. So, yeah. Well, fabulous. I, I think you know the competitive nature of providers is one of our untapped tools. Right. Because I know when I've implemented these systems, the first time you, you give the data back, there's always a no. This is not can't be possibly right. Sure. Right. And then there's that you know you go through the stages of you know, denial, that they get upset about it, and then they get aggressive, and then they improve it. Like, have you experienced that when you're working with providers on? Oh, absolutely. A, a very prime example that I, the most recent one, uh, involves verbal orders and the number of verbal orders given. And of course, you know, uh, CMS wants verbal orders down, down. And, um, and so there's been a lot of activity on, on verbal orders. And we would present at patient care committee meetings, you know, statistics that we had put together and graphs that we had put together um, discussing um, the percentage um, by um, by specialty, the percentage by area within the hospital. Well, we now have the capability of pulling it up and we can tell you just exactly how many you had and we can put you in relation to everyone else in your specialty. And you know, I had a physician that's going, oh, well, that, you know, that's just not Did me. Did you put up the other physician's and names just or they like see themselves on that chart? No, we we publish it. Everybody's name, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I understand this is not yeah. published out, yeah. you know. It's in, internally it, among, it's among friends. In, right, well, it's in. <laughs> colleagues, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about friends, <laughs> but <laughs> maybe before. But, you know, it's like, uh, whoa, and they're less speechless. Yeah. So it's the old thing that I remember way back when I first started working with computers is you can run, but you can't hide. Yeah. Well, I also think that what you're talking about is one of the best practices we have. Of it's hard to get this data beforehand. The paper charts don't talk to you, but electronic health record can really present the data. 
Um, and I also think it's really exciting that you know with these tools, everybody can participate in the same programs across the country. We talked about the CMS verbal orders. I mean, a lot historically, it's been hard for programs to participate. Lance, you're talking about heart, heart, hypertension. I mean, that's those are national campaigns going on. You're able to sort of track yourself, benchmark against other folks, and I think that's part of the excitement of what we're seeing. Um, I think one of the things that's also very important is this concept of meaningful use, because this is a, a program, a national program. We're really trying to get everybody doing everything the same way. So when you do your quality measures for your FQHC, it's the same across everybody, and you can have that apples to apples. Because one of the challenges we have with providers is, oh, I'm a little different, things along those ways. But if we're using the same standards, there is nowhere to hide. Um, are any of you guys working on, towards meaningful use right now and sort of rolling it out? Lance, is this something you're working on? Yeah, yeah, we, so we adopted, so there's kind of the different stages of it, and there's the uh, adaptation, implementation, and upgrade yeah, year, yeah. and then you actually go for the stage one meaningful use. And so we've had, uh, I think it's 14 providers actually do the attestation for the stage one. Great. Um, and then three that are, should be done in the next day or two with their 90 day reporting period. Um, yeah, so yeah, certainly we're working toward that. So you could talk about some of the things that are involved in that because I think these are illustrate fields and opportunities for new people to come in and help work on them because even though some of them are provider specific, it takes a whole support team to actually achieve these, these goals. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't mean to contradict too much of your question there, but I, I feel, I mean, Go like, for it. Come on. I, okay. Um, I mean, that's true in the setup of it, but actually yeah. in the invitation of if you have a good vendor and you have a good EMR, actually almost all of that is done for you. Like, it, and really that's, uh, I mean, there's two sides to the coin there. One, you, you want that situation where you can, especially in the FQHC where we're lean and, you know, administratively we're trying to keep it as small as possible. You want to try to get as much out from one person as you can. At least that's how we, and I'm sure many other organizations drive that way as well. Many of us can attest to that in our own uh, roles. But the other side of that is like, I mean, uh, yeah, you, you want the vendor to be able to do that. And yes, it does take a few people, but I feel like what ultimately happens is if you can train it well, the only really hiccups that we've had are the things that the providers are actually responsible for and the system is doing the rest for them without them even really knowing it. So things like the, uh, you know, the point of entry being computerized instead of verbal, um, you know, medications being sent electronically, problems list being updated, like all Patient those things are just like, going out. Yeah, so this, those sort of things happening right. almost automatically. It's it, the real hiccups for us are actually on the things that have to be printed. So a provider actually exactly. has to say, I want this piece out, or I want this patient education out. Those have been the more difficult things, and, and not really qu requiring a whole team. We needed the team more for implementing the EMR and then for the meaningful use. So, so for you, meaningful use is already, you're beyond meaningful use. You know, that was sort of the basic, because the concept of stage one was it was supposed to be the fundamental step. Sure. It sounds like you guys are already thinking stage two, stage three, sure. beyond that. Yeah, yeah. Which is, which is great. Mike, are you guys working on meaningful use in your organization yet? or? Well, it's my understanding, and of course I'm not in administration, yeah. but, um, but it's my understanding that we have already received some of the um, great. government money um, in a sizable amount for um, the Jackson facility. Okay. Understanding that the affiliates, as they come on, we have a deadline to meet yes. to bring all of them up and be able to provide meaningful use at that time. Um, it is a lot of um, vendor driven um, responsibility for meeting the guidelines to meet meaningful use. But um, it, it's complicated from my perspective because I'm not in that, I'm, I'm less IT and more Is it those folks right? more training. Yeah, and I think that where it works well is when it's all one view. And mm -hmm. you're not doing things for checking boxes to meet your programmatic needs, but you're going back to the why. And I think that's what you guys have been very articulately talking about. Is right. important. And that some, being things said, that, some things that you know that I can recall that we actually had some concerns about as end users was being able to provide certain documents. Um, you know, through the system, you had to go back and rework in the system, yeah. and they had to understand this is what we have to have, and this is what the system needs to do. Can you make it do it? And there, there's, you know, there's collaboration on that. Oh yeah. I, I think the patient care summary is one of the elements I think that it, a lot of people struggle with. 
just on that systems perspective. Because yeah. you want to give something to the patient that summarizes the encounter in a way they can understand it, that has all the most relevant points, because most providers will recognize that's a really powerful tool for patient education. Mm -hmm. But getting systems to sometimes do that so that the information comes out in English, <laughs> it, it, that's where we need these people coming back and forth. And I think this is where the, the skilled health IT workforce is so important, to be able to bridge those two worlds. Uh, Steve, in, in your classes with, on the IT side, are you guys talking a little bit about sort of data standards and how you get data into the system so you can generate reports that are sort of consistent across the board? Yes. Yes, and they have uh, activities within the curriculum and then you have the VA VISTA educational oh, yeah. program that most of the students can use. Some of the students, their computer won't support it okay. because they're older. Uh, there is no VISTA for the Mac that we have. So yeah, it's, it's learning how to go in, navigate, how do I make this do what I need this to do. And, and are you teaching you know, this is a great open source program out there. It's the model right. that a lot of EHRs follow. Are you talk? Do you educate people about how to use sort of like standard terminologies in the system so that they could be search machine readable things along those lines? Yes, part of the curriculum that, and I go strictly by the <coughs> curriculum that was given to Good. us from OMC because that's what the competency exam is going to be based Absolutely. on. Uh, you know, and and. As I mentioned before, the healthcare people said, why do I need to know how many megs and how many kilobytes and all that? Well, that's to make you better understand what the computer can do. Exactly. The system's only as good as the data you put into it, right? The data put in and the person can, 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 can illustrate and get out. Um, one of the things we're very interested in is you know promoting exchange of information so that providers can, can get information with referrals. And Lance, you were sort of talking about that referral management, being able to get the data out and get it back into the system. How are you guys sort of using your EHR to, to, to work on exchange of information? So uh, there's the Mid-South eHealth Alliance, which is a regional information exchange okay. in uh, Southwest Memphis, and I mean, Southwest Tennessee. And, and it may be going out of you. I mean, it was they're kind of in a precarious place of having been kind of on the cutting edge of this, but the hospitals who were the main funders of that not getting the full effect out of it, so their future is sort of mm -hmm. nebulous. Uh, but uh, that was kind of one way that we were working it uh, out. You know, I think for us, we're still, we're kind of on the brink of it, I feel like. Uh, I, I think that our, our system is there, but we still end up doing things like, uh, it's improved because we print out like uh, continuing care documents if we're going to admit a patient to the hospital or to the emergency department. And so that, that's helpful, but it's still kind of one of those like, uh, we're not quite there yet, you know, where it's, it's still like I was talking about earlier, it's still that bridge software between the paper past and the electronic future. It's like sort of halfway there, you know, it's like a hybrid still where you can print it out from the system, but you're still handing it to the patient and sending it with them. And so we're not quite there on, on okay. the full and expression of that. Later this afternoon, we'll have a great presentation on sort of things that are do being done in Tennessee on Health Information Exchange. We at ONC recognize that we're sort of in this place and we've been, been promoting different technologies, for instance, for something called Direct, which basically is the same way that currently, you know, providers fax over information, sure. referrals. This is just an electronic system, very lightweight to sort of address that. So, but these, these are one of the evolving things that are going to happen in the ish future. Um, this issue that you're bringing up about exchange is very important to us because especially in rural areas, oftentimes people have to travel so much to get from one provider to the other, if you don't have the information, it can be a huge issue. Um, Mike, are you, when you're training and working with providers, are you teaching them how to sort of get data from other places, incorporate it into the record in sort of a consistent way that it can be used to sort of better coordinate care? Well, we certainly um, have discussion on that. I, I don't think we're at the point okay. that we can um, have much meaning to that kind of exchange. Okay. But now we are, um, we're addressing it. Good. And, um, but it's really, really in the very embryonic well, it stage. It sounds like you've got a lot of other things on your plate right now, getting yeah. the systems up and operational. So that makes sense that it is a, it's a skill that you evolve over time. Um, I want to go back to the, the discussion you had about sort of working with your affiliate providers and getting them online. Um, one of the, the, the challenges, the opportunities of the Meaningful Use Program or the EHR Incentive Program is there are these financial incentives for getting folks on board. Um, but for folks, for instance, who, who 
Medicare in your Medicare program, they have to start their 90-day reporting period by October 3rd of this year to get through the full payment. Are, is your organization really ramping up to try to work around that October 3rd deadline in terms of getting people moving? Or is that something that you use, have your timeline and you're moving forward to independently? There's been some work in that direction. Uh, all of our affiliates are uh, actually up with the record with the okay. exception of uh, physician documentation. Okay. So, you know, it's extremely hybrid in that area. Um, it's difficult in that area because the smaller, more rural um, facilities have a lot of the older people and it, it, it's, uh, it, it requires a real strong administrative push to get this participation. Got it. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I, I think of one physician that I, I is in a particular location and this is the kind of work, this is how all of us are really working together, educators, coaches, end users. Um, this gentleman barely knew what a mouse was. He's a physician. He's a good physician. He's very thorough. His documentation is superb. Um, but he just simply was terrified of the computer. And he signed up to take the course. Uh, I had uh, worked with him and trained him on, on our part of the electronic clinical documentation prior to physician documentation. And so he signed up to take a course from Steve, and Steve actually made more than one trip to his facility to sit with him individually and work through getting on the computer, how it works, how the system works. He offered to come back anytime. Um, so that's the kind of teamwork that our um, area is experiencing, and I think it's excellent just excellent, um, and I, you don't find that anywhere. That's great. Steve, can you talk a little bit about this? You alluded to you have these people, but I think getting these people who are so reluctant and scared to get over that hump is a huge challenge. How do you guys tackle that? Most, I have even gone to stay at home wow. once they get off from work, yeah. and, and like I said before, they're afraid. Yeah. You know, I, when I started working with computers most, the lady that was training me gave me one important rule. You can't do anything that I can't fix. L4 is your friend. <laughs> Skype is your friend. <laughs> you know, they're afraid if I get on there, I'm going to tear this computer up and it's never going to work again. Most of the people need hands on. They need yeah. to watch you do it and then they need to sit down, try to do it on their own, look to you when they need guidance, like do I press this? They won't ask, yeah. they just look at you. Um, <laughs> this physician that Mike talked about, you know, the first time I went, I thought, I'm getting somewhere with this guy. You know, he's even asked, does our stroke state offer just a basic computer? Yeah. And I thought, you know, I, yes, sir, we do. I'll get your information. Great. I got it to him. Never heard another word. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's it's getting them past the, the fear that I'm going to tear it up or I'm going to blow it up. And I'm going to do something, and it's going to go way out there. Nobody can ever find it. Nobody can ever it. correct it. Nobody. But w once I do it, it's there. So the hands-on training. Uh, I also taught another computer class for Sarasburg State Adjunct, and I had students come and go in all the time to my door. It was like I don't know how to do that. They did know how to do that. They just didn't have the confidence to go on and do it. So getting the confidence assuring them they're not going to blow the computer up. Watch me, monkey see, monkey do. Yeah. Um, but to me, that's the best way to get them. And it sounds like you're getting all kinds of people coming through your program, representing the entire healthcare sector. Pretty much. Providers, nurses you mentioned, nurses, front desk, people in other fields. Physicians, officers, medical records. I mean, uh, health information, excuse me, yeah. we're no longer <laughs> medical records. <laughs> exactly. Okay, see, the terms are even changing here. <laughs> Excellent. So there really is a role for everyone to get this education yes. to learn how to use these systems. Um, do you find that there's any group of folks that, that are more excited about this than others, or is it across the entire spectrum? Uh, I'd say pretty much over the entire the spectrum. spectrum. Great. Uh, there are some that are less excited, and we've 
apologies. Yeah. Because you got to bring those people along. You have to bring those people along. I haven't had a lot of physicians. Okay. Sign up. I had one physician that signed up for one of the first or second round of classes that we offered, and he was just, he should have been a poster boy for the, the program because he was just gung ho. Matter of fact, he was the one that told this other physician that worked in the same office, you need to take this. Mm. You need to take this. Uh, he was really, if he had questions, he called, he came to the office, I went to his office. He had one problem was um, at his home taking the classes. He was, uh, he was limited, he only had dial-up uh, medicine. And as you know, in the curriculum, there's a lot of PowerPoint, PDFs, <coughs> uh, videos type thing. And he really got frustrated with me and he started quit. And I said, no, we will print off what wow. you want in your classes when we bring it to you. And you know, just knowing that, hey, they must be decent people because they're willing to work with me. Well, that was true, but we needed to still get caught. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but whatever works, you know, you got to get it covered. The commitments that people go across the board. Um, that, that's fabulous. Uh, Lance, in terms of your workforce, uh, you know, I'm sure you have people been with organization a long time. Mm -hmm. um, how did you bring everybody on board dealing with some of these issues that, that we're hearing about? It's reluctance, fear. Or do you need these people because they're an important part of your organization? Yeah. I think I think we're growing in that, and I think that uh, you know we as, as you do each go live at each of the different clinics, you get a little bit better at that, and and as you bring each new provider on, you get a new taste. Of that. I mean, we had everybody from a new nurse practitioner who went out, you know, you kind of get used to how you start training, and so you have all these, you know, this is what it's like on a paper chart, and she just looked at me and said, I've never used a paper chart before, and it's like. Okay, so you know, we're going to change a little bit to you know the the provider who's been there for decades, you know, and, and is still just yelling at the um, mobile device she has, you know. So um, I, I think that a lot of it, uh, you know, I think first we went in and we said this is how long we had to train everybody and just kind of went on. And I think you really do have to kind of do it standards based rather than times based. Of like, can you do this function? And we're gonna sit. We're gonna do whatever we have to do until you can get to do that. Because the IT, I mean, it, it, the patients don't exist so that we can have an awesome HIT department, yeah. right? Like, and it's just kind of that car before the horse thing. Like, this exists so that we can do excellent patient care. And so, to that end, you have to continue to say, all right, I may get a resident in, and it takes me less than three hours to cover the entire spectrum of our whole EMR and our workflow just because it makes sense to them, you know? And then it may take a week or two weeks or more, three weeks, I don't know. Uh, but uh, certainly taking just more time uh, to train the provider on the front end. So kind of taking that uh, on a provider by provider basis. And, and for us, it's just having a list of stamps. What, what do you have to be able to do in this system to be able to provide effective care? And just kind of going down the list. Can, you know, can you do this reliably and not moving on until you get past that? I think the second part of it is just communication, just continued support and communication. What happens is that traditionally your IT department falls somewhere under like a CFO or a CIO and the pace of problems is a financial pace, like monthly, right? Like this needs to be done before we close the month out. But when you move into HIT, the IT department has to operate at an operational pace. If this doesn't print out within the next 30 seconds, I've got somebody very frustrated, A, that they didn't get an appointment on time, B, that they waited two hours, and now they're sitting in front of me and they can't leave until I print this out for them, you know? And so that, I think, you have to sort of change the mentality of like being just this help desk, like waiting in a central place, to like being out with providers. Like that's been a big change for us, is like trying to change the mentality of like waiting for calls to come and t sort of resolving those issues for individual providers to just, all right, I'm gonna, uh, every week I'm gonna make a round through each one of these clinics, I'm gonna answer any problems that are happening, just checking everything okay, is everything okay, is really everything okay? You know, just sort of following in on a by provider basis, not just on the front end training, but on ongoing basis. Got it. I, I like the whole idea of excellent patient care, because I mean, that's I think why a lot of these providers are doing what they're doing. Absolutely. Do you guys, like when you educate providers, do you talk about how you can use this to patient care or how to, to really focus on the patient experience and how help, help IT can really expand that as a system? 
Um, yeah, uh, some of the resistance we met initially was, uh, you know, when I'm talking to my patient, I have the chart right in front of me, okay? Um, well, now, on your tablet, or what we call them, um, cows, computer on wheels. I love that term. <laughs> you, you have those um, right there at the bedside. You can um, pull up that patient's chart and immediately you have an a inpatient summary. Mm -hmm. And it is, it's not virtual, but you can refresh and it'll update as information feeds in. But you have a whole snapshot of this patient right in front of you. Uh, everything from their demographics to their um, history to their diet to their uh, complaint uh, to the orders that have been given you can place orders right from that screen you can document notes right from that screen you can access other physicians notes that have seen this right from that screen all in one shot and uh, you can tailor that screen to uh, obviously open as little in the beginning as you want. A uh, big complaint in the beginning was that, you know, it took so long for this page to open. Well, that was because everything was set to open. Yeah. So you customize it, which the things that you are really important to see right now, and your page is open just like that. So, um, you know, it, we use that as a, as a prime example, and it's the first thing that comes up. Uh, another example is that we will uh, occasionally, um, if, if we're permitted, we'll make rounds with mm -hmm. the physician if they're agreeable to it. If they're having any kind of an issue, can we just go around with you this morning? And you know, we'll, we'll help you with that. One big complaint, or I won't know if it's a complaint, it's a concern uh, that I have heard from both physicians and from patients is that um, the physician says, I can't talk to my patient because I'm looking and talking to the computer. And the patient says, he's not talking to me, he's working on that computer. Hmm. So that's a big obstacle that, that I have And, and how do we address that? Because I think there are ways of addressing that. Well, I think it comes with experience. Okay. Okay, the more comfortable you become with your the easier it is for you to switch back and forth. Uh, there will be people that will never be good at it, and there will be people that will get really good at it. And it's like speakers who can look at everyone. You know, I'm not very good at it, but there are people who can talk, and everyone in the room feels like that speaker is talking directly to them. So, um, you know, I, I don't really know how to answer your question. Well, I, one, one of the things that we hear a lot of is simply by turning the screen around, and so you're having a conversation. Instead of the doctor looking at the screen, the patient over here is this, uh -huh. is this. Uh -huh. You know, having them both use the screen, um, we, a, a lot of doctors find that the patient can help say, oh, doc, I don't have that. And they can help through little <laughs> fact checkers going along. Exactly. And because no one knows their health better than the patient. So getting them involved with being an active participant can sometimes help address that issue. Lance, is that something you guys deal with? Or yeah, I think our, our implementation is, I mean, certainly driving that area. I mean, we, we have iPads that are mobile device and documentation documenting tools and so uh, it, it is a little bit hard to sort of yeah. I mean the the interface for documentation is the screen you know so unless yeah. you're kind of typing like this <laughs> and doing some sort of magic there trick, you go. Uh, it's a little bit difficult so to pull teaching people like yoga or yeah. things to position right. themselves in right so I think there I think there's two things there I think one is making as much use of its mobility and showing things I mean medical art that you can show or yeah, things that you can show I mean review you know reviewing it as, as you go along I think is one thing I think the other thing is a, a willingness to always put the patient first, and especially in the midst of the transition time of saying, I mean, our, our providers will say, look, I mean, if, if I can sense that my patient is disengaging or they feel like they're not getting my full time, set it down. Like, set it down. And d get all what you need, come out of the room and finish the documentation. You know, I mean, like, it's that point, of, again, like, this is a tool to enable the service. Absolutely. The patient isn't here so we can have a really neat data set. You know, I mean, we, we would like to get that out of it, but that's not our that's not our chief end. So I think it's ultimately saying, look, this patient's needs and, and their care is what's primary to us. 
that. Steve, is this something you guys work on in training on how to use technology or integrated tools in the, uh, the healthcare setting in a way that sort of engages patients? Uh, definitely in, in our classes we teach that the way it used to be, the patient was there, the doctor didn't tell them a whole lot about what they saw when they, when they examined them or what was my blood pressure today or whatever. So it's, it's teaching the patient if they don't tell you what you want to hear, ask. It's your health, it's your records, it's your office visit, and it's your medical records. So if you don't, you know, take charge of your medical records. That, hey, there you go. I think that's a, that's a great motto. I mean, I think that's something we're all, you know, consumers exactly. of healthcare at a certain point, we can all lead by examples and providers should remember that as well. And I've gone to the doctor and left and think, well, he never, he gave me medicine, but I don't know what for. <laughs> so if he doesn't well, tell I you think uh, we can more, familiar. Ask. Good. All right, well, we're coming towards the end of our time and this has been really good, but I, I wanna make sure I give everybody an opportunity to talk about sort of what they think the biggest challenge and opportunity in terms of getting folks into this workforce is and, and helping them actually be productive members when, when they get there. So Steve, can you, can you speak to that first? As in all jobs, you have some people that are there because I need a paycheck. I don't really care what I'm doing, I just need a paycheck. And then you have those that are gung-ho. The biggest frustration that students talk to me about is first of all, you know, they want someone with experience. Well, how am I going to get experience if someone doesn't give me the opportunity Great to point. have experience? Uh, the other one is, well, we want, um, you know, at some of the other meetings, the vendors have come up, you know, and I had one lady that finished the courses, she took all three roles, and within a month she was working for a vendor and flying off to California. But she was one of those, I don't have children at home, I don't have a husband at home, I don't mind driving more than 10 minutes to get to work. You know, it's like, hey, I'll go wherever I have to and yep. I'll do what I have to do. You know, the work, the employer is gonna have to give people a chance. Uh, the electronic health record is something that the majority of, in this area, no one has that much experience for, so maybe these students have the advantage. You know, we did this in school. You know, no, I haven't done it as a job, and I haven't sat down and, and did, the, did that all day long, but I've got some knowledge about it, which is more than what some of the people that's already working there do. But then the American people are also going to have to understand they don't come to you. You have to go out there, and I have one that's a student that has finished. He's very intelligent. He has IT side. He lives in a larger city in Tennessee that healthcare is everywhere around him, but he still doesn't have a job. So I called and I told him about some of the jobs that I've heard. Well, that really wasn't what he wanted to do. <laughs> and I said, you need to get your foot in the door. Once you get in the foot in the door, they see what kind of worker you are. Uh, you hear before the outside what jobs are open, you know, advance. You can't go in being CEO. You <laughs> may have to start out as a janitor. And, and a lot of the students, you know, well, that's not what I trained for. That's not what I'm going to do. That's not what I want to do. So it's, it's different thinking on both the employer and the employees. <coughs> Got it. Good. And managing expectations on both sides exactly. and they're seeing where they are. I think it's a good way. Lance, what do you think? Opportunities and challenges. Yeah, so I, I can think of, I think, three things here. Uh, the first being, I mean, a lot of what Steve said already, just of, one, uh, the employers having to, um, I, I think, defining the new roles, I think, is kind of one of the challenges in that, uh, in, again, in a paper workflow, because there's a physical item that's floating around, it's easier to define what everybody's role yeah. is, right? And so in the electronic world, like, roles are going to change. I mean, where you have a, where you had a phone nurse doing this part of it, like now it's really an ordered 
tracking nurse or so you know something like that where it's not so much like answering phone calls and taking care of prescriptions it's more like monitoring this electronic list that's building up and so I think one of the challenges that employers are going to have is to continue to define well define those roles because otherwise you have an entire system that's open to everybody and it can cause uh, either overwhelming kind of an overwhelming sense from if you're responsible for the whole thing or sort of a timidity or, or fear like not knowing where where do I fit into this workflow um, I think the second thing is also for an employer side like learning that uh, you can let go of some of the need to have health people involved like this is sort of the, the, the marriage of IT and health creates a whole realm of jobs where you can have people who knew nothing about health can come in and provide meaningful jobs and meaningful assistance Absolutely. that you can learn this as an application and not as the whole driving thing you know so I mean even my background my background was mathematics and operational engineering you know so like nothing to do with healthcare, and I hadn't been to a doctor in like 10 years you know so it's like you know, I, you know, I, don't, I don't even know what this is about so but I can come in and I can learn this as an application to all the problem-solving skills I've learned all of the other things I've learned to sort of see this toward patient care and then um, yeah, I think that uh, the third thing is uh, just for employees to finally recognize and admit that this is where healthcare is going, right? I, I think that that's kind of a, we're, we're at this point where, I mean, even, even you know, some of the people that are employed with us are still kind of hoping that maybe one day it'll go away. You know, like, <laughs> maybe, you know, this will, you know, I mean, but seriously, like, subconsciously, that's still in their heads of, like, Maybe maybe this is all just a ter you know terrible nightmare, and I'll wake up tomorrow, and it'll all be gone. And and I think just admitting that that's not the case, and and I think that that again uh, is is certainly a drive from uh, the administrative types or the people that are driving for it to communicate the value and the why behind it, uh, so that it, it makes that transition a little bit more palatable and not just uh, you know this fearful endeavor. Excellent. So. Um, from a student perspective, um, and you know, this took place prior to the high tech program, um, <coughs> but just from a student per perspective, I went into this field with no um, health background uh, at age 16. Okay, so fortunately, I have an employer who saw something in me in skills other than a health background that could be beneficial to their department. So as a student, I had to realize that there's a lot of things in healthcare that I have to learn as I go, but anything to get my foot in the door, I'll do any job. You have got to get somehow or other the students to understand that this is what's gonna have to be done. And then once you get in there, you know, it's a it's a learning experience that just explodes, and so you you go in your own direction. There are a lot of directions you can go, you know, once you get in into the um, into the organization. But as Steve said, the gentleman in the larger city who said, "Well, that wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, I wanted to do anything that would let me get in and see if I really learned anything in school." <laughs> So um, that's kind of a challenge to get the students, I think, or some of the students to have that, um, that kind of drive. Employers, I, ha I did find employers to be reluctant to hire <coughs> outside the healthcare background. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's been seven years ago, so I think now I might find it a little different. I think it might be, um, we, we hired someone into the field that, that actually had a teaching background, and she's turned out to be phenomenal. So I think um, um, I even know some people that I interviewed with in other healthcare facilities who have a different attitude now. Why I, they didn't want me at the time because I had no background in it. But you know, I think those are challenges both from the um, from the healthcare industry who has to understand that I'm going to have to bring these people in um, 
if they've got some education and they, they have some basic skills and give them a chance to learn in here, I believe they might be able to provide a real asset to me. And then the student, on the other hand, has to say, you know, I'll do anything, just let me get into the business. Uh, a student, an excellent student, that um, was one of mine as an adjunct instructor, wanted to be co wanted to be a coder. Okay, that's what she really wanted to be. But no one wants a coder without experience, I can tell you. They, they want experienced coders. Well, this lady took a job to get in and she analyzed charts and she, she integrated the two to increase her coding knowledge and she is one of the top coders in our organization. Mm -hmm. Because she had that drive, she took any job she could to get in and then she focused on her goal. So, um, you know, those are, those are just some stories of some people who make it work. There are people out there that want to be led by the hand, and, and you can you can't change that other than you can kind of try to direct them and explain. Show some some real life cases where, hey, if you really want to do something, you can do it. Terrific. Well, I think you know this panel has been is fabulous because I think you really framed the key issues that we have been sort of trying to promote, which is, you know, it's the meaningful use of meaningful use, really illustrating the why of what we're talking about. It's not to check the box, but it's going beyond. Um, and that, you know, in terms of meeting people in the needs of this healthcare industry, it's constantly evolving. And that we, as educators, as employers, as students, have to keep working with that evolution to sort of make sure that we're adapting and evolving, because the one thing we know is, is that where we'll, what the world will look like in three years will be very different from the world that it looks like now. Um, and I think that is what's amazing about this opportunity in time, is the transformation that we're having um, is, is tremendous. So I just wanted to thank you guys very much for this. This has been really informative, um, and I appreciate your time and effort. Thank you very much. All right. So we are now going to shift gears a little bit, and we're going to begin talking a little bit about uh, health IT training uh, for rural providers. And uh, I'm going to welcome up to the, the uh, podium, uh, Kate Gooding and Patricia Dombrowski, who are two uh, leaders in the community college workforce program that uh, my team has been fortunate enough to support. Um, and these, are, these, these folks are really on the cutting edge of thinking through what we can do in terms of getting the word out and how we as a, a nation can really think about uh, dealing with health IT in those rural areas and what are the specific needs. So I think we're going to take a, a brief pause while we get the presentation loaded, um, and then we will proceed along. I am Kay Gooding, and I am the uh, director of Region D of the High Tech Workforce Training Program. And I'm extremely pleased to be here, but more importantly, I'm also extremely pleased that our representative schools from Tennessee are here. We have Chattanooga, we have Walter State, and of course we have Dyersburg, and they're all working remarkably hard to make this entire educational process a success. I did want to vie for the poster child, though. Uh, earlier they mentioned their own poster child. I just wanted to share with you, this is a personal story, and once I, this happened, I knew that we were going to be successful. My personal care physician, and I've been going to him since I was about 12 years old, all right? As it turns out, we're about the same age. He actually taught in the high school in which I graduated, so we're close together, so I'm telling you that so that you'll know just how long I've known this person. I would have bet you any amount of money that I had that he would never, ever go EHR, ever, under any circumstances. I was at a point I thought, I'm going to have to change my personal care position because I can't be in this job and support that. Well, I'm here to tell you that this gentleman's office burned to the ground <laughs> about eight or nine years ago. And even with that, I was sure he would never go EHR. Now you think about it. I'm not gonna tell you how old I am, but this hair is really platinum. It is not gray. <laughs> <laughs> and here I am with my medical record burned to a crisp. 
and he is still not going to go EHR. I am here to tell you that the last time I was there, he walked in with his laptop in his hand. He sat it down in front of me. He was using voice recognition, and I said, well, how do you like it? He said, I love it. <laughs> he loves it. For the first time in his career, he goes home at night, and his work is done. He is not taking it home with him. It's been absolutely amazing. And in retrospect, I've tried to figure out how that happened, because I've known him a long time, and he's very resistant, okay? I'm going to give credit where credit is due, and that is Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> the man had a Facebook account, and the first time he tried to friend me, I thought, this is weird, what's going on? <laughs> and I really think that his social media, being comfortable with the computer from that point of view, kind of eased him into thinking about it. The irony of the situation is he has two younger partners who are not doing as well with the EHR. That's the unfortunate thing. They are so busy trying to be in control as they were before that they're not utilizing the aspects of the EHR. And so he's now the biggest cheerleader in the office because he's saying, telling them, you need to do so-and-so, you need to do this, you need to do that. Anyway, it's just it's a story that every time I go over there, I'm really, I'm really amazed at it. My goal today is to share with you what's going on in education as far as high tech and how we believe we can be of some service to you. And I'm here to let you know that we, as we typically do in the community college system, we'll do everything we can to be all things to all people. And that includes you all, of course. Oops, I've got to get my arm straight here. Um, you recognize, of course, where we were. You recognize, of course, where we hope we're going. And in between, there's a classic comment that Dr. David Blumenthal made, and it just has been my mantra, and that is health information technology is a circulatory system for the vital organs of health care. And I think that really says everything we are trying to accomplish in education. If you don't remember anything else about anything I say today, there's a website. Everything you need to know is on that website. And in classic educator form, I have handouts. There are four <laughs> handouts up here. There are two handouts back there. I can make them available to you electronically. My purpose being letting you see the different types of uh, brochures and so forth we've developed, particular to sit certain audiences. So if you see something there you like, you need hard copy, let me know. You need electronic copy, you let me know. We are, we're here to, to meet your needs, whatever they may be. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the educational funding that was made available through the ONC. There are really four component parts. The first, of course, the curriculum development centers. These are the individuals who authored the curriculum that the Dyersburg and the Chattanooga and the Walter State are teaching. There is no finer education in this country. Duke, Columbia, Johns Hopkins, Oregon Health, University of Alabama at Birmingham. I don't know about you all, but I think that is an absolutely awesome set of individuals, and where else can I get that kind of education federally funded? Mm -hmm. There is also university-based training programs for those individuals who already have a baccalaureate degree and are interested in some master's level work. There's some federal funding there. There is a competency examination program with the intent of it becoming a credential. So it cannot be a credential as long as um, the ONC is, is involved in that aspect because the government can't bestow a credential, but that's being, uh, the efforts are being made. And finally, the Community College Consortium, which is what I represent today and what our next speakers represent. Our goal, and why the funding opportunity was originally written, was to provide non-degree six-month training for those people who already have an IT background or who already have a medical background so that we can provide that cross-training that you heard our former speakers allude to the necessity of. Now, there's some variations on this training. You're going to hear from our speakers after myself, and they're going to sh share with you some unique ways they have done it somewhat differently. But our goal was to train the thousands of individuals that are necessary to be able to accomplish this. 
our time frame, our funding started April the 2nd of 2010, and because of a no-cost extension, we are going to be able to allow this through April the 1st of 2013. However, as you write that down, let me caution you, the funding stops April 2013, but students are going to have to have a six-month or there about period of time to get this education, so we need to work fast to get them through while federal funding is available. Now, don't be concerned, it's not going anywhere, it just will no longer be federally funded. So I wanna leave that message with you. The sustainability piece is real critical. Now, I represent 13 states, 19 community colleges. And so we cover from New Mexico to North Carolina, including Tennessee, Kentucky, and Oklahoma. So we're a very broad range. We were the largest uh, region in the country. Now this is just a little map to give you an idea about where all of our training programs that were federally funded through the ONC are located. You will see some borders giving you the regions and of course you now see the lower southeastern region which is the, the group that I represent. <coughs> I want to share with you who those colleges are. You also see them the yellow, those are your Tennessee colleges. So you can see that you make up a large portion, three colleges in Tennessee, not but about three or four of our states had that many in, in a given state. So we were able to divide this up regionally. Now, <clears throat> we had some very specific criteria for the colleges that were going to participate with us. This, as Matt alluded to earlier, was a quick turnaround. We, as a KHIM accredited health information management or health information technology program at Pitt Community College, when we authored uh, the funding proposal for this, we knew we had to move quickly and get schools that already had a good background in what we were trying to accomplish. So we only included colleges that already had a KHIM accredited health information technology or health information management program. In other words, programs that graduated individuals that were eligible to sit and write the Registered Health Information Technician Exam, the RHIT. You may have heard of RHITs and RHIAs, your Health Information Administrators and Health Information Technicians. <coughs> we knew with that we would have faculty that were qualified because the curriculum as we have it is very much already what that curriculum is for the Health Information Manager with the exception that there is an increased emphasis on IT. We had all recognized we needed an increased emphasis on, our, on IT in our curriculums and the federal funding just is giving it to us. So it's a fabulous opportunity. All right, now, in order to be partic a participant in this program, two things. A, you had to be in a KHIM accredited program as far as Region D is concerned. Now, not every region followed that pathway. You also had to agree to create a sustainability model so we're not going anywhere. We're gonna stay on with this. Now that sustainability model, however, can be in many different ways. You can see some of these are outlined. Some of our schools are going to incorporate every bit of this training into their already existing health information management programs, which means that now a student's gonna graduate with a two-year degree and not only be able to write the RHIT exam, but possibly seven hit or six hit pro exams. Think about that a moment. A student graduating from a two-year degree and then eligible to take seven different credentialing exams. That's pretty awesome, mm. pretty awesome. All right, in addition to that, there may be postgraduate certification <coughs> processes. For instance, you may wanna bring back your respiratory therapist and they can take this uh, post-degree cer certificate in the electronic health record. Or maybe you wanna bring the <coughs> nurse back. Maybe you wanna bring the doctor back for that. But anyway, that's an option. There's also options for specializations within degrees. Maybe within the HIM program at your local college, they may wanna just do a coding track or they may, instead of that, decide they want to do an EHR track. I just need to reference there that your RHITs and your RHIAs are those individuals that are credentialed in coding and ICD-10, which I know is hot on your list. Mm -hmm. And finally, continuing education for all. So there's going to be lots of avenues there. We just need to know which way you want to go so that we can prepare and get it ready for you. So there's not any any miscommunication there whatsoever. Now, as we go into this discussion, I'm gonna to try to explain to you how this curriculum is designed. But the thing I want you to remember is that any piece, any part, any microscopic little aspect of it can be brought forward for you. 
So I don't want you to think, oh, that's too much. Our people can't do that. I want you to think that we're a one-stop shop, and we can give you the pieces and parts that you need, the pieces and parts then combining for stackable education. All right. I happened to take a look at the Delta Regional Information, and you had a health information technology guide for the Delta Rural Hospital Performance Improvement Program. This was dated in August of last year. So with this, you had already done, or this organization had already done a lot of research about health information technology and workforce development. Sorry, I overshot. And in that, some challenges were defined in that report. And I'm not going to bore you with all of them, but competition to get the people. IT staff to employee ratios much lower in hospitals. Cost. Lack of understanding about he, how EHRs can be used. The skill set for IT people. Increased training opportunities are needed that are inexpensive and deliver competency-based EHR training and continuing education programs. In addition, lack of standardization in the use of EHRs, lack of sustainability plans, training changes rapidly because technology changes, and vendor-supplied training is often non-existent or not enough. Hmm, big challenges. Can we fix it? Absolutely. The ONC, through those five schools mentioned earlier, has developed six different workforce roles. You see them on the screen in front of you. The four at the top are considered to be mobile adoption. The two at the bottom are considered to be more of a permanent aspect. These are roles. These are big pictures. But now I want you to, this is the forest I'm talking about. We're also going to talk about the trees, and we're going to talk about the leaves as we go through it. What else can we think in terms of? If you don't know what these are, are I've given you a brief synopsis of each one. I'm not going to stand, stand here and read it to you. I think it's you know, fairly explanatory, practice workflow and information. You see the types of workers. These have a, would have a background in healthcare or IT. Clinician, practitioner, consultant, generally considered to be a licensed individual. They're going to be doing practice workflow, but they're also going to be that liaison, that peer person that's going to be able to help explain and bring forth uh, individuals that are interested. Implementation support specialists. This is your own site user support. Uh, these typically have IT or information backgrounds. Installation of hardware, configuring software. Implementation managers, these are also going to be your on-site managers, being able to bring things up and ready to go. The fourth one, your technical and software support staff, this is much like your help desk. And in addition, your trainer, which was mentioned earlier today, getting those people ready to go out and train and help bridge that gap. Lots of detail there, but where are we as far as what the Delta region thought the solutions were? And what can the community college system that's already in operation do? First of all, they felt we needed to train and develop HIT staff from within the organizations. I'm here to tell you that's what we can do. Number two, fill workforce gaps with skill sets from within the organization. That's what we're doing. Three, alternatives traditional to traditional HIT implementations. We are training people that can help make those decisions for the providers of care out there. Training healthcare providers on basic computer skills. Got it. Got it covered. Going to show you that in a minute, just how basic we can be. Set up modified templates, tables, decision support. All those things we can meet. Train providers how EHRs can be used to improve clinical practice, quality of care, patient safety, and meaningful use. Let me tell you that meaningful use has been being done by RHIAs and RHITs for 50 years, not under that name, not under that term, but that's what's been going on in your health information man depart management departments, in your hospitals for years and years. We talk about it in quality assurance. We talk about it in total quality management. I mean, those things have been going on, but there's never been such a focus and such a, an influence on physicians' offices. What else can we do? These are the things that the Delta region decided they needed. Training healthcare super users, clinical champions, integrating EHR training into health profession education programs going on right now. But what I want to leave you with in that respect is perhaps the best thing to meet the needs of the rural healthcare is to train from within. All of those challenges that were there, all of those solutions, they're not going to do any good if you can't get the employee to come to you. So the answer then seems to be let the education come to you 
and let us help you fix it. And that's what I want to be able to share with you how we're going to accomplish that. All right, <clears throat> this outlines for you what is included in full in the high-tech workforce training curriculum. I'm going to give you just a moment. As you go through, there are 20 components. Each of these components was fully authored by those five colleges mentioned before. They are broken down into various types of teaching methodologies so that any student, regardless of their learning style preference, will have a, an educational opportunity. They can be MP3 files. They can be just PowerPoint. They can be PowerPoint with voiceover. They can be a transcript if you prefer. We've got all things for all people, and on top of that, it's 508 compliant. So, I mean, it's ready to roll. So you can see that the, when you look at all of those 20 components, what this is is a splendid way to take an IT person and give them medical training, take a medical person and give them IT training. A student does not take all 20 of these components. A student only takes those components for which they do not already have the body of knowledge. And there are self-assessment tests to help them determine that if they are unsure about their body of knowledge. Typically, if a student was to take a whole role, one of those six roles previously mentioned, they'd probably take between five and nine components. Gosh, that's not even half. If, however, we don't want students who are taking the whole role, they could take one component. Wait a minute, take a look then at um, number three, terminology in healthcare and public health settings, otherwise known more commonly as medical terminology. Here is a component for medical terminology that every rural health provider in this country can use to bring their employees up to speed with medical terminology. And I'm going to tell you that it's free. So let's get to where that is. All right, I've mentioned to you that we've got six force roles, six workforce roles broken down into components. Components broken down into basically units and topics. You do not have to take the entire component unless you're interested in a workforce role. So what I have done for you here, uh, I'll see if that's gonna link, I sure hope it is. <coughs> yeah, not yet, it did earlier. It may be down, look on your um, tray at the bottom. All right, well anyway, that's, that's not gonna work. We're do, we without success there. But what we're doing is we are taking each of the units and we are dividing them so that you know exactly what areas are covered. So that as rural health providers, you can take those and say, I want my people to know this, 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 and this. Modular education. You can decide what they need. If you want an entire workforce role, that's great. If you want a component, that's great. If you want a module, that's great. I don't, you know, I don't know how we can break it down any, any easier for you. All right, so some of the options, as I've said, for rural health. I want you to think about it. Those 20 components that you saw up there, we can give it to you any way you want it. We want to maximize whatever the employer feels the needs are. You may need to do a needs assessment in your own er area to see what they are. We can deliver this either asynchronous, we can do it on Moodle or Blackboard or you know whatever the learning management system is for that local school. And so that's available 24 seven. The student can log in whenever they want to and they can complete it in that manner. We can also do it with a synchronous technique, whereas we're doing webinars and we could have your students doing lunch and learns every Tuesday. They're gonna have, come on, and we're gonna have a lunch and learn to get through that information. That can be done. And also we can do face-to-face -face if need be. Face-to-face, -face. we've covered all the bases. The students will get certificates for completion. The tuition now is going to be priced um, by what is needed. 
I mean, we are going to have to know what you need first. It's priced by content. And we are trying to work out so that some of the stipends that are available for students in the full six workforce roles might be able to be used for uh, rural health. That's, that's still on the burner, but we are working toward that. And on top of that, share this with providers. We have uh, health care practitioners out there who are all needing continuing education. And it's becoming a very major expense, plus your travel time. We've got an ability to deliver continuing education to a desktop, basically for free. For instance, the American Health Information Management Association will award four continuing education credits for every component finished. And not only that, but if you'll take and pass the exam, you're going to get five more. So what I want to leave you with in that respect is we've done everything we can. The ONC has worked diligently to try to make this meet every one of the needs that you possibly can come up with. And this is your time to voice uh, as we talk about this if we've not met a need so we can fix it. All right, if you don't like any of those ideas, if you don't like the 19 colleges that we're using, we've got a next step. Any community college in this country, any school, any body, any, anybody can download this curriculum for free. The curriculum has been developed with the federal funding. It is therefore free to be used. Now, I've provided you two links, and I really do hope they're going to work. Would you try for me? The first one is probably down on your tray at the bottom, and that will take you to the National Training and Dissemination Center. It's not going to work. But anyway, the National Training and Dissemination Center is the um, Oregon Health and Sciences University who received the funding to literally be able to disseminate this information nationwide. You will find also, there we go, thank you very much. Very simple, very complete, lower left-hand side, you create a new account. Once you create a new account, it's going to list for you the 20 components. There are instructor manuals. There is every single thing that you possibly could use to teach this. Do you want to teach it internally? Fine. Go get the curriculum. It's good. It's great. Not a problem. You want to have an instructor? Fine. We can help you find one. But anyway, all of the curriculum is there free for the taking. Now, you do have to download it on this site. Would you flip over to the next site, please? Because not only do you have the ability, the, the VCN site, I'm sorry, it's on the same slide. You can minimize that. The one that's directly viewed, link, Department of Labor. If you click on that one, that one has been working. The virtual career network of the Department of Labor has every one of those components already loaded for you. If you would uh, come down to uh, the courses of study and click on uh, any one of those on the lower left-hand side. And click on guest access in the middle. And there you go. It's already there. And all of your voiceover, PowerPoint, everything is right there. So if you want to download it and do it yourself, there's one way. If you want to take it as it's already done, there's a Department of Labor. There's another way. All of that is free. Thank you. If you'll take me back. Now, what can the currently participating community colleges do? We can help you. We can give you some guidance. We can serve as partners for implementation. If you're having a little trouble or you maybe need someone that you want to do it locally because you don't feel like you've got the bandwidth or something in your area and you, your people need face-to-face, -face, fine, let us work with you. We'll be glad to partner. We'll be part share the courses. We can share instructors. Uh, you know, we'll do whatever is, is necessary to make it work. If you do elect to do your own thing or to help your local community college develop a program, where can they get faculty from? Well. First thing, of course, is using those that are currently teaching it. They've already got two to three years of experience in it. And, you know, in this day and time with distance learning, you can, you can teach from anywhere in the world. Here, your health information managers. Go to your local hospitals. Call the health informatics department or the health information department and ask to speak to the director. That person is probably going to be qualified as well as their supervisory staff. If that doesn't work, 
find IT professionals in the area that have a healthcare background, preferably. Now they can cross that gap, gap but it's, this is the easiest thing to do. And if that doesn't work, or in addition to, find healthcare professionals who have a background in IT. So lots of opportunities there to get individuals who have the knowledge. The, the major criteria there, of course, is it's much easier for a faculty member if they are coming to this with both a medical and an IT background. All right, step by step, how to use this curriculum, how to use your community colleges, what do you need to do leaving here? First of all, what do you want them to learn? What are the topics that your students, that your employees need to know? Now, can we provide you a checklist? Sure can, we're working on it right now. It's gonna be lengthy because I want you to realize there's a lot of material in this curriculum from which to choose. But we're happy to send it to you. We're trying to develop it now. Just don't be alarmed when it looks like a book. <laughs> and instead, I want you to think, oh God, this is amazing, you know. And you're telling me I can have any of this? That's right. Determine if you want pieces and parts, or if you want components, or if you want workforce roles. Now you've got more than six months left till the end of this. Where else can somebody get a workforce role completed in six months, take a national competency exam and do it on federal funding? So now, we need action now. All right, De determine your preferred methods of delivery. Is it going to be the internet? Is it going to be tr what we truly call distance learning? Is it gonna be lunch and learn with webinars, things of that nature, when you've only got one computer in the whole office that is internet capable, and we're all gonna have to sit around and watch it on that, that's fine, <coughs> we can work that out. Or is it truly face-to-face? -face? Now, if it's face-to-face, -face, of course, we're gonna need a group of, of students to be able to justify it. I mean, you know, five students is probably not enough, 25 is wonderful. And keep in mind that the federal funding does expire April 1st, 2013, if you wanna do this on the federal funding. Every school is maintaining a sustainability model, so we're not going away. Again, I wanna leave you with uh, an uh, uh, email address for myself. Uh, we'll send this to you electronically as well. I did want to, just for a minute, talk about some of the opportunities for improvement that we have. I want to fully recognize that uh, I, I'm from the South, okay? I know what's going on. Dyersburg is just like being at home to me. I, I live in the same sort of community. And we know that eight of 13 Southeastern states in Region D are listed, and of course you're gonna see Mississippi and Tennessee, and you can see the medically underserved areas, and you can see the medically underserved populations. You know what we are dealing with. That's the rest of our population. I want to know, make sure that I've mentioned to you that we know that broadband capability is very difficult in this area. And I want you to know that because we've done some research on it. This is a study that was done by the federal government in regard to broadband availability in uh, rural areas. Now, I hope that these statistics are, have been improved, but if you'll take a look at the yellow, you can see the rural population, and of course it's broken down, and you can see the Tennessee, uh, as well, and you can see the percentage over there of that state that is rural, and if my eyes are not playing tricks on me, it's about, uh, I can't read it. Thank you, thank you. The, this one is more telling. Take a look at the percent rural in the middle. On the left-hand side, you'll see the proportion of non-rural population without access to broadband. And on the right-hand side, you'll see the proportion of rural population uh, without access to broadband. The alarming thing there to me is to compare the two. Take a look at Tennessee and you're looking at 0 .3, 1.0, 2 .4. We switch over to our rural areas. Now we're talking about 14%, 19%, 34%. So we understand that there is a problem with distance delivery. I hope you understand that with only 19 colleges across 13 states, we didn't have many options but to go distance. That was the best way to reach the greatest number of people. But now we wanna regroup and make sure we are. I wanna share with you just a little bit about some of the statistics of this area. The graph is good, but the data at the bottom is better. You'll see the region A, B, C, D, and E. Each one is a separate uh, entity across the country. You'll see that region D, of which I represent, has over seven, almost 7,500 students that we have in the program. Um, we have uh, about 2,400 that have completed. We have quite a few in the hopper. What we are finding is that six months is not long enough for those individuals who are currently working. 
it's been really hard on them. But if we can keep pushing them and pushing them to complete, they are completing. In fact, as of this month, we're noticing our statistics for completers are dramatically going up because they realize that it's time to move. You know, they've dawdled long enough. So getting the completers to complete has been the issue. Um, just a little bit about how where we are, you'll see that Region D is the purple, about 18.5% of all of those that have completed have come from our region. Um, I'll move quickly to get through some of this. You're welcome to it. You can see these are our months. These are enrollments by months. It's interesting, I think, to see we go up and down, up and down. You can see where Christmas makes a difference in there, um, always makes a difference in an academic institution. Take a look on the far right, and you'll see once again we're going upward. So we've been all over the board with it for a variety of reasons. This one is interesting because it shows the completers. And you can see, again, that we have some uh, consistently, we've had some uh, l numbers that have been completed on the upward trend. We're down a little bit now, but we're going back up as, as of this month. So this is very cyclical. Attrition rates, I do need to share with you that typically an attrition rate from a community college program is between 30 and 40 percent. The attrition rate for this for Region D is about 17 or 18 percent. That says something like there. It's a good program. People are not leaving. Uh, enrollment versus attrition, I'm happy to share all this with you. I did take a moment to show you the schools in yellow are Walter State, Dyersburg, and Chattanooga. You'll find that the green line is going to indicate the total completers, the red line the attrition, and the blue line the total that have become enrolled. So you can see comparing each school there and take a look at Dyersburg. They've done very well with total numbers and they're doing very well with completers. We're very proud of what's going on. It's not to say that Walter State is not doing that in Chattanooga, but each one has different methodologies. Also, I need to share with you that each school teaches on different calendars. Mm -hmm. Some schools can teach it every three weeks. They'll start a new program. Mm -hmm. Others maybe every six months. It's whatever your needs are. And so we encourage you to have your students look at, you want to look at all 80 plus community colleges? You go right ahead. You know, we'd like for you to be in Region D, but we understand that that may not work for you. So we have students all over the country that are going back and forth taking it from different geographical areas. Uh, this one is just the member college, have they completed versus the whole region. The yellow, of course, is uh, Tennessee, so you can see where they are, uh, about middle of the road. Uh, enrollment by zip codes, as I mentioned, we've got students crisscrossing all over the country. We've got students, this particular one is by zip code in our area. You can see that we've, most of our students come from Texas and Florida, followed by North Carolina and Georgia, but uh, Tennessee is marked as is Mississippi, and Tennessee's got a lot of students as well, and the numbers are actually at the bottom. This one I find very interesting because it tells us where our other students are coming from. And you can see anywhere from the Virgin Islands, Utah, whatever, they're just coming from all over. A little bit student ethnicity, we have a high number of unreported, but you can see that we're pretty equal on the ethnicity. Uh, popularity of workforce roles, you're going to find that redesign specialist is the most uh, common. Student population groups, this one's very important. Take a look at that center one. The average age of the completers of this curriculum is about 44, 45. These are seasoned people. These are not entry level. A lot of people think about community college and they think about entry level. Mm -mm. We're workforce training. We are out there retraining constantly and this is more of a retraining than it is an initial training. These people come with five to 20 years of experience already under their belt, either in healthcare or IT. They are ready to hit the road running. They, however, are getting a little resistance, as you heard from our speakers earlier today, for a variety of reasons, but these are seasoned individuals. About 60% already have an associate degree or higher. Um, prior experience, there you go. What have they got the experience in? Um, it's outlined. You've got uh, your post-training completion employment status. They're not. We thought it was going to be for the displaced worker and the unemployed, and to some extent it is, but primarily what we're finding is people are retraining themselves because they know where we're headed and they want to be prepared for it. Mm -hmm. So let us help you retrain. Let us do it. Um, and finally, just some last-minute stats. Uh, new enrollment for June of 2012, we had a over 300 students. We've lost 49. You see the completers, and these are our total enrollees. But um, you know, we are here to serve. 
We are here to give you what you need. As I said, we can uh, prepare for you a listing of the topics to be covered. And if you want to go through and say, I want this, 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 and this for my employees, we can regroup in a modular fashion and would be more than pleased to do so. We'd like to ask you to hold questions until the uh, next presentation. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Patricia and Margaret for um, they can give you a, an in-depth perspective of how they're meeting rural health needs in their area. Thanks, Kay. I am Patricia Dombrowski. I am Kay's peer uh, in the 10 northwestern states. So we have uh, the most rural territory of any of the five regions that the, o the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT has composed. Of course, we cheat because we have Alaska, right? So we, we trump all. <laughs> yeah. I was uh, surprised when, when we came to Dyersburg and with my, my colleague, Margaret Murphy, Associate Director for Region A, and I have arrived here yesterday. We drove up from Memphis. It was really an interesting experience. Uh, we were just absolutely enthralled by the beauty of the countryside and that symphony of what are they? Are they crickets? <laughs> are they? Is, is, is it crickets? It was fantastic. We couldn't get enough of it. And uh, then when we came to, we, we wanted to uh, meet with uh, Steve and uh, Renee from Dyersburg. Thank you very much for taking time with us yesterday because we want to talk a little bit about the, the, uh, the new things that we're developing and make sure that they fit right in, in rural areas that are not our own. And when we saw the Dyersburg campus, it was like, what are we doing in the Pacific Northwest? I don't know if you, have, has anyone ever been there Pacific, in, in the Seattle region, for instance? Yes. So I don't know if you took time out from your uh, jolly holiday to, to actually tour community colleges, but if you did, you would know that unlike the country club setting here, in, in Washington State, our community colleges look uniformly like minimum security federal prisons. <laughs> so, I mean, we're sold. We're actually looking for educational, <laughs> instructional opportunities, just, just so you know. Yeah. So we've accomplished uh, much of the same work that uh, Kay has so uh, ably just described. And we're thinking about something that she alluded to uh, uh, briefly, which is, what happens next? Because uh, Kay, you showed us that the Office of the National Security, uh, <laughs> the Office of the National uh, <laughs> Coordinator. Coordinator for Health Information Technology. I, I only say it a million times a day. Uh, the plan is for uh, the first phase of that activity to be wound up by, as you said, April first, twenty thirteen. So we have uh, been uh, supported by the ONC to think about a little, uh, a little bit farther on. What else can happen, particularly for rural and underserved communities in terms of getting things on board? So Margaret had a great question. She, she, she said, who's in this room? And I, I wonder if, you could, if we could just take a little moment and just, if you could show us. Educators? Yes. State and regional workforce? People that wanted a free lunch? <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you. That gives us uh, that gives us a good idea. So, uh, as incredibly beautiful, uh, and and we are in a swoon over Tennessee. Believe me, as we find Tennessee, we also realize that there is a lot of different definitions of what is rural. In our part of the country, this is rural. You know, when when I when I came down this morning, we stayed at the hotel. When I stayed when I came down for a little breakfast, you know how they have it in the lobby now. Um, woman said to me, um, there's no grits this morning. Are you going to be all right? Oh. <laughs> I said, I, I think so. <laughs> she said, where are you from? I said, Seattle. She said, you're going to be all right. <laughs> but I think she had some explaining to do otherwise. So w what, what we know is uh, rural can look very, very different. A very, lot of, of course, many, many faces of, of what is rural in the United States of America. Our kind of uh, rural concerns that we have right now uh, in terms of workforce, people uh, certainly are, are uh, dropping out of the logging, fishing kinds of uh, opportunities. 
Uh, we're seeing some up uptick, though, in, in IT, for instance. Uh, we have a lot of server farms that are moving into the rural areas of the Pacific Northwest, so Amazon, Google, Microsoft is, you know, they try to find nice little towns that, um, in case of nuclear disaster, are probably the last to go, and uh, putting these huge server farms uh, out there. So that's been a boon to some of our rural areas, but by and large, uh, things aren't looking that great. And so our rural has a lot in common with uh, Tennessee and other rural areas across the country, and, and that is that we have people that need to retrain, and we have people already on the job that need to skill up. It's, as Kay alluded to, that second group that in this first wave of the New Deal in health IT that is really right in front of us right now. That is, people on the job already that need to skill up. So it kind of boils down to this, this one really simple question, you know, and we, we can talk a lot about what workforce development is, but then when you go into a uh, single provider's office in a rural area, a critical access hospital, if you go in, into a clinic, it, the deal is, who's going to do it? You know, who's going to, I had, now, we're all really smart people out there, and we get it, and we, when we get that we want the incentives, but who's going to do it? And, and you look around, you go into these offices, and there's like four people, a physician, uh, her husband, who's who's at the front desk. Okay, that was just a switch on the usual <laughs> thing. <laughs> yes, uh, and you know, a couple, uh, a part time, part time, someone, and and then, then they usually say, well, you know, and my brother in law is really good with computers. <laughs> and he's gonna he's gonna light our way to meaningful <laughs> use, right? So once they're once they're over that, then the question really does become. Who is going to do health IT? And this is what we're, we are dealing with as educators and certainly uh, as you all as, uh, as workforce development professionals as well. Well, the answer is, of course, as Kay just said, uh, mostly it's those people that are scratching their heads and saying, yes, we understand uh, and we want to move forward and it's the best thing for patient care and safety and we want the incentive money. So how can we learn what we want to learn? Uh, Kay's just given a really good really in-depth picture of, of what is out there that, that is uh, easy to gain purchase on right now. And Kay, wouldn't you agree that, that, that the system that the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT has put into place, which is pretty far-reaching and pretty, pretty ambitious and, and very successful, that, that has given us uh, the ability to, to latch on and latch on quickly? Absolutely. Yes, Absolutely. yes. And we had to mature into that. I mean, it didn't, I, uh, not, not Pollyanna, I do, didn't happen in a minute, but, but I think we're really at that point now. You've done a wonderful job of explaining that. So how, if, if, if the brother-in-law, if the doctor's brother-in-law is not going to be the savior here, then, then who is? And it's probably somebody that's, gonna, that's already sitting at a front desk, and how can they skill up? Well, certainly right now, uh, anything that, uh, that Kay has given us insight to can be leveraged, but there's other projects on the bat on the burner as well. So uh, thanks to, to Matt and to the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, they've looked at us, Margaret and I are from Bellevue College, right outside of, Bell of Seattle, Washington, uh, and they've supported us in developing a couple of new, new tools that we'd like to describe to you today that are going to be available in the fall. In addition to uh, the ongoing programs that Kay has, has, has described, because one size doesn't fit all. And what we need is a battery of tools that educators can decide what looks right for your students and how well we can implement in the short term. So of course, the answer to any question about how critical skills can be acquired, whether it's health IT or anything else, is oh, community colleges, right? right? <laughs> community colleges do it all. Uh, by the way, are you all familiar with the, Owens, with the uh, uh, community college handshake? Do you do that in Tennessee? Oh, we have one. We, yeah, I'll put it in the back. <laughs> <laughs> the community college handshake, at least in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, we are developing in, in our region two new resources. They'll be available in the fall freely available naturally to all community colleges 
in the nation and to all healthcare organizations. So a lot of healthcare organizations have their own trainers. Great. One is uh, rural and community clinic curriculum. So uh, that, that is something that Margaret is going to lead us through and, and really give you an insight into. And the other is, I, I read the transcript of a, uh, of a webinar a couple of months ago. And it was, uh, there was a lot of back and forth with uh, workforce, health IT workforce people and educators and the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT and other agencies. And the net of that transcript was, uh, was well, how do we get started? Because there were about, oh, depends on how you count, about 100 uh, funded colleges that the ONC seeded throughout the, throughout the uh, country. And, there, and we're on board, right? But there's a, about 13 or 1,200 col community colleges in the nation many of them in rural areas, and many of them have providers beginning to knock on the door and say, I'm, I'm there now, and now I get it, and what, do you, what can you do for me? So we want to produce these products that will be very readily available, easy on the uptake, yeah. and, and uh, we will also be training trainers virtually through webinars on them. The first of those is a curriculum for uh, rural and community clinics that uh, has been sort of test driven uh, in the Pacific Northwest. And Margaret, would you like to tell us about that? Mm -hmm. So we're hoping that you can help us get the word out to people about the availability of this program. Um, and I'd like to share with you a little bit of background on how the program was developed. We first, first stop was the mothership, the ONC curricula. Uh, as Kay explained, it's a very rich resource of about a thousand hours worth of health IT training. Um, fortunately, the ONC had the foresight to develop the materials in such a way that individuals can go in and pull just the pieces they need this has been a godsend to us because we've done a lot of customization of shorter programs to meet local industry need. And this is what we did on this program as well. Our next stop was knocking on the door of our local regional extension center and saying, okay, here is the thousand hours worth of material that the ONC has available to us. What categories do you recommend we focus on for the community and rural health clinics based on your experience helping them toward meaningful use. So we got expert guidance from them. Then we brought in a subject matter expert who further winnowed down the material. <coughs> because in talking to um, people at the clinics, we said realistically, how much time can you devote? They landed on about 40 hours, sounded about right, about four to five hours a week. More than that, they were just too busy to keep up. So we combined this information with our experience and training and came up with this basic program. Front and center is meaningful use, helping equip clinics with the skills and knowledge that'll put them on the path toward meaningful use. We started with clinical decision support as one of the earlier panelists mentioned, kind of the why, the why of health IT. Covered workflow analysis and redesign, project management and leadership, and quality improvement. And the program that you can expect to see in, in the fall will be, will be ready to, we're currently in the process of adding some additional features and packaging it for dissemination and it'll be ready to roll out in October. Uh, we based it on our pilot, which, you know, frankly, when we set about this program for community and migrant health clinics, we didn't know what to expect. We thought, wow, this, there's a great need, but these are individuals who are already stretched very thin in highly resource-constrained environments. Are they going to show up for class? We weren't quite sure. We had higher, in the end, we had higher completion rates than in any other single program that we offered. We were stunned. Um, 
something else that surprised us, how, how we ran the program is we offered it to states, uh, to clinics all across the state. And some, a comment that we saw over and over again is how much they valued the opportunity to exchange comments with their counterparts in other clinics and share best practices. Uh, because there, there weren't that many vehicles to do that. And we, we did that through online discussion boards. Uh, the target audience was mixed. We, we designed the program with, in, in mind with er anybody who works in a clinic, a medical assistant, IT person, nurse, CEO of the clinic. And that's who showed up in our pilot. It worked beautifully because there were many different perspectives at play in the online discussion boards. Uh, we also designed it ideally with an instructor in mind. And the instructor can add a lot. They add a personal touch to an online class. And if you get the right person, it, um, they can kind of pull all the pieces together and connect the dots between the uh, information that is in the ONC lectures. So I just want to share with you a brief example of what form this might take. Um, this week's this week's content, week four, is uh, from my perspective. Uh, this is a key uh, week of the, our entire time together, um, and, and thus that's why I've said this is. I'm saying this is the key takeaway. The key takeaway of this course is that we design your work. Okay, what you're trying to do is meaningless. Meaningless. Don't even bother if, if, if it's not going to be adopted, okay? Um, and so that means it's an entire organization process for its development because the entire organization really has to be involved in getting it done. Uh, the, the best slides that, re that reflect this are actually in Component 10, Unit 9, uh, where it speaks to organizations as living biological systems. Okay, if you think about that, they are. I mean, what are our organizations? Yes, we've got some facility, we've got some computer systems and some software, but mostly what we have is people, okay? And people's, people are living, changing, biological, uh, well, yeah, you know, people. Um, uh, and when you try to change what's going on in people's lives, okay, they push back. So when you try to change the system in your organization, it will compensate. It will do things that try to get it back onto the course that it was on. Change happens through individual choice and selection. It does not happen through top-down control or coercion. Okay, so you've got to get folk to want to come to what you're trying to do, and the way to achieve that is through involving them in, in, in the whys, in the hows, and in the decision making. If, if you doubt any of this, then uh, my suggestion, get yourself uh, a toddler, a teenager, a spouse, or a parent, and then try to force some change in them, okay? Not gonna happen. in that next room or you know we've had some kitchen scenes too look at that coffee maker we've got and we're you know trying to look at family pictures it's a lot more compelling than a powerpoint deck with a voiceover there's a real person with oh, a real person with with passion and 
What our instructor did, he, sa he would start with, so here's what we looked at last week. Here's this week. The key takeaway from this whole week is this, and he would bring in war stories also because he is in the process of managing health IT implementations. Um, so it's a really nice adjunct, and we'll, we'll include clips of this particular instructor in the materials that we disseminate, but if, uh, if organizations are able to come up with their own trainer, that's even better. So just very briefly, uh, how we divided the materials, we divided it into eight weekly modules that required four to five hours of work a week. We started with the why, why health IT and the power of health IT to provide evidence-based medicine at the point of care. Continuing on with that, clinical decision support systems and their value, and clarifying meaningful use. Meaningful use can be a little challenging to navigate, so making sure that the participants from all the clinics had a clear view of what was needed to achieve stage one, and we, we took a, a glimpse into stage two as well. Uh, any, any healthcare system that takes on a new EMR system necessarily has to go through the process of analyzing their current workflows and going through process redesign. So that, that's a key feature. We also introduce fairly early in the course projects. We ask people at the clinics to, I to identify one step that they can take to help move their organization toward closer to meaningful use. Uh, so they did that and they worked on this throughout the, the eight weeks and then at the end they received feedback from the instructor. We devote two weeks to quality improvement because really quality improvement is at the heart of meaningful use and really what health IT is all about. We also included uh, some tips on leadership and project management to just to help people galvanize their teams and achieve health IT goals in an effective, efficient manner. And then we ended with a, a synthesis of all the different concepts that culminated in their individual projects. And on the, in our course site, actually I have one um, down below. Yes, there we go. Oh, this one. Thanks a lot. If you could scroll down to week three, or week one, actually, week one. Perfect. Okay. So just, just a quick comment. Th this is a snippet from our course site, from our pilot. Um, we typically, we kept it pretty simple, straightforward, easy up for the participants. We had a, a faculty reflection that you saw a glimpse of, the ONC lectures, some additional materials where we thought they would be valuable. And then each week we had an online discussion and we had uh, quizzes. People kind of like quizzes in general, you know, no matter what age, it's, it sort of gives them a barometer, a reading on, am I getting the material? And uh, I think no matter what age we are, we, we like some sort of reinforcement that we're learning something. Um, yeah, and the online discussion boards were very lively. It was heartening to see the discussions back and forth uh, among people from different clinics. And we had CEO clinic managers, we had medical assistants, nurses, physicians. Very interesting discussions. And I, I just wanted to add that we'll be doing train the trainer sessions because We've all been there before where someone says, oh, we have this stuff available. 
how do I access it? How do I even find it on this site? So we're going to do webinars to help people get launched to explain what's in the package, and we're going to try our best to package it in as user-friendly a manner as possible. Uh, but we'll walk people through, talk about, take a little deeper dive of the elements in each of the modules, a realistic look at the staff and technology that'll be required, and just some, some tales from the trenches, tips from the trenches, followed by a Q&A session. So we found that this program really met a need in our region, and we're guessing that it can do the same in other rural areas as well. And I'm gonna hand it back to Patricia to tell you about a toolkit. I was uh, impressed. That, that it, our, the uh, instructor that you just saw was Russell Sabora, a, a very accomplished man. He was CIO of um, the community in rural clinics, community migrant clinics in our part of the country. And uh, we're, we're also, he's doing some video inserts for us for another endeavor that we're working on as well. Margaret and I were just talking about it on the way up and I had to laugh when I saw him on, on this one because he looked pretty professorial, wouldn't you say? He looked pretty good, yeah. We have a little problem with the ones that he turned in recently. Uh, he, he, he was wearing what can only be described as a Harley Davidson t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so what Margaret and I are talking about, well, maybe we could put, put a, like a title slide, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, and, and actually, uh, part of that uh, that Russell is doing might, uh, might, uh, might uh, show up in the second uh, resource that we want to describe for you. And I understand that we are very close to lunch and you're doing really well. Thank you. Uh, uh, just, just a minute more. So when I listened, I mentioned that uh, transcript that I read of, of, of a webinar and it was a lot of educators speaking up and saying, well, we know other colleges that were funded uh, and they've de helped, they've developed programs that didn't exist before, but now, now there's us. And we, didn't, we weren't, weren't prepared, we really didn't think that we were ready to take something on like that, but now we've got uh, a high rate of unemployment, we need to retrain and skill up people, and we've, keep, we've got these providers, healthcare providers knocking on our doors, what are we gonna do? So I, I, sp I spoke with uh, Matt's colleague, Chitra Mola, at the Office of the National Coordinator for, for Health IT, and I said, something that uh, Bellevue College has been, has been doing for a very long time, about 10, now 11 years, is the IT of healthcare. So health IT training in a community college setting. And because of that, and because uh, some, some people across the country have heard of it and we've worked on some national projects, I get some calls pretty frequently from colleges uh, all over the country uh, that say, we wanna start up, but we just have some big questions and there's not really a lot of uh, templates out there to get going. How do we get going? And P.S., we don't have any money. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about you all. In the state of Washington, uh, over, over the last three or four years, our funding has been reduced by about 40%. I mean, think of it. 40% of what goes first when that happens? What was it? Yeah, right, and innovation. So, you know, you really, you really hunker down, don't you? And innovation, new programs are kind of the last thing on the list, which is weird because uh, as uh, uh, the president of this college mentioned, that's when students, of course, are pounding at your door. That's when, that's when innovation is needed. So, how can we help in that effort for colleges, particularly under-resourced colleges and certainly rural colleges across the United States, how can, how can we help? Sort of not an instant startup kit, but an easy up kit. Uh, so that's exactly what we're working on now. It will, again, will be freely available through support from the ONC in late fall. It, and I said to Margaret, what shall I tell them? In, in October, November, and she said, late fall. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, you can't go wrong. So late fall. So I think that's anything before Christmas, right? Uh, it will, it will inc include a variety of curricula uh, for a variety of purposes. Courseware, including, um, including I get in trouble when, when I say these things, uh, including qu quizzes, uh, some kinds of uh, video inserts that you've seen. What else, Margaret? 
discussion board questions, <laughs> yes. And, uh, and we will also do train the trainer training, which I'm trying to uh, shorten down to trainer training now. We'll also do trainer training, which will be virtual, and uh, your faculty and program uh, administrators are very welcome to join that. And for the first few months, we definitely like to provide uh, implementation assistance, meaning we'll, we'll tell people, pick up the phone and call us, and we'll, give, you, we'll be glad to noodle around with you. M what I have seen is uh, these programs will fail unless uh, we are actually holding hands with our industry partners and getting into the drink with them. So one thing that uh, I've seen that's worked really, really well to do that, because when we're talking about faculty developing programs and people with absolutely no time, how do you do it? We'll be providing some, uh, some really, temp some templates and best practices about that. The best thing that I can say that I've seen so far is uh, the, the idea of industry, health IT industry education councils. So in the state of Washington, for instance, uh, we started one about a year ago and it was so successful and we never thought we would be able to drive our industry partners to the table like more than once a year. So I said, well, we'll just meet once a year and then virtually maybe a second time, you know, because we don't want to ask too much, right? And since then, they've, they've demanded that we meet monthly, which is, uh, when's the last time that happened on an advisory board not, uh, for, of ours? It's very unusual. So an industry education council, we have K-12, all commu uh, community college representation, uh, four, all four-year programs that, that verge on health IT and graduate programs on one side of the table. On the other side of the table are high level, is high-level representation from all the professional associations, AHIMA, KIMS, the Health Information Management and Systems Society, uh, the uh, State Hospital Association, uh, the MGMA, the Physician Practice Associations, for instance. I mean, it's been uh, conven uh, we convened by our state health IT coordinator uh, who works with the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT. So we're all there, and it's great because uh, education's broke, and we, we finally have to break down the barriers about that, that competitive thing, you know, because we don't talk very well, I'm talking about ourselves here, to uh, four-year colleges, but now we're learning to do that because we're sitting at the same table. So there's been a lot of efficiency there, and, I, and I'd recommend it, and that will definitely be included uh, in terms of best practices in the uh, very, very uh, catchily named Health, ID, Health IT Academic Startup Kit. We thought by the time we came here today, we'd have a better name. <laughs> if you have any suggestions, please let us know. And by the way, the, um, the program for uh, community and rural clinics that Margaret just described, uh, which also has a very catchy name, free, free what is it? Uh, freely funded, no. Free federally, <laughs> here it is, free federally funded, we went with descriptive, right? Free federally funded IT training for rural health clinics. Yes, uh, there's a, Margaret and I put out a little YouTube preview of that, and there'll be one on the, on the startup kit pretty soon as well. So uh, here we are, I know as, as, as in love with the tree frogs and crickets as we are, we are going to be returning to our own version of, uh, of rural uh, in just a day or two, but we'd love to hear from you all. And uh, as Kay mentioned, we'd love to take questions from you uh, for Kay or, or for Margaret and myself. And most of all, we'd really like to hear if you think uh, any of this is gonna work for you in your settings. Okay? Questions for us? We just get punished if not because we have some questions for you. Does this seem workable? Does any of this seem like uh, something that would be that would be usable? Are there usable parts in, in this, or does it just seem like not what we know your region or education needs? We'd like to hear that too. We can make course corrections. Are there gaps? Are there pieces and parts that we haven't thought about that you would recognize just through our in the trenches? Up just a little bit, please. Huh? Just a little talk up just a little bit, oh, please. Oh, sure. Yeah, usually I don't have that problem. <laughs> <laughs> I need to um, but one of the things that, and I'll stand up, one of the things that you two were talking about, um, people getting experience, that is really hard. And we actually do take some interns, so you know, that's one of the things we do to support your efforts. But have you tried to work with some of the vendor communities or 
To summarize the question, it's what have we done in education in regard to internships for students? And I'm very glad you brought that point up because yes, we work at that avidly, but I also want to say to you, do you need someone in your clinic? Pick up the phone and let us know. We'll be more than happy to send you an intern for whatever number of hours we can allocate and they can allocate to you. We are not asking for paid internships. We are more than happy to provide to you students who can help you bridge this gap so you can see what this body of knowledge can do so they can help you get started. Um, it just takes an inquiry. And of course, this is part of the reason for this uh, uh, session today is to help bridge those gaps, give us some uh, level of understanding between us so that we can send you interns. They're getting experience, you're getting the benefit of their experience, and it's not costing you anything. Once again, we like to think of that as a win-win. The RECs, particularly those in North Carolina, because I, I know that because I'm there, have been extraordinarily helpful in that respect as well, and we'd like to encourage that with the other RECs as well to utilize our individuals and put them out in the offices, or as you said, Walgreens or CVS or Blue Cross Blue Shield or any place where there's health information that's on a computerized basis. Is that Others? Other questions, concerns? We just had a quick question for you, and, and that is, um, what what are you hearing, and we'd love to have you trapped in a room here, but what are you hearing from uh, rural health care providers? What is front and center in terms of uh, concern for them? What do, you, what do you hear? I work for an FQHC, and I, I feel like the curriculum that y'all built around the education And you would make an excellent adjunct instructor, so we want your name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Any, anyone else, uh, what are you hearing? What are you hearing from those, those uh, individual providers that are struggling a little bit? No? Okay, well maybe, maybe we're on the road, yeah. Right, and, and uh, that's what I'm seeing. If somebody asked me that question, I would say, well, the interoperability question, uh, it, it, that a lot of uh, smaller providers are just coming to sort of in con into consciousness about is hand in hand uh, with the health information exchange new direction. And Matt, I understand we're going to uh, think about that in this afternoon, but that will be after a noon repast, correct? We're ready if you are. I, I think we are, so I think uh, I'd like to thank our panel thank you. for this great presentation. <laughs> and we're gonna be reconvening at uh, 1230, but in the meantime, there is some food and refreshment out in this next room if you wanna get it. And my request is that if you haven't signed in, we need everybody to sign in, there's a sign in sheet there, so please do that, but we will be reconnecting at 1230. Um, that we're out there. This afternoon, we're gonna shift gears a little bit to talk about how those resources can align with some of, uh, other federal initiatives. And now I'm gonna hand it over uh, to our friends at the Tennessee Regional Extension Center, who's gonna first lead the charge and talk a little bit about the work they're doing. So, take it away. Hey. I know, now I have to keep you awake, right? Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> you a microphone. Do I need to give everybody a five minute coffee break before we yeah, get started? Yeah, do I, do I need this? Yeah. This is the, the streaming. Oh, yeah, so. <laughs> Usually I don't, so this is sort of awkward. Um, I've been in um, EHR adoptions for a long time. Um, 
I actually had the privilege to work for a very progressive group back in the 80s. I was like nine. And um, <laughs> they're, they're very progressive. And um, anyway, I started working for them and they installed this product called Epic, very large product. So I got to know EHR adoption and so I ended up working for other vendors, kind of went into the, you know, into what you're training for. There wasn't even a curriculum, nobody even knew what it was. There's no such thing as having some sort of community college or university that had some sort of program like that. But I entered it and I go to my first EMR implementation and realize it was called EMR Hell. <laughs> <laughs> and I was the Antichrist. It was pretty bad. We've come so far today hearing the stories we've got educational opportunities we've got all these things going on it's just tremendous so somebody that's a veteran of being in the EMR world this is exciting um, again I'm Jennifer McAnally with the Tennessee Regional Extension Center <coughs> I'm sorry I have to go to my next slide to know who I am and what I'm doing um, we are it's ten, ten wreck or not train wreck <laughs> It sometimes feels like that, but it's to Tennessee Regional Extension Center. We're going to talk a little bit about the payments that have been made up to date, you know, up to date. Uh, what's next? And some of the health information technology barriers, they do still exist. All right. Tennessee Regional Extension Center is also part of QSource. Our paychecks say QSource. Our cards say QSource. Um, we do provide assistance to primary care providers, mostly in rural communities, like what you all work in. We also uh, focus on smaller practices and the rural hospitals, and we also do local workforce training support. The Regional Extension Center, if you see all the little dots like the patchwork quilt, mm -hmm. that's the Regional Extension Centers. There's 62. Matt, I did a screenshot of the dashboard for you D down at the bottom of the slides and we can provide these slides to you electronically if you'd like them I did provide a link to the actual um, to the website but this gives you this is the total enrolled it's uh, 143,000 providers that we're working with just a couple you know around the country we've also uh, enrollment to date we're 34% uh, over and this is from July 31st so this is pretty current information um, and we've worked with a lot of different specialties all over um, the country. Now, this is actually a dashboard. You can see the progress of any of the regional extension centers, okay? So if you wanted to go to this website, you can look at any state and see what's going on with them. Sorry. I feel like I'm in the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> like I just dismounted. Yes. <laughs> um, sorry. It's been watch way too much TV. <laughs> um, I put this in here so you could really look at, this is actually the AHIMA body of knowledge, and I also saw this referenced earlier in the community college um, slide, slides that you were looking at. You know, these are the things that we're all working on. There's a lot of cross-reference points. Um, we do workforce, uh, you know, work out, uh, look at what are the workforce training needs? How can we get people connected to their, you know, community college or university program? You know, interoperability, uh, health information exchange. George is going to talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and I'll, talk, I'll kind of allude to it a little bit. We do implementation support, meaningful use. How many people have heard of meaningful use? How many are sick of the words meaningful use? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. I, um, I sort of, you know, I was talking earlier about, I, um, I've been in this a long time, and um, I knew I had arrived in that, that not, it was really before meaningful use, it was when we were doing a knee prescribing project. And one of the things that happened is, I'd been working with this provider and they had in installed a, a electronic uh, e-prescribing and their power went out. And he went to his nurse and said, I can't e-prescribe, <laughs> what do I do? And she said, Here's the pad. <laughs> Go get your pen. Uh, so, you know, I knew we had arrived at that point when after six months of using e-prescriptions, he didn't know how to write a prescription any longer. <laughs> so that's the kind of work that we try to do. We try to get people from that point of paper that you've seen earlier to 
the real world. Now, the goal of all this is that each person in the U.S. has an electronic health record by 2014. <laughs> it's not that far away. So, but we're doing our part, right? We're all doing our part. Um, why are we doing that? That's been the big question of the day. Why are we doing these types of things? Um, that's what we're spending right now in healthcare, and that's old data. As compared to Germany, France, Cambodia, Norway, Iceland, 10 to 13 percent of their gross domestic product is in healthcare. I, ours is actually over 17 percent now. We we're, we're not good at this, right? To make it even worse. This is our distribution of spending. Young adults with no chronic illness, look at the cost. Very, very minimal. That red is a little bitty cost. But the chronically ill, oh, oh my gosh, that's where we're spending all of that money. It's on chronically ill populations. So we, we've not done a good job of managing health care as, as a country. But what we're also, back to the Olympics, sorry. Um, <laughs> This is another thing. Baby boomers are going to reshape the payer mix. Um, look at 2011. You see commercial is like 35%, and then you see the Medicaid and Medicare being 22%, 37%. But in 2021, wow, Medicaid and Medicare, 52 and 20%. I love it when people in the media go, I don't want the government in my health care. <laughs> I'm like, have you heard of Medicare and Medicaid, CMS? <laughs> Don't get me started. But, uh, yeah, we're going to see a big change. And so clearly that's why CMS has these initiatives out is because, and we're all sort of running on parallel paths as we talked about, because we've got to do something and we've got to do it quickly. But the good news is that the quality of care, when you start to implement an EHR, the quality of care improves. That's really what this is about. It's about improving quality care. This is actually from... Um, the New, e New England Journal of Medicine. Um, most of the patients that are diabetics, they get better care if they receive care under somebody that uses an EMR because they, get, they meet those evidence-based guidelines of care. These are uh, you know, additional statistics about that EMR versus paper records. So they're pretty substantial. Now, the vision is we, got, we want to have a healthcare system that uses information to empower the individual. We're consumers of healthcare, like we talked about earlier. You know, we've all talked about we've left offices, we don't know what we're there, you know, why am I taking this medication? What do you mean I have to lose weight? Um, Y'all don't hear that one? I hear that one every time. <laughs> but uh, it must be just me. Uh, but also to make sure that we are improving the care of Americans. Um, Providers now are getting these payments, right? Medicare, they have to meaningfully use a, uh, an e I'm sorry, a certified EHR technology, and then they have to attest to the programs. Now, Medicaid, the first year, they can adopt, implement, or upgrade. So it's a little bit easier. The bar is a little bit lower for some of the Medicaid providers because oftentimes they're the ones that funding that kind of an EMR adoption is a little harder. So the second year, they have to attest to all the program requirements. Um, for 2014, it's the last year in Medicare for EPs to begin the program, so they need to get busy, right? Uh, 2015 is the last year for eligible hospitals. That's what EH stands for, eligible hospitals to participate. Um, now, Medicaid, the program runs through 2021, so there's a little <coughs> bit more time. Now, keep in mind, um, there's a six-year payout program for, 20, for the Medicaid program, so they really have to start by 2015, which, again, not too long. Um, the meaningful use stages, right now people are testing or the providers are testing to stage one meaningful use. So you're transferring data onto the EHR, you're, um, you know, using electronic copies, giving patients a copy of their medical record, that sort of thing. Now in stage two, all of a sudden we're going to have these patient portals, right? That was kind of alluded to in the first slide. We're going to start seeing use of patient portals. We're also going to start seeing the use of direct technology. It was mentioned earlier as far as exchange goes which is, we call it medical mail. I mean, that's really what it is, you know, it's secure medical mail. And uh, if you say that to providers, they like it, so 
to use that. And then in 2016, we have to use all of these things to actually improve the quality of care. We want to see these outcomes improve. We've already shown early improvements, so we're really excited about what, as all these things really start to come together, I think we're going to be a healthier nation because of it. Now, this is the payments that have been going out. This was up from June of 2012, and again, this is a, an identical, it's a screenshot. I just wanted you to see it, and I also put the, um, the web address down there for you. But you can see that, um, you know, Tennessee, we're up there in the 101 to $150 million payments thus far from both programs. So that's a lot of cheese, a lot of money. So we're doing really well as a state. And you can see some of the others, you know, Mississippi, uh, Alabama, Georgia, all right in there with us. And then you've got Missouri and Illinois that are um, actually at 151 million plus. So they're doing really well as well. Okay. Now, talking a little bit about Tennessee Regional Extension Center, we had to work with 1,343 providers. That we really did the math and figured out how many underserved providers were here and then did a certain percentage of those. So that's how many were here. We actually work with about 1,600 and counting. Now we have, um, currently we're over 100%, like I said, for our milestones. Um, we have 95% of those people working with us at GoLive. They have already implemented an EMR. They can e-prescribe and they can also do some clinical, uh, clinical data reporting. What was in that lemonade? <laughs> I'm just doing that a lot. I'm trying to talk fast. I'm trying to talk southern fast and it doesn't work. Um, but we've also, uh, we have 188 at Meaningful Use, it's actually higher than that, where they do it daily. And uh, also 65% um, of our EPs have been paid for uh, AIU. So we really do work and um, beat them or whatever it takes, <laughs> and sometimes it takes that, uh, to get providers to Meaningful Use. So this is what we do, the spectrum of support that we do for these, um, these different practices. We take them all the way from what do you mean you're on paper? To let's help you pick a product. We're vendor neutral, but we do help them pick. Uh, we'll give them a list of those that we think will meet their needs. And from there, we get them all the way through to meaningful use and evaluation and care improvement. Now, we get them on the EMR, that's great, right? But now they need to talk to the specialist down the street. Or maybe you've traveled somewhere and you've had an incident. You need that information shared somewhere else. How are we going to do that? Well, the next step is the direct project. Has anybody heard about that? Yeah, direct project. We're, gonna, we're, we're about to hire a director of direct project. I wonder how, you know. <laughs> hmm. George, we gotta, we got to come up with a title, a better one. Uh, but basically, like I said, it's medical mail. And so, uh, ONC just a couple of weeks ago said, hey, these EMR vendors and certification, they are going to have to have the direct standards built into these products, okay? And so now when you get an EMR, just like used to, you had to buy a different e-prescribing product so you could e-prescribe. Well, now it's part of the EMR. Well, direct is going to be part of the EMR going forward. So people can simply and securely send messages. It's also scalable and it's standards-based. It's just like sending an email message except this one is much more secure. Now, there's a lot of strong support for, um, for health information technology. This came from the Commonwealth Fund. 93% of patients said, you know what, I'd like to have a medical home. So not only are we driving this from, hey, you know, we don't do a very good job managing health care in this country, to look at the consumer. The consumers are saying, I want to have a medical home. I would like to go to a, to a website and go, is my doctor killing people when they do this procedure? I'd just kind of like to know before I have it done. You know, most people want to go get that kind of information. How much is this going to cost me? How much is this costing my insurance? That information up to now has been elusive. So uh, there's, a, there's strong support, you know, more and more transparency. But we have barriers still, um, vendor issues. So um, there's certification, certainly, but sometimes the way certification is interpreted by different vendors varies, sometimes widely. Um, their capacity, it's like the gold rush, you know. People are adopting these EMRs like crazy. The vendors are overloaded. 
guess what? They don't have, going back to community colleges and university training, they don't have enough staff and not enough experienced staff to hire and to do training well. Then you've got the HIE infrastructure. It's still somewhat underdeveloped. We're still having a problem. How do we get information about this patient to here that needs to be seen over here and how do we get that information over there so we're not repeating tests so we're making good clinical decisions um, meaningful use timelines they're fast they're quick they require a lot of work and also the workforce as I mentioned earlier and then we've got these competing priorities we've got um, ICD-10 ACOs you know accountable care organizations patient-centered medical home, which is really leading to reimbursement reform. We've got that on us. And then we've got 5010 legislation. So there's a lot of things going on in the community, not to mention just trying to take care of your patient all day, every day. So there's a lot of things that we're, we're still going to struggle with. We're still going to have issues. But I, like I said, being a, a veteran of EHR adoptions, it's amazing, amazing how far we've come today. I was just like wiggling my seat. You know, just with excitement, thinking about some of the things I was hearing about. Um, Amanda and I went to um, a master's program, and it took me 20 years to find one. You know, it didn't even exist as a curricula. So uh, I'm really excited about what you're doing and what everybody in this room is doing. It's really incredible. So thank you. Um, what we're going to do next, the um, they're all looking like guilty all of a sudden over here. <laughs> um, what, uh, what we thought you might want to hear from the health information technology specialists that are in the field. It's Amanda and Jamie and Natalie, and they work in West Tennessee, and they work with providers offices. They do a lot of the beating. They carry really big sticks. Um, we were just making jokes about we're all alpha females. <laughs> So um, anyway, but they're going to talk a little bit about some of the stories from the field, you know, from large consortia, the issues they have, the smaller practices, and what was the other one? Hospitals. Hospitals, thank you. Oh, the EHs. <laughs> Absolutely. So they're going to give you some information about some of the work we actually do and <laughs> give you some of those updates. And if you guys, you want to come up here and have a seat or? Are these microphones? Yeah. We're wired for sound. Awesome. All right. <coughs> Which one of you wants to start? I will. Yeah, and you can take that down. But I'm going to sit. So. Yeah, you can sit. <laughs> OK. Maybe you won't hear my teeth chattering. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little chilly. OK, Jamie's going to start us off. You want to uh, give a little bit of background about yourself? And sure, take it away. Uh, my name is Jamie Glenn. I'm an HIT specialist with uh, the Tennessee Regional Extension Center in West Tennessee. Um, and I do have my RHIA, um, and I'm glad to be here today. <laughs> um, so I've been charged with um, kind of telling you about some of my experiences in the smaller practices. Um, I've, I um, have several practices from Shelby County all the way into Lauderdale County that I work with. Um, and what we've been seeing a lot of is when we go into practices to do these meaningful use assessments, we find that most of the tasks are being delegated to one specific person in the practice. Um, and then they're disseminating that information down into the rest of the practice on what, what tasks need to be performed and where they need to be in order to attest meaningful use. Um, many times we find that it's either the office manager or the billing manager um, that takes on these roles. Um, and depending on their kind of educational background, many find it overwhelming that they're this go-to person all of a sudden for meaningful use. Um, so just just that, it can be very overwhelming. Um, but And that's what I've come across in the beginning. And moving forward, I've found that um, many practices are starting to hire um, IT professionals um, just to perform this role. Or they're, instead of delegating it to the office manager, they're hiring a specific individual to work with meaningful use specifically um, to kind of take off some of that additional responsibility. Um, another issue we've come across in 
the workforce is the basics of IT or anything electronic for that matter, such as um, a sending emails with attachments or scanning in documents and creating PDF files. Or, and sometimes that's where we have to begin with our practices mm -hmm. is with those just bare minimum basics to get them started. And then they're like, oh, I never needed to do that. <laughs> so, um, so taking advantage of any type of training like that or offering training um, to staff um, to give them the basics is a good place to start um, and taking advantage of any um, educational opportunities that come your way. I would definitely grab onto those. Um, another thing that I found that works well in practices is to meet with the whole team and not just one person. If you have the opportunity to attend a staff meeting, um, it gives everyone an opportunity, uh, an opportunity to know what they're, what part they're going to play, what role they can play in their practice, um, and how it's going to affect them. So they don't all of a sudden have this person coming and saying, "Okay, I need you to start doing this." Um, they're going to know why, why it's important um, to now incorporate this new or additional task into their daily job duties. Um, but those are. I mean, those are some of the basic things that I've come across in my practices um, for smaller groups. And I'm going to pass it on to Natalie to talk about larger practices. Hi, my name is Natalie Frady, and I'm also an HIT specialist in West Tennessee. Uh, I have practices from Memphis to Jackson, um, but I've, most of my providers are in the Memphis area. And I work with uh, several large practices um, with you know, multiple providers going from like 20 providers all the way to 250 providers. So um, in a larger group, such as the one that has acquired 250 providers within two years, they are having to move at a very fast pace to, um, and most of these are conversions, when they acquire these providers and they're having to convert them to their current EHR that they're using. So this has been definitely um, a challenging task to uh, roll out an EHR. Some of these practices are um, doing a conversion and then some are going straight from paper and then having to implement an EHR. And um, although this is a large, larger group that has internal IT staff to support them, um, they, they're still growing at such a rapid pace that they're they're actually um, not able to do uh, the workflow uh, redesign that we've talked about previously that's a vital piece in order to make um, an implementation successful. So um, because they've had to go at such a fast pace, they're now backtracking a bit and um, we're having to actually go back to those practices and perform a gap analysis to see you know, what is actually causing them um, barriers and things that, because of course my, my role in all of it is to help them achieve meaningful use. Um, of course you have to have an EHR prior to achieving meaningful use and you want your workflow to be as efficient as possible so meaningful use is um, not a huge thorn in your side. It should be um, somewhat easy to achieve if you have a vendor and an EHR in place that um, will help you get there. So um, in a large practice, we uh, definitely have had those challenges of um, trying to back up and see what you know we did right, what we did wrong, and then move forward. So that's where we're at right now. Um, another challenge in a larger group with multiple uh, physicians is standardization. Um, a lot of times, you know, IT staff wants everything across the board to be standardized, but then you have your providers who want things to be um, specialized to what they do. So those have been um, a few challenges and we just have to pull together a group um, and get their involvement from the provider level to ensure that they have a voice and that they feel like they're um, being involved in the decisions that are made. And then working with the larger groups, um, sometimes from my, my point of view, of course I'm telling the providers, the meaningful use story, and then I have to, you know, go back and report back to the um, corporate level and let them know how things are progressing, and um, you know, just try to bridge that gap. So um, 
I, I feel like we're being successful in that, but there are challenges just like there are in the smaller practices. Um, in a larger group, you have usually more resources, but they're just spread out, and so sometimes the communication is a barrier. I'll pass it on to Amanda. Thank you. My name is Amanda King, and I'm an HIT specialist as well for um, West Tennessee. Um, I do have my RHIA, um, and I do have my master's in health informatics, as Jennifer mentioned. Um, I got that from the University of Tennessee at Memphis Health Science Center. Um, the, my cohorts here talked about the small and the large, and I have got challenged with the hospitals. I don't work every day with hospitals. We actually have a hospital HIT specialist, but I do work closely with my with the hospital system that Mike Burt um, alluded to this morning. He discussed, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about the challenges um, in the workforce area. There, it, it really tags on to what he was discussing this morning, and it's kind of more of the same of what Jamie and Natalie have said. Only you know, with the hospital, it's a much bigger scale. <laughs> so, especially even if it, even if you're in a small rural hospital, you're still dealing with you know, 20 to 30 employees that are having to deal with this and they all wear different hats and it's, it's a big collaboration effort, I think, in a hospital. And that's what you deal with. And a lot of times you run into the, the IT professional that's really good with the IT, but again, he doesn't have any clinical background. So you've got to get that clinical background for him. And it's not just patient care clinical, it's also the healthcare delivery system and how everything goes round. And I think that's where um, the HIT and the HIA curri curriculums go hand in hand and they do a really good job of training that professional um, in the all around about the healthcare delivery system. I think that um, KHIM and AHIMA do a really good job of making sure that we get that information out there so that you understand from the point the record started to the time the patient leaves. And by the way, did you know lots happens to that patient's record after the patient's gone from the day, for the day from the hospital or the clinic? There's lots of billing that goes on. There's lots of documentation and there's things like meaningful use in the background that's running around. Um, so, um, you know, I think it also goes into the why. You know, everyone's got to understand the why. And that's not just from administration level. I mean, you know, in a hospital, the, your administrators always know why you're doing something, right? It's for the bottom line. It's the money. It's whatever. And they've got a good why speech. But you've got that person like Mike that's doing the training to those providers, which I used to work at that hospital system. So as Mike was talking this morning, I was shaking my head yes, because I've trained all those providers, too, doing different various things. Um, you know, you've, you've got to know that why speech. You've got to be able to explain to them. You've got to be able to help them adapt to the workflow changes. And it's not just the nursing staff. It's not just the providers. It's your entire facility that's involved. And so workflow has got to be considered. And that's where, um, you know, we always say you've got to be at the table. So it's not just an IT agenda. It's not just a nursing agenda. It's not just a provider agenda. It's a whole facility agenda. So you've got to make your administration understand that. So the workforce concerns there is, you know, everyone's got to have that education level of why, you know, like Jennifer put up on the slide about our health care delivery system and why we, why we were challenged for every American to have an EHR by 2014. And everyone's got to have that comprehension, and it's not just because the federal government said so. <laughs> I get that a lot, just about every day. So, um, I, again, I don't work in the hospital community as much anymore. I do work with that administration staff because I have their um, primary care providers um, on our RET grant. Um, but I do, I do come in contact with a lot of those same issues that Natalie and Jamie uh, mentioned today. Questions? Questions? <laughs> We could probably talk for hours. We always jokingly say we could write a book about the things that we've heard, you know. And um, Jamie mentioned about having, you know, to be able to do things like email attachments and scanning a document and saving it as a PDF. First off, they have to understand what a PDF file is. And then they have to really be able to do this because you know why? For them to be paid by our Medicaid, by TenCare, they have to save their documents and upload them into the portal, and they they don't get that. You have to we have to go through that explanation to them, and they understand. And once they see it live, and you do this, they're like, "Oh, okay," you know. So they learn things, and they feel so smart when we leave. They're like, "Oh, I'm so excited! I finally know what attachment means." <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
I, I trained a, I trained a provider at that hospital okay. with the mouse on the, I told him to now pick up your mouse and I didn't really mean pick up, but he literally picked it up and put it on the monitor and I was going, no, no, that's not what I meant. <laughs> You know, quality improvement is hard at this stage of the game. And I say, I hate to use the word game, but sometimes you have to do that because it's like, okay, Dr. So and so, you got to play the game with me. We got to get you to this point, you know. And so we go through the meaningful use objectives, we let them understand. But at, at this stage of the game with meaningful use, quality improvement to them is just like, well, as long as my report works, I'm just happy, you know. And that, that's kind of where they are. But of course, we, we tell them that end stage, you know, we, we tell them what's to come. And then, of course, because we are partnered, we are a part of QSource, we are a part of that QIO, we immediately introduce those people, hey, and these people can help you, you know, and they come in off that 10 scope of work and help those providers and partner with them because that's part of what they got to do. And we they're I think they're more amazed that they even have the ability to run a report, you know? And what really gets them is when you run the report and it's like zero out of 298. And they're like, wait a minute, I document, I tell them to stop smoking every time. And I'm like, well, see, <laughs> you probably just don't put it in the right place. So let's figure that out, you know? And when they figure out where they're supposed to be documenting that for that report to work correctly for them, they're oodles and boodles excited. So it's, for me, that's the stage that they're in. Well, and then just to add to that, we have some providers who have systems that, you know, they're certified in the six core and yeah. alternate core quality measures, but then they only offer three additional uh -huh. to report on. So if it's an OB facility and those three additional have nothing to do with, you know, anything that they do at their practice, then, you know, that's, they report zeros. Yeah. And, you know, and they ask why. Why do I have to report zeros? And this is, you know, that's what they have at this point. That's all they have. And that's disappointing to them. You know, they're like, oh, well, I didn't even realize. <laughs> but that's coming. You know, with yeah. the next level of certification, I think you're going to see the CHR vendors are absolutely going to be required to expand on what they offer to um, the practices. I mean, they're really caught in the same parallel path we all are. They're trying to ramp up and put in research and development to get their products to where they need to mm -hmm. be. And there's been, you know, as we talked about earlier, you know, even in certain certification language, sometimes there's wide margins for interpretation. And so, you know, we're just kind of running into those types of things now. And, you know, we, we do try to help people navigate through that. But um, like they said, like you know, Mike was talking about, you know, on the very first panel, if you show data and you compare mm -hmm. them to each other, oh, it's on. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to compete with each other. And if you do it even at a regional level and, you know, I know there's, they're coming up the hospitals now. You can do a hospital Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's coming. So you will be able to go and look at those types of things. So those are um, where, where, again, that transparency is going to promote a lot more quality improvement. They see that zero and they're like, wait, 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 wait. What's that? What does that one mean again? Go over that description one more time. Yeah. You know. Thank you. 
Um, well, one skill that we see lacking in the vendor community, which we do cover, you know, when we're out in the practices, is the workflow redesign. A lot of times the um, EHR vendor, you know, the practice believes that they, you know, will give them all the sufficient training and materials they need to have a successful implementation. And, um, but the practices don't know most of the time what all tools and resources that they actually need to successfully implement an EHR because this is their first time doing it. Um, so that's most of the time what's left out on the vendor side. And of course, you know, if a practice is signing up with us and we're going through the vendor selection and we're, you know, working for, with them from day one, then we can help them with that. But then a lot of times we've had practices, you know, reach out to us when they're halfway through implementation or they already have, you know, an EHR in place. And then, you know, of course we hear their, you know, moans and groans over that and we talk about workflow and they look at us like we've never heard of that. So that's one skill that I think um, is, you know, m might not be lacking um, from our standpoint, but on the vendor side, if they don't have that, you know, workflow redesign in place, then um, a lot of times their implementation is not as successful as it could be. Also along those lines too, is it's really hard to, you know, the slide presentation where the professor was talking about change <laughs> and workflow redesign is extremely hard because it's a huge, huge cultural change your workflows <laughs> you know you get that oh we'll do that later mm -hmm. and then like Natalie said then they realize quickly that they're in crisis <clears throat> mode you know because of it so mm -hmm. sometimes just educating people about you really have to do this are there any other questions Quite a bit. I mean, you know, let's face it. They're like, oh my gosh, you're about to come in here and take away my paper, you know. But especially those where I've literally sat my laptop on a stack of medical records to type, you know. Like, oh look, here's a homemade desk. <laughs> There's no shelf space. Um, but I think that, you know, one of the things that we do in the, you know, we talk about workflow redesign first as part of our whole assessment phase when we go in, especially if they sign on there, you know, we walk in and they signed up with us to help pick a vendor, select a vendor and implement. We go through a project plan. We have an in-depth project plan for them to follow and we kind of tell them, you know, expectations. And part of that vendor selection process is we want them to go out and talk to those references that the vendors gave them and also not just um, references for the vendors that they're that they are interested in but also just providers in their community and not just the providers but their office staff like the office managers or the administrator whoever was the project manager person to talk to them and to kind of get an understanding of what you know what lessons they learned and whatever and we bring that to them too you know we try to help them and of course we're there too to make sure that you know they are pro progressing I guess you know as much as we can we like to make sure that they are progressing towards implementation and everything so we try to alleviate some of that fear but it's just going to be there because it's just change and change is scary anyways you know but when you talk about that workflow redesign and we um we have this huge mass pro thick book that we use and it gives best practices and all that and they love that book they love it because it gives them stuff that backs up what they're hearing from us and their vendor, you know, as they're going through the stages. And so they can easily refer back to it. Um, well, into this field in general, I went to nursing school for a while. Um, so no, I did not like the hands-on care at all 
So um, I had a friend that was actually a health information manager. She got me involved in school, and I graduated with my RHIA from UT. Um, and then I worked as an HIM manager for five years um, before coming on board here at Cooper. And Heather? And I also attended the, attended the University of Tennessee, and I am an RHIA. And uh, I started out at uh, Baptist Hospital Memphis um, in a supervisor role with their, um, at that point in time, they did not have any um, actual electronic documentation going on. They were scanning all the paper. So I got to transform, you know, the huge charts and scan those and make sure that they were available, not only for the physicians to, you know, provide continued patient care, but also for coding and billing. Um, the coders were at home, so that was a huge process to get the turnaround time and have those available within a, you know, 24 hour period. And then I went to Methodist um, in Memphis, and I was a systems analyst, and so I was played that liaison role between uh, the IT staff and the HIM departments at a corporate level. And I originally got my degree in business administration because, you know, I was told as long as you get a college degree, you get a job, <laughs> and that didn't really always work out. So I started on a nursing unit, actually, a cardiac step-down unit um, as a unit secretary, and I ran, I ran a tight ship on that 3 to 11 shift. And um, I knew then, after about day two, um, that I was not cut out for nursing because I did not like code browns or anything related to any body fluid. So I got out of there, and I went and where I was, I had looked into HIM, but I just didn't progress. So I did go on and I graduated from UT, and then I went back and got my master's. And I worked um, for Jackson Madison County General Hospital, actually with Mike, for um, seven years, and then she stole me. Yeah, <laughs> I went to school together for a year. But um, the, the TECRAC team is actually extremely diverse, just like all of this is extremely diverse. Um, West Tennessee clearly has a lot of uh, <laughs> informaticists. Um, but uh, the Middle Tennessee manager is, her background is in criminal justice. Now, that seems a little strange until I got a call from the Justice Department just this last year and said, we'd like you to come and talk to us about EMR adoption because we're going to have to investigate those too. And I said, yes, when would you like me there? And I'll kiss your ring. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, so, it, so we've got that. We've got um, two other people that came, or three other people that came out of the vendor world, one e-prescribing, others EMR vendors. I came out of the EMR vendor world. Um, then we've got a uh, practice manager, Gail McRae, who's the manager of West Tennessee. She thought I wasn't going to say anything, but she's a med tech. She actually uh, is a med tech. very first wife, long ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then Deborah is hiding back there. Um, she's got that incredible accent you can't miss. And, um, she's our educational liaison, and so she's got a nursing background as well. So you'll see uh, practice managers, uh, administrators, uh, that, you know, lots of, privacy and security, we have uh, some of that on the team too, so very diverse group because we have to, we have to pull across the region from a lot of different things. <laughs> the question in the back of my mind, because that's the, where this whole thing is headed, that if I go to one facility and they transfer me somewhere else, it's, we're going to have my data. It's getting better. It is getting yeah. better. Uh, Tennessee has actually been extremely progressive in the health information exchange market, and we've had some lessons learned, and George, I'm going to steal your line. I, I, he cracked me up. We were in a meeting one day, and he said, you know, we, we started on this, and now everybody's doing it, and I just feel like they're calling a kindergartner. So I love that line, George. But... Um, <laughs> information through the <coughs> If you had to be transferred, they can just literally securely get your information with the attachments, you know, mm -hmm. uh, out of that system to the next care provider, whether it be a rehabilitation service or a, a you know, a, a nursing home. That, I shouldn't have said that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, if you were going into some other, you know, type of care setting, they actually, um, 
because you get your record there, but we're, we're just sort of on the threshold of that. So I think in uh, 2013, you're really going to see a lot of movement toward that because it's going to be required in certification. It, And they can, you know, and, and two, if you've got uh, providers that are, this is in the provider market as well as the hospital market, if they're on the same EMR vendor, sometimes they're getting a little more progressive about being able to exchange data. And, and you can do it today, but from one vendor to another vendor, they could do it. It's just not a secure, yeah. encrypted file that you want to make sure is, you know, for privacy and security, you want to make sure your, your patient data is, you know, in this, cute little bubble and gets to your provider safely right and so yeah yeah <laughs> so and that's what we run into is a lot of our providers have gmail accounts and they can't remember their passwords and we got to get them reset and we got you know so that's where direct's going to come in and help provide that that security because now providers for meaningful use have to prove that they can they've got to at least try to do a test exchange with the test patient you know we use Daffy Duck and Mickey Mouse and I, I exchanged Dora the other day and you know we see lots of strange yeah you know, tester Chester tester and ZZ tests and those people are out there and we're t we are exchanging that data and it can happen from one vendor to a different vendor because they all use that XML language and everything but it's not a secure email and or secure message so you just want to make sure it's secure so that's what direct's going to bring for us and they're going to need to do it for meaningful use. <laughs> Do, you know, I'm the most annoying patient in the world. Can you imagine? I mean, honestly. And I just went and took my kids for their well visit to the pediatrician. And it's nice, this office, you know, and I've begged him and begged him to sign with us. There are six providers, and they absolutely will not spend the money on it. And I'm like, you know what? If you weren't such a nice doctor, <laughs> I threaten him all the time. I'm like, you need an EMR because he writes everything down. It's just an act of Congress to get over there and get something from him. I guess you – you know, you yourself as a patient could promote it. I don't, you know. Well, and you can request an electronic yeah. copy of your health information, and they yeah. should provide that to you within three business days, or they will not meet meaningful use. Yeah, if they're because if they're going for objective. that. Yeah. yeah, if they're going for meaningful use, you can request that copy. Well, I don't get the ticket. I do. It's not at our provider offices. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in another part of Tennessee and it wasn't available so I said please download all my records to unfortunately a CD and um, let me take it or a, you know, let's say USB it should be on a jump drive and I said please give me my records and they put them in and I guarded those records with my life and, and I think as a patient when you take off your hat you're saying you know started your wearing this hat you're wearing that's our responsibility if you know at this point in time but with the future coming with direct we hear, yeah, I hear a lot of the patient doesn't care anything about any of this. The clinical, the patient care summary, the visit summary, that is like, I, I, I literally just, when I introduce meaningful use for the first time to a provider and I give that objective, I just literally sit back and wait. And I hear all the reasons why that is like the dumbest objective ever, you know, and then I go, okay, do you feel better? Okay, so let's get started. This is why it's required, and this is why it's good, and this is, you know, I put up my little happy face on it, you know, but they're not, you know, they think they know, they think they know their patient, and they think that in rural West Tennessee or rural Washington back there, they think that they know what their patient wants, and I tell them they're wrong. <laughs> you know, I let them know, no, you're going to understand. In a couple of years, you're going to get hit. You're going to be blindsided with these requests and these demands for patient portals and 
you know, ways for them to view this, you know, information online and everything. So, I told you I carried a big stick. Yeah, <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> So we're going to shift gears a little bit here. Um, uh, so we're going to do a, a, a little switch here uh, and start talking a little bit. We've now gone from sort of you know, what it means to the provider patients, how we can get people trained, what we're training for, and now we're going to give a little context about uh, different ways the different federal programs that really can support this goal. Um, and again, I think a lot of what we're trying to do here is, you know, it's, it's more important to have the people who are actually doing talking about it than um, the feds up here talking about it because it's not a federal mandate. It's, it's doing it for the right reason. It's the why. It's not because we said so. Uh, but uh, we do want to give you guys a little context to some of the things that have gone over here before. So uh, the first thing uh, I'm going to do is say, uh, for those of you following your agenda, I am not Chitramola. I will do my best introduction of Chitra Vola, uh, but Chitra is really the one uh, woman behind ONC's uh, health workforce programs, and she unfortunately couldn't be here today. Um, but she asked me to sort of give a quick overview of some of the stuff that we've done before. And, if, and uh, I'm going to see, here we go. So a lot of what we at ONC do is really uh, thinking about ways in which we can use health information technology really to get better health care, better health, and reduce costs. So th those are the three drivers behind a lot of what we do. Um, and it, the, the nice thing is it's also the drivers between a lot of the work that our colleagues at HRSA do, our colleagues at CMS. Um, you know, the Office of the National Coordinator gives us a great purview in which we can sort of go out there into the field and talk to lots of people and sort of think of how all these uh, systems come together. So I think what we're seeing is incredible, rapid uh, movement forward in terms of widespread adoption, and I think that's very exciting. But we also s realize that there are a lot of challenges as we go across the board. So um, what my team really does is, is, you know, my office is the Office of Provider Adoption Support. So we're trying to help all providers get there. Um, and we recognize that there are different levers that we have to do across the board. So supporting meaningful use, we just had a great uh, presentation by the regional extension centers. They're one of the drivers behind this. We think it's really important that folks get there. Um, but what we also want to make sure that, that when people are getting there, when they're doing those quality measures, when they've finally gotten it through their head that this is an important thing to do, they realize, oh my goodness, I'm now well positioned to take advantage of other things that are coming down the road. So that's a lot of what we're doing. And thinking about how we can also leverage some of the data, you saw our dashboard, Jeffrey, thanks for the plug. Um, you know, we're trying to make our information as transparent as possible because I think there's not a lot of knowledge about sort of the healthcare system in general and how rapidly this is changing. And I think it's important for us to take that sort of high-level view and s talk about how this is j happening across the country, because that's going to help some of the people who are a little slower in the uptake and getting there. Um, but what we're really going to focus on a lot today is really about catalyzing um, IT workforce development. Um, and again, I'll go more into depth on this, but we also have a resource called healthit.gov, which is a place where we're trying to bring everything together and, and tie it all together. So these are some of the different initiatives that I'm really working on with my team. But let's talk a little bit about the health uh, IT workforce training programs in general. 
Um, and I think uh, Kay actually did a better job of some of these slides, and we may be borrowing some of her work in the future. <laughs> Kay, thank you, appreciate it. Such a good sport along those lines. Um, but really, what, what ONC does is we, we started off with four different programs, and we were really trying to think about how can we, you know, in a very short period of time, look at the, the entire workforce uh, uh, of the, in the country, the entire healthcare sector, and really think about what can we do in a quick, succinct way that can have as much impact as possible. And the reason we were doing this is that our programs were rolling out just at the same time as the New England Timelines are rolling out, and for those of you who've been tracking it at home, that's a really rapid uh, process. There's not a lot of time for providers to do stuff, and we, we, we recognize that some of the stuff we want to get to, and we will get to, is going to take a long time, but what we wanted to do is look for leveraging those resources of folks that are already doing great work in the field on this, and how can we get that out the door as quickly as possible. Um, so we focused on uh, three programs on one side and then one program on the other. I'll start off with the UBT program because the university-based training program was really designed uh, to really focus on master's level programs. And I'll get there, we'll talk a little bit about what we're looking at. Um, but this was developed to sort of leverage some of these existing informatics programs, these advanced programs that we know that are already out there. Um, and it was great on the last panel to hear about all the different degrees that people are coming to master's programs. It makes, warms my heart because that's a, a big focus of ours. But we also recognize that there's a lot more folks in the healthcare sector that needed this work. So the primary driver of that is the, the community college consortia, and we'll talk about that in a second, which really leverages that, that curriculum that was so artfully described, but also that ties into this new competency program so we can begin to look across the whole he healthcare sector and say, are we doing what we need to do? How are we getting folks there? I think there was a comment earlier about the significance of training people, testing them, and how important that is. So um, this is a map that you've seen before of our community uh, college consortia. And we've got 82 uh, community colleges that were in this initial area. But the, one of the great things I think about this program is that we're also seeing a lot of other community colleges that are, are, are coming together. And I think our, that's really a testament to our, our consortia lead and how they've been sort of broad in this. And, and the sense about this is we wanted to start with these programs, but we by no means wanted to end there. I think there's a need to get this information out across the country, and our consortia have been doing fabulous jobs of bringing people together and thinking about ways in which we can get new programs out there, not reinventing the wheel. Because it, it was so nice, Kate did a great job describing all the materials on, uh, that the cu uh, curriculum development team developed, but that's still pretty high level. Crafting all of that into something that people can de deploy and use, I mean, I think there was a lot of time, energy, and effort that went into that work, and we have a lot of great things to show for it. Um, this is, again, is another summary of the six uh, roles that we started working on. And I think we've talked a little bit about these roles, you know, the critical importance of workflow redesign, you know, that clinician practitioner, the implementation support specialist, implementation manager, the technical support uh, and, and trainer. But I think what one of the points I want to make is that we started with these six roles recognizing that they were going to evolve. And I think a lot of the, the great work that's been done in places like Dyersburg is taking these different roles and figuring out how do they relate to what's really going on in the environment and they're operating. Um, you know, we have to be fluid, we have to be nimble in this, this field because things are constantly changing. And I think that we are very fortunate enough to have great community colleges who are very skilled at taking things, figuring out how to adapt them um, in quick time, changing and developing uh, curricula. And I know that, that where we started and where we are now has, has certainly evolved and will continue to evolve as we go ahead. Um, but this is some of the key competencies that we really were looking at um, into, and we tried to embed into the different uh, uh, curricula that we were rolling out. And, and we really based this on a lot of sort of the, the needs that we're hearing from the marketplace and the, the real life things that, you know, backup plan, you gotta have backup plans in place because, uh, you know, the systems will fail. And, and it's great that you have prescription pads for doctors who forgot how to use those things, that's fabulous, but you gotta have those systems in place, you gotta drill on that, because this is real life stuff that happens and healthcare is gonna go forward with, without you know, these systems and we have to be prepared for that. But we also need to think about all the other things that are out there, so whether it's security standards or vendors or other folks. It's really critically important that we as a healthcare system begin thinking about how we can tie things together um, and I think that's the great opportunity that we have through the, the curricula, the community college program. Um, I am super excited that we've already graduated so many folks. Um, you know, we are, uh, our first, uh, the target for the first two years of the program was uh, 10,000 students, so we've eclipsed that, and we're keeping on, keeping on. Um, and um, we've made much of the stats of the average age of 44 and, and uh, with ample uh, experience or IT experience. But I think this really illustrates that, that there's a huge desire 
um, of people to get involved in this field. I think this is a field that where the jobs are, are clearly stay, staying in this country. They're not going elsewhere. Healthcare is local, but it's also something that we could, you know, do remotely. And I think this is something that, that we really want to leverage, especially for some of our rural areas, because this is a great way for people to who have great experience, who are really knowledgeable about work in general, to be come together and support the work we're doing. Um, we also worked with our uh, these five uh, universities to develop the the curriculum, uh, which was already uh, illustrated. And I think these providers have done a very good job in a short amount of time of bringing together some of the, the crispest examples of what's out there. And I think it's a really good fundamental um, set of building blocks that people can use to go forward. Um, and again, these are sort of some of the different elements that are out there with the different lab components highlighted. Um, and then uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the university-based training program because I think this is another area. If you think about healthcare workers as a spectrum, what we were trying to do is think about that the vast majority of healthcare workers need to be exposed and knowledgeable about IT systems. These are, but they can be, whether it's through trainers or learning systems, we need to make sure that everybody who, who's working in the system understands how health IT operates. But then we need certain spectrums of experts who really that's their knowledge set. And then ultimately we need some people who can be sort of more of the analytics, the super, uh, supervisors, the informaticians at the end, who can help manage the whole process. The UBT program is really working on the latter part and really thinking about some of these high level master's programs that are out there. And what's been wonderful is watching how different um, universities have implemented this to address the different needs in their communities. Um, so we've had a lot of success in trying to get people through the program. Um, and these are the roles that they're focusing on, whether it's the clinician, public health leader, the health information management exchange, um, privacy and security is a very hot topic for us. We're finding a lot of people interested in that. And then some of the other things, whether it's programming, uh, research and design, or a health IT subspecialist. Um, and I think what's, what we really are, are doing right now is trying to think about ways <coughs> of incorporating these people back into the healthcare workforce sector and, and filling gaps that we're identifying as we go forward. Um, this program, too, has had great success in getting people out the door. Um, I think uh, you know, we're very excited that we're going to exceed our targets on this program as well, um, largely because there's been such huge interest in the program as well. Um, I also want to talk really briefly about our competency program. Um, this is something that we've developed with uh, our, our colleagues at uh, uh, Northern uh, uh, Virginia Community College. Um, and, and really, in, in work with Ahima and others, we've been really trying to think about what are the you know, core uh, competencies that folks need. How can we make sure that people who are going through our programs or healthcare workers who are out there in the field really have the knowledge that they need to, to, to be viewed as, as knowledgeable professionals. And, and you know, other industries have their own process of doing competency and education programs. This is a first step in that path. We have the test that's being deployed. We've had thousands of students who've taken the test. But there's still folks, there's still tests available. So if there are people in this room who are interested, we're still getting people out there taking the test. So um, our goal is to make sure that we get as many people who are initially interested in that, who've been really partners with us um, to get that test and that experience because Part of our goal here is to learn from this so we can continue to make sure that this is meaningful for the, the, uh, the profession. Um, and we are now actively working with some of the large hospital chains, large vendors, large employers, trying to make sure that they understand what the test is, how they can understand how to use it, and that evolution. So we really view this as a way in which we will be able to work with them as we go forward together. Um, and a uh, another thing I want to mention is that one of the things that ONC does very well is that we convene people from across both the, the government sector but also the private sector and really come in together to think about things. Um, we have these what we call FACAs, which are federal advisory committees. Um, and uh, these, these groups come together to really, in a, a very open and transparent fashion, talk about things. So for instance, on meaningful use, we have a policy group and a standards group that comes together and helps give advice to ONC about what should be in meaningful how do we set that stage going forward? What are the criteria that need to be there? Um, and these groups have been incredibly powerful. They, uh, on average, we have a, a one FACA meeting, meeting every other day for the last five years. Um, we've got a lot of volunteers who've been very active in doing this and have been really helping drive this forward with us. And I think we have really appreciated the, the value that they've given us because they help us sort of to think through issues in a new way and make sure that before we start, start setting policy or going down in a certain direction, we really vetted it with the people um, who are doing the work. Um, so what we've done is we've really reached out and we've convened a new uh, FACA subword group on health IT workforce. Um, and this group, it just very recently convened, but it has um, 
a number of different folks from uh, you know our grantees to our partners in the healthcare sector. Uh, we're really trying to bring together all sorts of folks, um, and especially our federal partners, because there, there are a lot of different resources that we want to make sure are aligned um, and available to folks as we move forward. I mean, I think this group is going to be very important for us because what we're trying to do in the next six months is think about what is it we need to be doing to fill in the gaps. Are, th are there areas in terms of the workforce that need to be addressed? Are there new programs that need to be developed? Maybe we can look at reallocating some of the great work that's been done by our Department of Labor or Ag Agriculture or Ag, I'm sorry, or Ed, um, to bring together the different resources so we can begin helping people across the board. So this is gonna be a very interesting place where we're trying to get uh, everybody involved, and if you're interested, again, we, it's open to the public. People can listen in. Uh, there's a public uh, comment period at every meeting. Um, but we really are trying to be, make sure that we focus on, on what the needs are going forward. And one of the areas that has been uh, identified as, as being very important is rural health. Um, so this is, this is something that we want to, to, to really focus on. Uh, so in general, uh, the, as we were preparing for the FACA, we were trying to think about what, what are some of the lessons learned that we've gleaned so far from our health IT program to date. Um, and, and here are a few. Um, it's very interesting because I've been trying to keep track of all the different thoughts that we've had uh, today as we've been discussing, and a lot of these are, are very similar. So the, the first one is evolution, uh, an evolving marketplace. Um, I think health IT is, is coming on so strong and it is happening in so many different ways that we are already thinking three steps from where we are now. And it's important for us to get the fundamentals down. It's important for us to get meaningful use. But clearly, the future is, is out there, and it's becoming more and more evident. And what we need to do is start working with people to make sure they understand the linkages between getting that quality measure done right now, because that's going to be tied into a healthcare reform plan that's going to be coming out. And those programs are, are, are beginning to roll right now. They're happening all over, including here in Tennessee. Um, and we really need to make sure that we, we are not only getting people the information and skills they need, but also the knowledge and workforce they need to be successful in those fields. Um, and that what we need also is to think about training for all healthcare providers. Um, and, and when I say providers, I mean in the biggest possible sense from everybody working in the healthcare sector. Because from the folks that meet you when you walk into a center, uh, to a facility, to when you leave, to anybody who's interacting with you, you've got to understand how all these pieces come together. Because it's all, all essential in terms of the framework ahead. Um, we also found that in rural areas, we, we are having connectivity issues. A lot of the great tools and resources we were, we were providing just don't work unless you have that broadband. But the good news is that we have uh, partners out there who are willing to work with us to try to address these broadband issues if we can clearly identify them. And I think that there's some really great opportunities for us to work on that as we go forward. Um, we hear a lot about getting experience, especially on vendor products. Um, and the good news is we've been able to develop some strong relationships with vendors that we're hoping to leverage as we go ahead to get more people into the mix. Um, but clearly, there's a need for people to understand what really it means to be working with these systems as we plunge ahead. Um, and that ties into this need for op internship opportunities. Um, we heard the plug earlier that we have students with jobs go forward. It's very funny because I have conversations all the time with large health, uh, uh, large integrated delivery networks. That, that have hospitals across the country, and their first issue they always raise with me is workforce. And I always say, hey, have you talked to our community colleges? Can we get linked up? And I find that when we can make those linkages, we really do open up a whole slew of opportunities. But this is something we really need to continue to focus on and push forward as we go ahead. Um, that being said, a lot of what we're talking about here is the soft skills. It's a lot about how you, you interact with people, and, and it's a selling business. Because when you're talking to providers, sometimes they don't necessarily want to hear what you're telling them. You have to sort of let it go and come back to them, figure out whatever approach works to get your message across. It's very important. Um, and that's something that, you know, while we're emphasizing all the, the hard nuts and bolts in the curriculum, those soft skills are hard. And that's why, you know, having training programs with real people who've been experienced is so critically important because nobody can replace that person who can really help in, take that information and package it in a way for people to understand. Um, the stackable credential idea is basically we want to think through the whole healthcare field and make it so that someone who's entering the, the, the market for the first place can see first time can see how they can build their career over time. And health IT really should be a, a long-term career field for folks. Um, there are great examples of where that's been done in the past. We want to leverage those examples, some, uh, you know, really build them into the process, and make it so that people across the board can say, I'm going to be in this for a long time. This is the career I want to be going into. Um, and move ahead, because that hasn't historically been the case. I mean, I think these new programs are still very new, and I think there's still some, some pieces of, of the path that we don't have all the way nailed down. 
um, and then really working uh, you know, with our universities, trying to figure it out, and then finding the right staff. I mean, I think that there are lots of experts out there, but sometimes it's very difficult. Um, and I say all these, these are great lessons learned because um, the needs we have going across the country are pretty tremendous. Uh, we talked a little bit about the, prim uh, the extension centers earlier. I mean, these are some slightly updated staff of just the primary care providers. I mean, what's exciting about our regional extension centers is they're working right now with over 40% of all the primary care providers in the entire country. Um, and that's pretty amazing when you think about it that by design, they're not going after the large health integrated delivery networks, the largest per employers, Kaiser Permanentes, you know, those systems, because they don't need the help. They're going after the small practices, the community health centers, the, the rural, uh, critical, rural hospitals, critical access hospitals. Um, and we're having tremendous success um, of, you know, over 70% uh, of all rural providers uh, are now working in the extension center. That's pretty amazing. And I think what we're finding is that workforce is a huge need and that we as a program, really, as we get going further and further, we need new models of doing this. So I appreciate this opportunity to come here and talk about it because I think this gives us a chance in which we can really have the dialogue about ways in which we can move ahead. Um, that being said, there are a slew of other ways that you can follow all the work that ONC is doing at home on your uh, social media of choice. Um, you've got it. I think we've got a link to it some way, shape, or form. Um, but really, you know, I want to emphasize that healthit.gov is a great resource for everybody who wants to know about these programs and how they all come together. Because what we're doing at ONC is we're trying to set up these programs um, in a way in which we can then leverage the work that our, our colleagues at other agencies are doing. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Aaron to talk a little bit about the work that HRSA is doing around health IT, and, and especially in the rural areas, because as he, he's very modest in his, his early uh, introduction, but I think he and his team have been doing phenomenal work in really thinking about this for a long time, um, and it, they're great partners to work with, and I just welcome your thoughts. Well, thank you very much. Um, yes, there's a lot going on in the general, in the global world, but our job at the Office of Rural Health Policy is to look at all of those things and figure out how to bring those down to the rural level because at the Office of Rural Health Policy, we have a pretty small budget, and so the things we do are on a small scale, and so a lot of what we do is conjole, convince, and uh, convince people that our ideas were their ideas so that, <laughs> so that they go along. I like that and, idea. And, oh, and, and we work from that route. So. Um, uh, the reason is that one in six people live in rural areas in this country and that they're disproportionately Medicare beneficiaries and Medicare beneficiaries are older population and they're more likely to have chronic conditions and more likely to use hospitals and more likely to contribute to all the costs and everything that we talk about. So there's very good reason to focus on them. But when you're looking at dollar values for vendors, their rural hospitals and health clinics are more likely to be independent, so they're less likely to be part of a system and therefore harder to get to for a vendor and sell, and their margins are smaller, and so they tend to be the last ones on the priority list. So we try to focus, again, the resources and attention so that rural is, is getting served as well. Um, you've heard about those problems, the vendors, the access to capital is another thing that we have an issue with, and we've talked a lot today about workforce. So some of the specific things that we're doing on a federal level, and a lot of it, as I said, is partnering and cajoling rather than being able to put our own resources into it. But the first thing that was a pretty major investment for us is last year we ran a competition and we awarded $12 million to 47 rural health IT networks to implement EHRs in a variety of healthcare settings. So groups of, or networks came together and proposed projects to implement EHRs and other HIT in their, in their communities and in, in multi-county regions in a lot of cases. So we're working through that and we're going to use that as a pilot project and see where that goes and hopefully have some lessons learned, some best practices to be able to disseminate to the rest of the world. The other part is that we've worked with a lot of our federal partners. As I mentioned, the White House Rural Council was created last year, and since you have access to a whole lot of cabinet secretaries, it's a great time to start talking to them about rural health care issues. And one of the things that came out of that, and Mr. Good have to leave, but 
uh, the USDA Rural Development has money through its Community Facilities Program and through the Business and Industry Program, and we worked with them to establish eligibility for health IT purchases. So now hospitals and clinics can generally use their anticipated EHR incentive payments as collateral for loans from USDA Rural Development. So if you're a nonprofit hospital or clinic, you can go and get complete, you can go apply for community facilities money. If you're a for-profit clinic or hospital, you can apply for their business and industry money, especially if there's some job creation involved, but it enables them to do short-term financing until they can get those payments when they attest, when, not if, when they attest to meaningful use. Rural development also has broadband programs and distance learning and telemedicine programs, and you can leverage those and piece them together, get your broadband into the community, and sometimes to buy equipment that's multi-purpose, and maybe it's to use it to provide the access for the HIT training. So if they get distance learning and telemedicine, a lot of the telemedicine systems in rural areas are used as much for training of, H of healthcare staff as it is for actually seeing patients. So it's a great opportunity that way. Another effort we've had is through the Secretary to work with the Federal Communications Commission. They have what's called the Rural Healthcare Program that's run by the Universal USAC. If you look up USAC Rural Healthcare Program, it's a $400 million grant program. It subsidizes telecommunications and internet service for rural providers. Three quarters of the smallest rural hospitals in this country are participating, but that leaves 250, 300 critical access hospitals and a, and a slew of, of other rural hospitals and healthcare providers who aren't, and there's a lot of money left on the table every year. And so making them aware that they can get their, that their, they can get their T1s, their T3s, their whatever broadband subsidized can make a big difference in their availability and ability to connect to the other healthcare providers and have interoperability and effective information exchange. We're partnering with the Department of Labor. The Department of Labor has an amazing number of resources. They have some grant money that's specific to certain situations, like if you've, if you've been affected by trade uh, adjustments, so if you've lost jobs in, a, in an area because of trade, there's trade adjustment assistance money specifically for community colleges. So we tried to make community colleges aware of that, so if they had that kind of population in their community, go after some of that money, work with their workforce investment boards and, and get some of that because there's quite a bit of that out there and it would be excellent to use that for rural HIT workforce. There's also, it's been mentioned, the Virtual Career Network and other resources to, to piece them together to make sure that the resources are available as widely as possible so people can find them and sign up for them. We've also partnered with the Department of Education, doing some outreach to community colleges, identifying some of their training portals, seeing if we can't put some of the curriculum and, and related materials on their training portals and, and we're just using resources that they have, that they have capacity for training. Every webinar that somebody puts on, somebody has to pay for, and if they have resources that can put those out for us, it's a great way to provide some of that training. One of the other things that we're looking at is, is how we might be able to focus on rural HIT workforce training. And so, so, so like we did with the rural health IT networks, we're looking for input from people on what's most needed from a rural perspective. Is it recruitment? Is it, tra is it, the, on is it the actual training and education? Is it retention? Uh, is it internships? What kinds of things, if you were to design a program to get rural people in their healthcare facilities, the training they needed to help implement an EHR, ideally, what would that look like? We'd welcome your input on that. And so that's where I'm going to stop and let you talk, and then we'll have some questions okay. afterwards. Okay, well, um, that's quite a show to follow up on. Thank you. <laughs> um, and we represent one small piece of what they're talking about. Um, Aaron was talking about the hospitals and reaching out and, and to having these loan um, situations for them. And so we are actually almost announcing today that we now have a small loan program for pr small provider offices. And um, if you were able to pick up the flyer, it pretty much describes, describes that. And so you're really the first 
group to see this. Um, and so we're just so congratulations for coming. Mm -hmm. Yes, Take thank you. Take a piece of paper. <laughs> and, an advantage. And it's really um, initially, I think, uh, somewhat of a pilot program to see if, how it works. We're still working out some of the kinks and um, trying to uh, roll it out. Uh, we started talking to a few um, position offices this week because um, DRA wanted to have a pilot of, of a few three to five offices and see how that went. So we're in the very baby steps of this. And um, I have to say within two days we had five position offices interested. Um, so we feel that we're at least in the right area right. and that uh, we will be able to move forward with this very slowly, but we will be able to move forward. But of course, we have the deadlines of, of 2014, so <laughs> yep. uh, we've got to, uh, to uh, get the kinks all worked out and we start to move forward rapidly. But um, we will try to recommend uh, a vendor to the um, position offices. And oh, and I should mention, it's also dental offices. Um, there hasn't been much discussion of that, um, but this program will be open to dental offices as well. And uh, we're hoping that maybe a third of the number we're trying to reach initially, which is 66 offices by, by the end of the year, that maybe a third of those will be dental offices. And um, so we're, we're um, going to roll it out, and we are, um, I was listening to the, your presentation on G Source, and, or Q Source, and um, uh, we also will be recommending vendors, um, and I think there might be some advantage to us in connecting with Absolutely. these other offices to see what vendors you are recommending. Um, we need to do that rather rapidly. We're not really recommending a specific vendor, but we are just trying to provide the offices with a list of vendors that have been successful in the area. And so we need to get that moving this week as well. Um, and I don't know, that's pretty much where we are. Um, we have a list in the counties that are on the back. So we've been, been spending a couple of weeks um, trying to identify the position offices in those areas. I think we're up to about 400 at this point, um, and we're still, still going through. And uh, what we found on a few of our calls initially is that, uh, to address Aaron's question, I think uh, to me earlier is that many of them are linked into multiple offices. And so even though they're on these lists as being possibly eligible, um, they often are linked into five or six other clinics. So we have to sort of figure out yet exactly how we're handling um, those individually. And the loan applications will be sent to the individuals um, for, the, for that particular practice or location. And I have to say the loan application is rather lengthy, <laughs> um, but hopefully it will not turn uh, any of the interested parties off and that we can help walk them through that process. In addition, um, we hope to provide an introductory uh, CD to them um, in which one of our prime physicians uh, does an introduction to the, directly to, talking directly to a physician in a video uh, trying to get them to understand all the meaningful use and why, the why of why this is important to, and the timing of it. Uh, so um, that, that will also hopefully explain some of the roles for the staff and emphasize, as was emphasized earlier, the need to look at workflow and to start identifying the roles that the individuals in their office need to play. Um, so I think that's where we are. But this is a great program, and I really applaud DRA for helping to think oh, this through. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think this really, you know, we talked about a lot of workforce, but ca access to capital is, is, is a huge issue for rural providers. Um, do you have any sense of how many providers did, did, are you thinking about for this pilot program? Or well, because I know it's a pilot. Correct? Yes, yes. And at the initial number we were given is 66. 66. Six, and hopefully by the end of the year we'll have 66. Okay. Uh, in a recent conversation with Mike and others, um, they had said if this pilot works, they hope to be able to uh, have a couple more million dollars available by the beginning of next year. Because it seems to me it's a great investment because these providers, they're eligible for meaningful use, can get tens of thousands of dollars. Right. So some right. of it is just a cash flow issue and providers can't front the money up front right. before they get it. And it's one thing if you're on Medicaid, but if you're a Medicare provider, right. you've got to start this 90-day reporting right. period by October 3rd. So there really is a time crunch There's now to get those dollars out the door. Yeah, tremendous time crunch. And, and the other thing nice with this program is hopefully they will all pay us back and so then we will have you're money <laughs> to go Come to another fun. 66 and keep the thing rolling out. I, I, well, I think this is a, a great initiative and it's so exciting to have sort of another partnership in play because right. I mean clearly 
you know, we're all, all these federal programs are really committed to helping the providers move forward um, and, and get the, the resources they need to be successful. Okay. Um, I, I have one question uh, for you, Aaron, in terms of the work that first has been doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you guys are very strongly aligned with the, the offices of rural health in each one of the states. You Correct. support them. How are you working with them to sort of coordinate some of the, the efforts about programs like this, regional extension centers? I mean, I know from firsthand experience how valued they've been in that, but can you talk a little bit about how you're facilitating partnerships across the board? Uh, sure. So we fund 50 state offices of rural health to work with a variety of rural health providers. It's, it's sort of in the past been focused on hospitals, but more so on clinics. And we also have a flex program uh, that helps small, that helps critical access hospitals and a few other providers to address quality and other issues. And, and a lot of those we are reformatting, re, re, reworking our programs to be more aligned with the reform activities that are going on, the changes that are happening in healthcare. So a lot more with quality improvement and those kinds of activities. So reaching out to all of them, encouraging them to contact these providers and talk to them about these issues and even put some money, there's usually money to be able to put on workshops and co and partner with these other entities to make these kind yeah. of things happen. Because I think they've been an incredibly great resource across the country in terms of helping to sort of coordinate all these issues because you know, it, it is challenging trying to implement these systems in any environment, but especially when you're in a rural environment and you're so far away from other resources as well. Yes, yes. Uh, it's, it's particularly a challenge and as I said, they're lagging and, and uh, Somebody mentioned earlier that rural providers also, they're very independent and they have a tendency to think that they know their patients, they know what their patients need, and exactly. it, it's tough to tell them that maybe you don't know everything about every one of your patients because you, often rural providers have more patients, especially where there are short, because there are the majority of shortage areas in this country for, for health professionals and for medical issues are in rural areas and so they tend to be seeing more patients and working longer hours than providers in urban and suburban areas mm -hmm. and so it's awfully difficult for them with a paper chart to keep track of everybody and know as you saw flu pneumonia vaccinations really bad unless you're on an EHR those kinds of things to remember to tell those patients to get their their pneumonia vaccinations or their flu vaccinations and things like that that can make huge differences. Um, when you know go, I go to visit hospitals and you hear that after H1N1 came around and uh, you had suddenly uh, hand sanitizer showed up in every hospital, every clinic showed up in every counter at every bank, every post office in the country that year, and uh, lo and behold. Pneumonia and flu, or pneumonia uh, admissions at hospitals around the country dropped, and a lot of rural hospitals said that really affected our bottom line. You know, we didn't have anybody in the hospital. But, but, <laughs> they guys, keep in mind, exactly. But rural hospitals work on a very small margin, the smallest ones, and so when they don't have those people show up, they might end up closing their doors and then you don't have an emergency room. So figuring out those issues can be a challenge, but it's still in the public's best interest and in health to do these things. But just making sure that they have, you know, that, that they aren't left behind, if you will, not no child left behind, but uh, no patient left behind, uh, making sure that they have an opportunity just because they're in a rural area that they don't have access to an EHR or I can remember you know, when, when somebody in my family had an x-ray, you, you got handed your x-ray in an envelope and you carried it to the specialist. And that's ridiculous in this day and age. I, I keep a, a sign on my wall that shows, you know, where the rest of the world is and, and then when you get to healthcare, it's a pencil and paper. And thankfully we've come a long way, but rural tends to push back a little more on that at times than even others. So, it's interesting, Aaron, because because your your point about sort of the, the ability for rural communities to adapt to healthcare reform, I think is very important because I think meaningful use of health information technology is a great equalizer in that field. So as you think about some of the new payment reform programs that are being piloted right now, our colleagues at the CMS have have rolled out in the last year a lot of new programs. Um, Pioneer, 
accountable care organizations or Pioneer ACOs are rolled out. There are patient-centered medical home pilot programs that are being rolled out to, to, to mm -hmm. federally qualified health centers. There are shared savings programs. And I think one of the things that we've really been eager to do, I know, in person at ONC, CMS, is really facilitate some of these models in rural areas because I think that there is a real recognition that rural communities have a very good sense of you know, community because they have to be because there's just not a lot of people. So people know everybody in rural, and therefore some of these models where you can get paid for better quality instead of necessarily having to have patient beds might be a better payment model ultimately for rural areas as well because we're moving towards keeping people well, yeah. doing the right thing because there's a coordinated care and using health IT. I know that's really hard for people to think about when they're implementing meaningful use right now and they don't like being told what to do, but how, how are you guys working to sort of think about preparing the rural providers for these new healthcare reform programs that are coming down the line? Um, and once we're really successful at getting everyone's meaningful use, then what? What, what are you guys teaming them up for in the future? Well, um, we, we've been through this. So the Office of Rural Health Policy came about in the late 1980s because Congress saw then that Medicare spending was getting out of hand. Uh, and they could see that. And so they switched from a uh, cost-based, in the early 80s, up, up until 1987, every hospital in the country had a payment structure, had its own payment schedule, and CMS approved it, and as long as it was reasonable, CMS paid it. After that, they set up um, volume-based, law of averages, economies of scale, whatever you want to call it, uh, payment structure for hospitals. And as you can imagine, low volume rural hospitals started dropping like flies who had just been sprayed. Um, we lost almost 400 rural hospitals in the course of a decade. So Congress went back and put in cost-based reimbursement for those small rural hospitals. And so we have to model payment systems that are going on now. So um, an ACO has to have 5,000 patients. You go to a typical rural hospital, try to find 5,000 Medicare beneficiaries. Not 5,000 patients overall, 5,000 Medicare beneficiaries, which means 20 to 25,000 people in their catchment area. A lot of rural hospitals don't have that. So how do they participate? And so our, our role is looking at scale and figuring out how, how do you make these things work in this small environment. It's the same thing with HIT. I, I'm glad you're working with all range of, of, of physician practices. I personally am not terribly worried about the trials and tribulations of a 250 physician uh, group because they've got the resources and they've got IT staff. I've got, I've got a critical access hospital in eastern Montana that doesn't have a physician. They operate with a physician's assistant. That's it. That's all they have 24-7, 365. If that person takes vacation, they find someone to come in, but she doesn't often. That's the person, how do you get them the capacity to implement an EHR? That's what I'm worried about, and that's what our office is worried about. So we're trying to figure out how do we, how do we model or how do we make sure that the things that are happening in, on this big scale can be scaled down or that there's an alternative that's workable. The, on the flip side, rural, a, a small rural hospital can implement a, a lean or a, some sort of quality technique in a day and a half because they can have staff meetings in one day. They don't have thousands of staff that they have to train up. They can have everybody come in on their break and say, okay, we're gonna do this this way, use this checklist, go. And it can be implemented. Tracking it and having an informaticist to figure out what the impact is can be an issue. And if you only have a dozen heart attack patients a year, if one goes wrong, your law of low numbers can throw the, the totals off. So those are the things we work with, and we try to make sure that everybody else takes into account. We don't have rulemaking authority. We don't have that kind of control. So as I said, we have to cajole. So we spend our time talking to CMS and other agencies about how to look at it from a rural perspective. And I think you guys have got some great models out there that I think you know, when we talk about health IT workforce, I think they're great models to look at about where the future lies. Yep. You know, critical access hospital networks. Mm -hmm. 11, 12 of these groups that get yep. together to share infrastructure, and they have one hosted central solution mm -hmm. every, centrally. Everyone uses that. They don't have to worry about having the IT staff Correct. at each one of the sites. I think those are some of the really innovative yep. models where you can start getting the volumes that allow you to be eligible for these programs and really think about spreading it out among a variety of different folks. 
And I think, you know, I really applaud the work that Hearst has been doing to sort of identify those models, because I think that's the future. But I think IT is really the glue that holds a lot of these together because it can allow for economies of scale and sharing information across networks. Mm -hmm. And you realize you don't need to have, you know, one of everything at every site. You right. just need to have access to one. And I think right. that shared model in, in rural healthcare is so exciting and something okay. that we can really look at as we go forward. And if if you have one HIT person who's trained, if if that person if they or their spouse get a job somewhere else and they move away and you have to start over, the benefit of being in a network is you might have multiple providers and so you're not left high and dry if someone exactly. leaves or, you know, it's killed by a tractor or something. <laughs> you know, I mean, any, anything's <laughs> plausible. It's not a city bus in a rural area. It's a tractor or out, on, out on the rural road. So, I mean, it's very real possibility. So, yeah. Yeah, I think, there's you know. Amazing opportunity. A lo lot of opportunity, and, and I, I really appreciate, you know, DRA just getting into this with this new loan program. Person yeah. with its long experience doing this. I think there are a lot of ways the federal government can really be useful and not enforce. It's not our rules. It's because we want to help people do the right thing. Um, and at this point, I just any questions about sort of different initiatives, whether it's ONC sponsored, HRSA, or DRA sponsored. We can we can try Our to tackle next. some of the other ones, but probably we can stick with those. Any questions? Yes. Oh, it's, it's going to be one-to-one. -one. We're going to be trying to contact them either via email or, or um, uh, fax or whatever. Um, but it, but it, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I know that a lot of the regional planning commissions are partnered with DRA mm -hmm. as far as getting the information funneled out. So that might be a resource oh, for DRA fantastic. to contact folks because they also maintain a lot of the on-site programs. Oh, really? Okay. That can actually counter or mirror those DRA programs that mm -hmm. are be wonderful yeah it's because we didn't have a starting working list we were just trying to go with the those because that are qualifying and the RECs in the state offices of rural yes. health yes. I'm yes. sure we'd be, we happy to, to we'd be happy to be happy to pass that out because I, I like this idea about leveraging loans across the board I mean I think that's something we there's never enough money for everything out there and I think we need to figure out to get maximum impact how do you yeah, one little loan here, a little loan here, a little loan there. To get it all together enough to move well, forward. Well, I know the regarding on sites, a lot of them are searching where there has to be mm -hmm. other leverage grants come in. Absolutely. And if they can counteract some of these that aren't, you know, when you match them federal with federal, you could match them local with mm -hmm. state right. and federal, and that would not be a landlord right. rate. So mm -hmm. And your local rural electric cooperative may have, right. they, they get loan funds from USDA that they build loan fund pools, so they could be a match. And by that point, they lose their federal status usually, so they can yep. they could use it to match. And also, the, the meaningful use dollars it becomes the provider. I mean, that's another huge revenue and source that you can use as collateral, right? Yeah. Yeah, and that's what that we spent some time explaining that to USDA. We we were on some calls to explain to them and put together some information, even to show them, okay, what's the typical depreciable term of the software or the hardware so they'd know approximately what loan term they could yeah. make and about what amount of time it would take to get through from purchase to attesting and getting their payment. Well, I think it's a different twist for them because I know they switch like one or two mm -hmm. or two say years to 40 a year loan. 40 year loan. So a three or five year loan is. Three or five year years, you're really going to be yep. happy. But yes, <laughs> they get their money back. Right. Yep, and guaranteed loans, if they can do those, Dirty little secret, the government actually makes a little bit of money on a guaranteed loan. I think it, I think it would be a pitch to the, the smaller providers that that's such an alternative way of getting yep. funding that they need to implement these strategies yep. that they can't go. That's part of the rural problem is that, you know, they see this coming down the road, but they're like, how are we going to fund these things? Right. Yep. But that's a real key issue, I think, for you really beneficial to getting that out there. We, we also have a number of our regional extension centers that have worked with commercial banks to do loan programs because, again, Fantastic. the money is coming. They Usually, really great members of their community are very trustworthy. Sure. So, even in this crazy, you know, finance environment, we're finding them able to bundle together loan packages and drive down the rates, and that's been helpful as well. It's also worth checking, at least with your state, or if you're a large enough county, uh, your entitlement community for a community development block grant program. They do a lot of health care, and they might do equipment. So that's an option. The Small Business Administration, a 
kinds of entities that might be able to piece together the funding. Well, and DRA also offers their funding and their grant cycles for um, their CDAP program. The state economic development program can offer funding or grants if they if they we've got someone funded here from Lake Community Hospital for home health. Great. So that's also a yeah. Yeah. We have the office for the advancement of telehealth. We have telehealth network grants to support that. We have network development grants, so if, as we were talking earlier, if you know of a group of clinics or hospitals that want to get together and form a network to purchase their HIT and maybe share HIT workforce, there's, there's planning money, so you can get everybody together and work out the documents and work out the agreement and who's going to run it, and then there's network money. So there are lots of opportunities. Key diversion and sustainability planning. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Sustainability yeah. And having three, at least three entities and one being rural. Sometimes that can be a challenge. Thank you. Excellent. Other questions? Or suggestions. Or suggestions. <laughs> yes. 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 Remember, I did We're ask if you have any ideas for the ideal workforce program, you can either suggest them now or catch me after this. And happy to talk because we are very much interested and you never know when something might pop up as an opportunity. So please. Okay, well, I want to thank my colleagues here. Thank you very much. All right, and we're going to shift gears a little bit again. We're now going to hear a little bit about what's happening here in Tennessee. We are very uh, uh, fortunate to have uh, George Beckett here, who's the, the Health Information Technology Coordinator for the state of Tennessee. He's going to talk a little bit about some of the stuff we've been talking about earlier, um, I think, about exchange and where we're going. So come on up. I have to have to tell everybody I've been on vacation and I came back on Thursday and they said you need to be in Dyersburg on Tuesday. <laughs> but don't worry, we're going to talk about you can we're going to have a phone call on Monday and they'll tell you what you need to do. <laughs> so um, after I got done with my little call on Monday, uh, they, I said, well, do you want me to do slides or anything? And they, well, if you want to, you know, just bring them with you. And I thought, you know, I'm last on the agenda. I won't have anything left to say. And so uh, I've been sitting back taking lots and lots of notes and uh, hopefully we'll put some glue between all these things you've heard today. And, um, and I think part of, uh, part of my job has always been is to, is to paint the vision of where all this is going out there. So let me just tell you what my job is and what my office does. Um, I am the HIT coordinator for the state of Tennessee. So what does that mean? Well, you know, they've, we've heard that uh, many of the people here are from the office of the national coordinator. So we do have a national coordinator for health IT, and then there's, uh, there's actually 56 guys like me, guys and gals, uh, one for every state, and as well as six of our, of our territories all have an HIT coordinator. And our job is really to coordinate all of the, uh, the technology out there and the different stakeholders across the state in order to bring up the Tennessee leg, if you would, of this national healthcare network. So if you start thinking in terms of the ATM network that came up several years ago, you can also kind of think about what this, what this thing might turn out to be, and I'll try to describe that for you a little bit, little bit later. So um, I'm also entrusted with a, a fair amount of grant money to give out to make all this happen. Uh, kind of tell you where, where all that came from. Um, Matt wrote me a check for $11.7 million out of his own bank account a few <laughs> couple years ago. It was very generous. Uh, so we do have a, a grant for a little over almost $12 million from the Office of the National Coordinator to get this project off the ground. Um, our legislators have been very, uh, very generous with us, with us. We have about $5 million left for um, before I came from previous um, allocations to the office. And last year we got another $13.3 million dollar um, uh, appropriation from the um, from the legislature so that gives us about 30 million dollars there uh, there to work with we also um, uh, been very fortunate to work very closely with the with the folks at CMS we were one of the first states that went forward and, and asked for um, some of the grant money that they had set aside for this project out there uh, we were awarded about 19 million uh, last f uh, well earlier this year and uh, we're actually uh, have a draft in front of them for another 11 million. So it's, we'll have about 60 million dollars, which is uh, which is a good start. Um, I, I will tell you, I, I uh, up run a, uh, an integrated delivery network uh, up in Indiana before I took this job. We had about eight hospitals, 
and a couple hundred physicians and a long-term care facility and a home health care facility and one of everything, right? Um, and my IT budget there was $44 million a year every year. So, <laughs> so if you take a look at the, st the, uh, the task in front of us, it will, not be, uh, it will not be particularly easy. There will never be enough money, and it money will have to come out of everybody's pocket, not just out of the, the Office of eHealth Initiatives. Um, so we are really, uh, we're really the sister. I, I look at ONC and CMS as, as kind of two sister programs going on at the same time. So CMS is really out there, and they're helping to fund this incentive program and get people the meaningful use. And really their push is we're going to give some dollars out there to providers and computerize their practices and computerize their hospitals. So if I qualify for the Medicaid uh, incentive, I get about $64,000 per physician. So if I have a 10-person you know, a, a physician practice, that's 640000 to put some computers in and hook things up and get wh where I need to go. Um, I, I think that's pretty generous. I don't think the government's ever done that with construction workers. I don't think they've done it with movie theaters. I don't think they've done it with any other industry. Uh, but it does, I think, reflect on the trouble I think we're all seeing down the road of how much money we're spending on health care, and we've got to We've got to spend some money to, to, to rein it in, if you would, right? Um, if I don't qualify for the Medicaid incentive, if I don't have over 30% of my practice of being Medicaid uh, patients out there, uh, I probably qualify for the Medicare incentive. So between the two of them, uh, probably 95% of the physicians are covered. Uh, I'll get 44000 which isn't too bad, to, uh, to computerize my practice. So a lot of money is, is uh, coming out and uh, going, to, um, going to providers. To date, uh, I just looked up the latest statistics because they change almost daily out there. But um, in our state, $145 million have been given to providers so far. Uh, and those are for uh, physician offices, for hospitals across the state. That's pretty amazing. And this is really, we've only made a second payment to two or three people. Okay, <laughs> so this is kind of the first payment to some of the people who are going to get first payments. There are going to be millions of dollars coming into the state to computerize physician practices and to computerize hospitals across the state. We have approximately about 26,000 uh, physicians in the state, um, and um, we have about 142 acute hospitals. I remember when I interviewed for this job, uh, you know, I says, uh, well, okay, we have 26,000 physicians we have to hook up, 142 hospitals. Then there's all the other health care providers. Uh, how big is my staff? And they said eight. <laughs> so, I, you know, the shades of the Alamo just immediately yeah. came up, you know, 26,000 against eight. Um, but in general, if we take a look at the 26,000, uh, you can weed some of those out. Some of them work for hospitals already. They're hospitalists, they're anesthesiologists, they work in the EDs, they're pathologists. Uh, about 3,000 of those physicians are licensed in Tennessee, but they don't physically live in Tennessee. Um, we have a lot in academic institutions. Uh, they do either research or they do teaching. We have a lot of administrative, whether they work for a payer, whether they work for the state. Um, we have a lot of CMOs, we have a lot of CMIOs. Um, so when you wash all those out, it ends up to be about 19,000 physicians are still eligible for the program here. Um, to date, we have, um, and I don't have my glasses with me today, we have uh, 6,245 physicians have registered for the program for meaningful use. So that's about a third of our physicians. And, um, you know, we've been at this about a year and a half. So in the first year and a half, a third of all the physicians in the state have at least registered for meaningful use. We hope they'll all make it across the finish line, but uh, that's Jennifer's problem. So, <laughs> so, um, so that's really what CMS is doing out of Baltimore, and uh, Tent Care is, uh, of course, our, our Medicaid agency here in, uh, in Tennessee, and they administer the program. Um, I work in the Ten Care building. Uh, we work very closely with our with our comrades in there as well. Um, and to kind of give you an idea about how important healthcare is to Tennessee, uh, we have about um, we have a, a, about six and a half million people here in Tennessee. One point two million of them are on Medicaid, are on Ten Care. Uh, so you know it's almost like one uh, one out of five 
So next time you're in a ball game or even this room or what have you, you start looking around, one out of five are on Medicaid. We also have uh, 330,000 uh, people in the state who are covered under the state employee health plan. So people who work for the state of Tennessee, people in our universities, teachers, et cetera. Uh, so you add those two up, we're over 1.5 million. Uh, with the new health care reform that's coming up, I sit in a lot of meetings on, on that, um, and we are looking at uh, almost 500,000 more people will be joining Medicaid uh, if we decide uh, as a state that we're going to fund it as, as the original plan was, and there's lots of questions around that at this point in time due to the Supreme Court uh, decision and things. But that would be two million, so almost a third would be um, would be covered by the state of Tennessee between the state employee health plan and Medicaid, and obviously uh, the state, the, the federal government pays a huge amount of Medicaid, but but never enough. So um, so healthcare is very very important to us. This program is very important to us as well. So CMS's job is really to I look at it as is please please get the get these places automated and get their, their practices and hospitals computerized. Um, the ONC side and my side is really to build the network that will ultimately connect all these people together and actually get exchange going, okay? So we have a very, or like brother sister kind of programs, we're very symbiotic. Um, I can't get any data flowing and exchanging unless it's in a digital format. You know, and they're not paying me for fax, okay? <laughs> so it, they have to get computerized in order for the exchange to work. On the other hand, they can't make meaningful use unless they exchange data. <laughs> so they need both of us. Providers need both of our programs out there, and hopefully there'll be incentives from my office and all, as well as CMS to help us get there. Um, you know, there's a couple different ways uh, to exchange data. Um, one is, and you've heard some about the direct program today, which is basically, uh, as we've heard, medical mail. It's a, it's a specialized email that w has a special healthcare security wrapper around it, if you would, and lots of other uh, amazing things that are built into it uh, to make it secure and make it easy for providers to exchange information back and forth. But if you think about it, mail is really, that's kind of a push technology. Right? Is that you present it in front of me, I talk about it, talk back and forth with you, I refer you to a specialist, and what I have to do is at that point in time, I have to take your record and I have to push it or I have to mail it off to the specialists out there. So it's more of a push technology. Uh, easy to get into, easy to set up, you know, within 48 hours, you can pretty much have an email, right? That's secure and you can send to somebody. And uh, it's fairly easy to train. <laughs> Most, most folks, uh, you know, kind of get it pretty quick. Um, so, you know, within a week's time, I can be exchanging and I can actually, you know, in theory, make my meaningful use and get my check when, uh, when my time has come to get, to get the check for meaningful use. Um, then there's also, a, you know, we refer to it lots of names, but, you know, I normally refer to it as just full-blown exchange. So what is full-blown exchange? Well, that's the, that's the big vision that we all have at some point in time is that I go to a new doctor out there, I'm in an ED, and they say, okay, George Beckett, so they type in George Beckett, and it shows all the George Beckett's we have, and they say, okay, well, do you still live on Hickory Trace Road? Yes, I do, okay, so they put that in there. And what it does, it goes off everywhere, and it will start to bring me in records of every place that I've ever been. Now, obviously, there's a lot of security in that network, I have to have patient consent, but if, I ha if I've been to three hospitals, I see four different specialists, I have my family doctor, I've had some home health care, I've been in a rehab hospital uh, recovering from some congestive heart failure uh, incident I had or something, it should you know, go into all those medical records and bring back and say, these are the records I have for George, what would you like to see? And the physician says, so well, he's sitting in my ED, he's having chest pains, he's sweating, he's holding his arm, um, you know what? The, uh, the broken leg when he was seven doesn't interest me too much. The sprained ankle last year, not so much, but this, these couple congestive heart failures and this, this other issues here, those are the records I'd like to see. Go get those for me. So the network goes off just to those two or three places and brings those back, brings it up on the screen, and I instantly have all the records that you've ever had. Okay? 
and we talked about the fact that today, you know, usually the thing is, is I go ahead and copy that record, I put that on the chest, and you know, I'm off to, you know, on the ambulance to the to the next hospital. Unfortunately, that is not necessarily gone. Okay. <laughs> In fact, you know, uh, real exchange, even by email, is still pretty dismal in this country, you know, uh, where I think that we're getting a lot of people who are starting putting in EMRs, their readiness and sometimes willingness to exchange just is not there yet. That's going to drag a little bit behind, and, you know, you really can't blame them. They have to get familiar with their system. They have to understand the value that's in their system first, and then they can go ahead and exchange. So we're going we're gonna to be, you know, clawing our way along for a while on the exchange front. Um, as far as Tennessee is concerned, uh, I, two or three years ago, I would say that, you know, we were probably in the top five states in the country, uh, that we were one of the tallest kindergartners, and, uh, you know, because everybody's just starting, everybody's new to this. Um, but, um, you know, quite frankly, we've had a couple struggles the last couple of years. We had four regional exchanges, and of those four regional exchanges, they were to be connected by a statewide exchange. So I would look at my regional exchange first. Everybody knows healthcare is local, um, and I'm going to get that information here. But if I say, well, you know, I really grew up in Knoxville. Oh, okay, well, then I'll go up and over, and I'll go into the Knoxville exchange. So last year, we had four budding exchanges. We had a couple that had been in business for a while, a couple that were just starting. One of the ones that had been in business for a while actually closed. Uh, they had sustainability issues. They just could not get over. Um, we've got a couple other ones that uh, have gone on pause. Uh, it is a tough thing to do. Exchange is not easy. Uh, you know, everybody says, oh, the, the technical part of exchange is the easy part. Well, let me tell you, the technical part of exchange doesn't work. Okay? <laughs> We're not there yet. Um, this is very, very hard stuff. I think someone mentioned you have all these different vendors out there and they all talk different and we're all trying to get the, the things down, but you know what? We are building the airplane in the air. You know, uh, someone else mentioned, I think you did, sir, that they, you know, we've got all these, ins all these programs going in parallel and they really probably maybe should have gone in serial somehow, <laughs> but that's the way it is. You know, we, we just decided, you know, what the fields were gonna be for the master provider directory. Well, I bought that two years ago. Now what am I going to do, you know? I got to go back to my vendor and make sure they get caught up. So exchange is going to be a challenge for us for a while out there, and uh, we're hoping to get a good jump start. Where we are in Tennessee is, um, you know, we have, uh, we've made a commitment to all our exchanges that we would help them and help fund them. We were able to get a, a part of the CMS dollars is to, is to take care of about 27% of their operating funds of all our exchanges uh, across the state. So that certainly helps them out a lot as they're looking for their sustainability plans. And uh, we've got lots of other things that we've given them grants to hire people to recruit physicians and do some other things out there. So um, we are, we're very much for eventually getting to exchange because we will not be able to put a dent in diabetes, <laughs> congestive heart failure, asthma, all these other chronic diseases that we spend 85% of our healthcare dollars on with email. Okay, exchange will help. It'll get people going. It'll certainly better than what we have today. <laughs> but ultimately, we have to be able to take a look at population health. We have to be able to do large queries and things like that, which I'll, again, I'll get to in just a bit here. But I think, um, you know, th they're moving along. The one in Knoxville is doing fairly well. Uh, they're about to hook up to the VA, so they can also exchange with the VA. Um, and uh, also our immunization registry in the state. So we are moving um, more of a glacier speed, but we are moving. And uh, once we get some successes in one part, you know how that goes. It's very easy to replicate and to move across the state. So that's what we're moving at right now. We're about to launch our big direct incentive, and we're actually negotiating with our TENREC uh, partners out here to have their staff, uh, along with some more people that they're going to hire to kind of blanket the, the state and really start working on a community level uh, to work out direct. The problem with exchange is that um, you have to have someone around you who's also doing it, right? <laughs> if, you are, if you have a community, a small community, let's say Dyersburg, we got Dyersburg Hospital, we got physicians around here, um, and I'm the only one with direct to exchange, it's kind of hard for me to send a message to someone, okay? If I'm a, if I'm a primary, you know, a family physician, if you would, and uh, even the other five 
to 15 family physicians have it here in town. So what? You know, I mean, I don't refer to them. <laughs> they have their patients, I have my patients. We, we swap them back and forth because they get mad at us once in a while. But we don't normally send messages back and forth on our patients back and forth. What we would do would do is to the specialists and to the hospitals, okay? So the plan here in Tennessee is uh, that we'll be going into communities and we'll ask everybody in the community, all these healthcare providers, to come to a big town hall, if you would. We're gonna have a, a big lab in front of them. They're gonna be able to get on their computers. They're gonna be able to send messages back and forth across the room to each other. We're gonna give them several use cases. This is how you can use it if you have this specialty. This is how you can use it if you have this specialty. And ask them right there to sign up and to also sign up for a use case. And that's so they'll actually physically use it. And the bonus is we're also gonna pay them more money. We're gonna take some money out of my budget and say we'll pay for this for a year as long as you use it. So you'll have to do so many transactions a month. And um, if you do send four emails or five, I don't know what we've decided yet, a month to uh, the, the, you know, your fellow colleagues around, um, you know, we'll end up paying for it for the first year. And we're actually looking at a couple years trying to get past that 2014, well then they really have a reason to do it. Right now, they don't have as much of a reason. So if we can help them in those first two years, we'll be in, in good shape. So that's, that's gonna be a, a, a big project that we're gonna be launching here at the, at the end of uh, 2012. Um, what else do I wanna say? Uh, a couple things is, you know, there's, there's been some angst back and forth about whether I should do direct, whether I should do exchange, which is better. Um, the fact of the matter is, you know, like I said, direct is more of a push technology. I've got patient information, I'm gonna email, I'm gonna push it to you. Whereas Exchange is, is more of a pull technology. I'm gonna type in George and it's gonna go all out and it's gonna get all George's records and come back and I'll know all the medication George is on and I can say, George, uh, so what meds are you on? I'm on this, this, and this. Well, this one here says you're on this too. Oh yeah, I forgot about that one. It also says you're on this one. Uh, yeah, I just quit taking that. You know, it hurts <laughs> up my stomach and it's just, you know. Um, you know, that's the kind of information providers need in front of them. They also need to know when I, the fact that I got 30 pills last month and I refilled it in 45 days, okay? <laughs> they need things like that, right? So exchange is much bigger, uh, and that's more of a pull technology. So if I were to tell you, you know, listen, I gave you direct, right? So you have email now. So that means uh, everybody here has email in the room. Uh, so you don't need Google, right? Who, who would just throw their Google out because I gave them email? Because that's what Google is, right? I type in George and it goes back and finds all the Georges and brings it back to me, right? <laughs> now, nobody wants just email. <laughs> they also want Google. And if I just gave you Google and said, no, oh, you can get all I want, just type in George, you'll bring all the stuff back in George. Yeah, but I gotta talk to Matt. Well, just fax him. <laughs> no, <laughs> people will need both these technologies, okay? They're complementary technologies. You wouldn't give up Google because they gave you email. If they gave you, you know, if they gave you, you know, vice versa, that's not gonna happen. We need them both. So ultimately, we've gotta get exchange going. Email will get you through meaningful use, but it's not gonna put a, a dent in these big diseases. You're really not gonna be able to get the detail you will need to treat a patient unless you have your Google, okay? Unless you have your exchange out there. Um, Exchange will let us do lots of things out there, but you know, a lot of what we've been talking about today is physicians and hospitals, right? And if, if it wasn't scary enough to try to hook up 26,000 physicians and 142 hospitals, right? Think of everybody else that needs to be put on this, all right? So we have home health care providers. How can I do, tra you know, transitions of care, continuity of care if the home health people aren't in this? Because they need to tell me what's going on. What about behavioral health? What about long-term care? What about my optometrist? What about my foot doctor? What about my dentist? You know, is it fair that every time I have to have a dental procedure done, I have to remember to tell my dentist that I'm on blood thinners? Okay. <laughs> what about my chiropractor? What about all these other people out there? Okay, so let's say, you know, we have 26,000 physicians, 142 hospitals. Okay, so let's take all those other people I just mentioned. Did that just double or triple? I'm, talk, I'm thinking we have about 100,000 licensed caregivers 
that are going to need direct and going to need exchange. 100,000, right? Now, who's on my care team? Well, all those people, right? Because I'm diabetic, I got a foot doctor, I got an eye doctor, I got a family doctor, I got you know, three or four specialists out there. You know, I, I have a, a dear friend in Nashville. She's a double amputee. Uh, she's had 73 operations. <laughs> she's seen 36 different specialists, nine doctors, you know. I mean, that's a, or a nine, um, nine hospitals. She's been in nine different hospitals. I mean, if anybody needs exchange, it's someone like that. But even we need exchange, right? So who's on my care team? Well, all those people are on my care team. That's a lot when I start adding them up, right? Especially as I get older, I keep adding one a year for some reason. Right? <laughs> but um, but what about the you know what about the lady three doors down from my mother who sits with her on Monday, Wednesday, Friday? Because my sister can only sit with her on Tuesday and Wednesday, right? Um, and that lady comes in and takes a look at my mom and she's all puffy and she's out of breath and uh, she's definitely retaining water. I mean, wouldn't it be a good idea for her to be able to email the doctor and say, you know, um, we just weighed her and she gained seven pounds last night. It's all water. You know, we need to double up on her Lasix or something here and get someone involved because if not, in two days, she's going to be in the ED. Nobody wants to go to the emergency department. Nobody. Okay. <laughs> we need to have these interventions before that happens out there. So. And what about the family members? What about all of us? Mention what can we do as a consumer, you know? Listen, uh, I go to my other doctor, I didn't have to fill out, fill out this pink form, <laughs> put my name on it, all my allergies, all my medications. They just Googled it and it came up, okay? <laughs> but part of stage two, which has been recommended out there, is to have physicians send information to personal health records for the patients. Now we got 6.5, 6.8 million people in Tennessee going on 7 million by 2020. Who needs email? Who needs direct? All of us. You know, there might be 7 million direct accounts. So, uh, you know, I'm struggling with 26,000 physicians, <laughs> 142, and I'm looking down the road, boy, this network is going to get much, much bigger. So this is what we're building right now. You know, I wish someone told me, uh, you know, a few years ago, George, you really ought to get into the video game business. <laughs> I think that's going to get big, you know. Or uh, you really should get in the smartphone business, you know. Uh, you know, but this is the business to be in. Because you start looking down, we're just talking about data right now. We haven't talked about image exchange and exchanging images. We're still trying to get the data down. You know, a few bytes, 80 bytes of data across, you know. So we want to get images done. Wouldn't it be great, you know, especially now we get everybody connected on here. You know, really, you look down the road 10 years from now, 20, I don't know what it is. But I'm going to get up in the morning, I'm going to go into the, you know, look in the mirror and wonder where that 18-year-old boy went. And then I'm going to get on my scale and I'm going to get off. And that should automatically go to my doctor. Right? I said, you know what? George just gained seven pounds last night. There's a problem there. A little red flash comes up. You know, the nurse is sitting there, she's looking at 125 patients, and she's got, you know, seven that just went red since she came in this morning. There's a problem over on Hickory Trace. Let's, <laughs> let's call and find out, okay? <laughs> you know, I, I, take my, I take my diabetic, uh, you know, I take my shot, I test my blood. The minute I test that, it should be in my doctor's office. The red light should go on, you know? It's Tuesday. Why is the red light going on? You know, my phone should ring and someone should say, George, your sugar's been going up for the last three days. Well, you know what? We had a family wedding on Saturday, you know. <laughs> and, you know, I, I like my, you know, uh, football on Sunday. I like my beer and O'Doul's isn't, you know, it's not doing it for me. And, you know, this week is Monday night football. Okay. So I says, okay, I'm going to, you know, talk you in back from this ledge here. You, need, you know you have to take care of yourself. You know you can't do this. You know that stop now because on Thursday, we don't want to get a call that you're in the ED and we've got to get down there. You know, those are the kinds of things that have to happen. Though they have to know that I have 30 pills that I picked up and it took me 45 days to get it in. 
because what, the, what happens is, right? They gave me a prescription, I come in and I says, and I said, okay, this should fix you up, George. So then I come back, you know, a few months later and they says, well, how are you? And not so good, I'm still not feeling real good. Wow, maybe we should up your dose. Well, he doesn't know that uh, I wasn't taking it. I'm not gonna tell him. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get yelled at. So, okay, so he ups the dose. Then I start taking it. And this time, I'm really going to take this medicine. Now I'm over-medicated, because I did take it, and I took a too high a dose, right? <laughs> I mean, th these are not good things out there. I mean, we, we have to be able to know if a patient is in compliance, because otherwise, it's just not going to get any better. So if you start looking at this right now and you say, okay, you, we've got exchange coming on here and doctors and hospitals, wouldn't that be great? It's really not just doctors and hospitals. You know, we might get doctors and hospitals done in 10 years. You know, I mean, look at the ATM network. You know, that didn't just come up one year and by the end of the year, every bank had an ATM, <laughs> right? But if you go to a bank today, you move to a new town or you go into the bank and says, oh, by the way, where's your ATMs? Oh, we don't have any. <laughs> Would you put your money there? Yeah. No. How about a bank that uh, says, okay, well, how do I get my online banking? Because that's the next question, right? And they would say, well, we don't have online banking. Well, then, you know, I'll bet you half the people in this room would say, uh, I think I'll keep shopping. You know, that's where the exchange and healthcare is going to be, you know. How do I get my personal health records? How do I email you? How do you email me? Okay, so it's not going to be just doctors and hospitals. We might get that done in 10 years, you know, but the ATM network did not get done in 10 years either, you know. I mean, it's going to take 20 years, but technology moves fast, you know. We all have these smartphones. We all have all these kinds of things. That's going to be our best friend. You know, I heard somebody years ago, I had two stories on, on phones. First one is, uh, it wasn't that long ago either, embarrassing to say. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was having dinner with some folks and, and a guy said, you know what, someday everyone's gonna have their own phone number. I said, why would anybody need their own phone number? <laughs> How, why would anybody, I mean, these were, uh, you know, we had the bag phones at the time, you know? I mean, there were no cell phones. You know, I said, well, why would someone need their own phone number? We have one phone, it never rings, you know? I just, uh, so, so things will change rapidly. And I think what we've got to start looking at is this exchange of healthcare data is not just doctors and hospitals. This is the beginning. Uh, and we've got a, a huge job in front of us. We've got to get direct going. We've got to get the email going. We've got to get the Google going. We've got to get exchange going. Because at some point in time, you know, right here in Memphis, we have an exchange and it's struggling. Uh, I'll be very honest with you. It's really struggling right now. But you know what? I can go into that and say, what is the cholesterol for Memphis today? And they can type in there and they can come back and they can say the cholesterol for uh, Memphis is 239.3. Now think about that. Okay, so then someone comes up, a hotshot guy comes up and says, I got a great idea to lower cholesterol. Well, let's try that program in Memphis. So they use Memphis as the pilot and we try it in Memphis. And we get done with Memphis, we say, what's the cholesterol? And it comes back and says, it's 237. Well, maybe it helped <laughs> a little, okay, but maybe it probably didn't. Is that one that I want to pay for? I'm going to take some more of my funding. I want you to replicate this in Chattanooga, Nashville, Knoxville, Tri-City. I want Jackson. I want you to put this all over the state because this is going to save lives. Probably not. But the other guy who comes and says, I got another idea for cholesterol. He puts it in Memphis. What's the cholesterol? 228. Hmm. Well, maybe that's a best practice. <laughs> maybe we can take that and we can start rolling it out in other cities and maybe it will make a difference. You know, um, you know proud to say that we are, uh, you know, number two in prescription drug uh, abuse in the whole country were that bad. We're number two in obesity. I always tell my counterpart from Mississippi, thank goodness that you guys are here. Because <laughs> everybody goes to the bottom of the list and they don't check who's number two. So, but I mean, we've got some serious, you know, we're also the, the second poorest state in the country, believe it or not. We also have, we have a lot of challenges in this state and we are not gonna get there 
unless we get full-blown exchange someday and we can go in and we can ask questions like that. We can ask questions uh, and really start putting a dent in, in diabetes and, and all the other chronic diseases that's really kind of sucking our wallets dry. Um, I think that's probably all I have except that, you know, one of the big things we're doing on this direct is that we are rolling these out uh, primarily, we have 50 of our 95 counties have 30,000 or less people, and that's where we're going to start with direct. Uh, you know, Matt and all his friends in Washington keep telling me, you know, listen, you know, know our mantra, look out for the little guy. And I think I heard that at every place I've ever been, every meeting I've ever gone to Washington for, look out for the little guy. So we're starting that in these 50 counties to begin with. We're going to go out there, we're going to bring those providers together first. And several people have come up here and say, you know what, I'm not worried about Vanderbilt. <laughs> it doesn't matter if I'm here or anybody else is here, they're going to make meaningful use, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry they are. I'm not worried about Baptists. I'm not worried about Methodists. I'm not worried about, you know, you know I'm not even worried about Jackson, you know? I love the guys at Jackson. They're some of my best buddies in the state. But, you know, I'm not that worried about them. They're going to make it, right? It's everyone else in there. It's everyone in between. So I don't wake, stay up nights over them, but the idea is, you know, that's where we're going to start, and that's where we're going to try to get exchange going first in the rural areas. Uh, I mentioned some money that my office has. Everybody else has been throwing around. Hey, I got so many million here, so many million, so many. So you know, I mean, there is funding out there, and funding means jobs. And this program is not going to end. People are going to be selling. You know, when you buy a scale at Walmart, it's already going to have the chip in that sends it to your doctor ten years from now. When you buy the blood pressure cuff when you buy the, the glucose meter, all those things, th this is gonna be part of our life. It's just gonna be the way it is. Um, so it's a, I think you know, this is getting in the video game business right now. <laughs> so if you can get a career going in this and get started in this, there'll be lots of opportunities to, to move back and forth in that. So any questions I can answer for folks here? Most of the vendors of direct, you know, I just give you money for a while, you know, and then that money goes away, then you're on your own. <laughs> so uh, mo I will tell you the average price per direct across the country is $15 per provider per month. A lot less than a cable bill. You know, that's, what, that's what my cable bill was when cable first came out. Now, <laughs> now it's 100 something a month and I just have basic, you know. <laughs> But uh, that's kind of what we're looking at right now. I think overall, you know, that's, I'm just giving you an average price. What it's going to end up in Tennessee is probably going to be some dollars in left to right to that. But it's not very much, actually. All right. Great. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you. along those lines, uh, but I, I, I want to go through this, and what I tried to do was as we're, I was, as the day is progressing, I've been hearing some great themes and some great questions, so I tried to gather them together in some uh, sort of general questions for the group and then some lessons learned, and I, I should warn you ahead of time that, um, I, for those of you who don't know, I spelled my name M-A-T uh, because I'm dyslexic in kindergarten, there were seven other Matthews. I couldn't figure out how to spell Matthew together, and when I learned how to spell Matt, and if we learned how to spell cat, I was like, that's me, and the teacher never corrected me. <laughs> so I misspell my own name. There may be some typos in these slides, and I forgive me as we go forward, but what I wanted to do is think about little ways in which we as a group could think about getting things going. And I think what's great about this room, I've had the pleasure of talking to a lot of people, a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of people presented, but there's, there's a lot of folks out there who are interested in doing similar things here. So I'm, I've got a couple of questions I just wanted to sort of get out there for folks. And you know, I think you know, the first question really is something we've talked about a lot today, which is really about sort of the, the rural healthcare workforce and, and the skills that we need to implement it. Um, and, and I think you know, there have been great examples of programs that are running out here, things along those lines. But given the, the other folks in the room who haven't had a chance to present and some of the expertise and knowledge, I was wondering, are there other things that we can do to, to help the, the workforce get the, the skills? And I know that there's some other community colleges that are here thinking about doing some programs. We've got other community colleges that didn't present that are actively participating in this. 
Are there other things that you guys are thinking about this uh, along the way in terms of other programs we could be doing, ways in which we collectively could be doing a better job to help prepare our, our rural health IT workforce? doing that well. That's good. That's good. Excellent. Well, uh, I think, uh, you know, we really do recognize that there is a, a lot of knowledge that exists outside of Washington. So it's really important for us to get out and talk to groups like this, or at least from my own personal perspective, because there is a lot to be learned. And I think that sometimes in the forum is not as important as the, the small dialogues that are going on uh, among folks in the room. So I appreciate that, and I don't want to put anyone on the spot. Um, I think we are really interested in getting a sense about new uh, training programs, evolving training programs. I think one of the things we've, we've heard a lot about today is that things are constantly in flux and evolving. And I think that we are going to be continually looking to do this. I mean, I think we had the great pre pre uh, pre presentation by Patricia about the work that they're doing out west. And I think that is the type of thing we're really excited about because these are the new innovative programs we want to get out there. We really want to think about to get folks going. Um, and, and uh, you know, one area, though, that I do think we need more thoughts on is, is how we can really work with the students that are going through these programs, because there are a lot of great students, but getting those internships is very, very, very important. Um, and we've sort of talked about it in a couple of different ways about this. Are there other thoughts people have about how we can sort of work to, to get job placement for those students, thinking about internship programs, uh, other perspectives that we may not have explored that we should have to try to get these great students the, the experiences that they need? I think it's a great idea. Internships are really important to the programs and working with those large hospital systems. Especially in other parts of the country, there's a lot of consolidation of like the critical access hospitals are being bought out by large systems. You know, we're working with those systems to think about standardized ways because there's a standardized curriculum and that can help programs, especially that settle different states. But really digging into that is something I think we definitely want to explore. And, and maybe thinking about professional society organizations such as the Edmund Places don't want to take that on because it's a it's a burden. I mean, yep. you have to be honest about the fact you have a new trainee on staff, you got to pay attention to him, you got to do special attention. Uh, it takes a, a lot of time and effort. So you know, I, it, some of that gets right back to funding. And you know, I mean, maybe programs are paying fifty percent. You know, some sort of shared cost equation. Yeah. Uh, something that would inspire. Um, you know, well-oiled. wonderful idea it in reality doesn't work very well and, yeah. uh, exploring in some states working with the, the Department of Labor and the work, uh, Health Workforce Board.
courts to do skilled apprenticeship uh, apprenticeship programs that pay for both the, the student to do it, but also the employer to do that apprenticeship, recognizing the role there. That's something we're certainly exploring and working with our federal partners. Do you, do you have an idea? I think that's a great idea of thinking about non-traditional ways of getting people to have that trust between organizations because I think once you have those trusts and you're more established, it's easier to put the time and ener energy into it because you'll know you get back from the investment rather than some of these other issues. Yeah, I'm sorry, Jeff. There's a great HRSA program. Do you want to talk about that? Well, I sort of wanted to follow up on that because I like the idea. What, I, what I'm trying to figure out on the practical sense is what's the internship? In the sense, I, 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 we talk about that all the time a lot, networking people so that they're sharing their resources. Where, where's the mentor? Or where do you, you know, these are the main things that there's somebody who's mentoring you so that you are learning. Otherwise, it's, or is it just purely that you're on the job? This is the part I've been struggling with when we talk about setting up internships yeah. and apprenticeships is, well, our objective for rural is that someone from your clinic, your hospital, take this course at distance so they don't have to travel. So you take the six months or whatever components you need, and then you have your skills. Now, you're gonna come back and you implement your EHR, or are you going to go somewhere else and do an internship? And if you're going to do an internship, presumably that's because you're going to be under the tutelage of someone who has done health IT and can give you this extra set of skills or look over your shoulder. And so you have to find a facility large enough. So that, that's my question about how we make it work and would love to figure that out.
question is where do you go? How do you practically get some some skills from someone who can sort of look over you as HIT skills and implementation? So you struggled through it. Now, you know, how far away are you? How far is practical for someone who's on the ground? You're, you're in a clinic and you now need to go get some practical experience with what you learn in, in, in the curriculum. That's that's what I'm wondering. thoughts about internships or internships chat? I think it's helpful dialogue. I think there's some great ideas, and I think this is exactly what we're trying to do. Okay, um, so what I'm going to do now is, th this is some of the thoughts, and just trying to wrap up what we've heard today. Um, I thought the conversation was really exciting, starting off with sort of that, that real life, in, in the field perspective of how you're dealing with things, talking a little bit about the vision of where these programs are coming in, and then spelling out some of the new future opportunities. But things that, that really popped out at me as I was going for, forward is, you know, that the health IT is ra a rapidly growing field. We kept hearing over and over again that there are new things coming up. And, you know, where we are today is a big lift, but there are other things coming as well. And thinking about that, you know, what, how that impacts things. Um, the, the question of the why, you know, why is important, but, but why in parentheses of what we're trying to do is, is critically important. This is not about checking the box. When we talk about it's meaningful use of meaningful use. It's that no other idea that's there. Um, and you really thinking about how that ties into sort of quality improvement and population health is really important, especially to get those, those hooks into the healthcare sector, into motivating people as we move ahead. Um, and while there's a huge need for these folks uh, th to be trained in this field, that there's not a lot of expertise and knowledge in these fields, there's, it's a lot of people want to do it. Um, and there are lots of people out there who want to do it, but don't currently know how. Um, and one of the themes that Things, statements that was said earlier on was about putting the patient first. And that, you know, this is a lot about what we're doing, whether it's, you know, putting in these systems. The healthcare system ultimately is about the patient, and how we can really focus on it is really important. Um, and I also think that we really did learn a lot today about sort of the, the there are great resources available um, to, uh, yeah, there are a lot of brand resources that can help people to push things forward, whether it's our actual community colleges that are in the field whether it's the consortia programs that have been developing such great stuff and so many robust materials, whether it's the new online resources, there's a lot of educational programs that we can talk about resources and workforce as well. But there are also extension centers out there that are helping people, and this is another resource that providers can pull into. Um, and then the, we also talked a lot about sort of the state grants that are going on there, and if I had time
time, George, I would have put on the, 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 the Google and email discussion, because I thought that was really helpful, that there are a lot of new innovative ideas that are coming across the board. So I think that, you know, as we've gone through the day, I think it's been really impressive to hear the excitement about all the different opportunities that are coming together. And, you know, I think it, it was a real great opportunity for us to be out here and talking to you guys about these experiences and thinking about things. I mean, I think this is, again, our slide sort of about what ways in which we can communicate going forward. But um, from my perspective, I've really appreciated the chance to sort of have this discussion with folks, have an opportunity to talk to folks, and, and you know, um, especially uh, the De Delta Regional Authority and all the great work that they've done in sort of pulling this together. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of people behind the scenes who've been working all day long, um, making this happen, working on the streaming video, making the technology happen, and I really wanted to take a, a moment to, to thank them very much for everything that they're doing. Um, but, but also to thank everybody else for being very engaged. And, you know, before we wrap up, I think we'll probably be a little early. Mike, is there anything that you want to say to folks just sort of from your perspective? Well, I just you know, appreciate everybody coming and the, and the excitement that I see in this, this whole field. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, like I said, it's very important. It's, it's, uh, it's health care. It's, it's job opportunities. But it's also it's kind of the future. And uh, I think when you compare this to the banking industry, it made me really sink into me how fast thing works and you know that the ATM the deal it takes 15 20 years to get going it's gonna go a lot faster and the other thing is uh, you know we've met a lot of young people and, and if they, they they know how to do anything they know how to do uh, tech modern technology which is gonna make anything go that much faster and, and that's good I think that's good uh, the other thing is again uh, you know sick people are in the rural areas more more sick people in rural areas than in the so much and um, again I want to thank my colleagues at FIRSA and other organizations for doing all this and what I thought I would do is give people a little more mingling time because it seemed like there was a lot of good information exchange going and thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.